Chapter 13 The Changing of the Guard Again Spring to Summer 2004 Of The U.S. Army in the Iraq War, Volume 1 By U.S. Army Operation Iraqi Freedom Study Group This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adam Cable Chapter 13 The Changing of the Guard Again Spring to Summer 2004 Page 311 The April 2004 uprisings emphatically dispelled the short war assumption that had underpinned U.S. leaders' thinking since before the invasion. The transfer of sovereignty to an interim Iraqi government would proceed as planned, but leaders understood any military coalition turnover to an international peacekeeping and reconstruction force within months was unrealistic. The April crisis also proved that it would take longer than coalition leaders had expected to stabilize Iraq and suppress the militant groups that had gained a foothold. To execute the extended campaign, coalition leaders created new commands to compensate for the shortcomings of the Combined Joint Task Force 7, or CJTF-7, theater command that U.S. leaders had come to judge as an under-resourced failure. Lieutenant General Ricardo Sanchez's command was replaced by several organizations better designed to handle the strategic and operational challenges of the war. To head the new commands, the United States appointed new leaders, including General George W. Casey, Jr. and Lieutenant General David H. Petraeus, who supervised the coalition campaign in one capacity or another for the next six years. Similarly, a new U.S. Embassy team headed by Ambassador John D. Negroponte replaced Ambassador L. Paul Bremer and the Coalition Provisional Authority, or CPA, shifting control of the civilian side of the campaign from the Department of Defense, or DOD, to the Department of State. This new political-military team addressed the successes and failures of April and worked according to a new game plan. A new United Nations, or UN, resolution prescribed a roadmap toward an elected Iraqi government and a new constitutional order, while the coalition finally developed a campaign plan to govern its military activities for the first time since the invasion. The new coalition leaders also dramatically revised the effort to organize the Iraqi security forces, which largely had collapsed during the April insurrection, making them a centerpiece of the coalition campaign plan. As the coalition recovered from the challenges of April, its leaders expressed hope that the rejuvenated coalition structure and new interim Iraqi government of the summer of 2004 would bring lasting improvements in security and the functioning of the Iraqi state. However, as the coalition handed sovereign authority to its Iraqi allies, the new commands and their plans were tested by the Abu Ghraib scandal and by the Iraqi insurgents' determination to stifle the nascent Iraqi government. The Fallout of Abu Ghraib, page 311. Even before the initial violence of April had subsided, another event occurred that had consequences reaching far beyond the borders of Iraq. In late April, the Abu Ghraib prison scandal broke in the international media, starting with the television program 60 Minutes 2 and The New Yorker magazine in the United States. In the United States, the scenes of abuse were seen as appalling and created a near-universal sense of outrage, resulting in a public relations disaster. Internationally, the scandal further tainted the public's perception of the invasion of Iraq, which already had been damaged significantly by the inability to find weapons of mass destruction, or WMD. Support for the war dropped precipitously. A Gallup poll showed that the percentage of Americans who believed that going to war in Iraq was a mistake jumped from 42% in January 2004 to 54% in June 2004. The backlash extended to the United Kingdom as well. Within 48 hours of the Abu Ghraib scandal, British forces in Multinational Division Southeast, or MNDSE, were facing similar accusations when the Daily Mail published photos of alleged abuse. The pictures were proved to have been fakes two weeks later, but by then much of the damage to the British military's reputation had been done, reinforcing the insurgency's narrative of the coalition as brutal occupiers and further deflating British public support. 
Among America's allies, the Abu Ghraib scandal was equally damaging, straining ties with coalition members who wanted to distance themselves from the humiliation. While not decisive in any allies' decision to withdraw from the coalition, the scandal likely became a contributing factor for some nations' withdrawals as it weakened public support for the mission. Within the Iraqi and Arabic media, the Abu Ghraib scandal dominated the news for months, providing opponents of the coalition many opportunities to condemn the U.S.-led campaign. Mainstream media outlets, such as the influential Al Jazeera television network, engaged in a near-daily denunciation of the coalition's behavior, while tending to depict the Abu Ghraib scandal as, in the words of an Iraqi Al Jazeera interviewee, quote, a great crime committed against Iraqi Mujahideen, end quote, who had been fighting, quote, to liberate their homeland, end quote. Print media followed suit, as with a Gulf Times editorial describing the scandal as, quote, a calamity that destroys the dubious claims to legitimacy that the White House advanced in support of the war and the occupation, end quote, with U.S. troops having, quote, refilled the cells and taken up where Saddam's torturers left off, end quote. In an attempt to conflate the coalition mission in Iraq with the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories, many Middle Eastern media sources also began using the same vernacular for both situations, including mujahideen, colonization, and occupation. The April uprisings and the indecisive coalition counterattacks that followed gave the insurgents and jihadists in Iraq confidence that they could defeat the United States, just as the Mujahideen had defeated the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. At exactly the same time, the worldwide media coverage of detainee abuse by U.S. soldiers at Abu Ghraib gave the same groups a highly effective recruitment tool and a powerful reason to fight the coalition. Lieutenant General Stanley McChrystal, a special operations leader, later reported, quote, In my experience, we found that nearly every first-time jihadist claimed Abu Ghraib first had jolted him to action. End quote. The scandal created a cause for extremists to take up arms against the coalition, an effect evident to coalition troops at virtually all levels. On the day the Abu Ghraib story broke in the press, Major General James Mattis, commander of the 1st Marine Division, saw a group of Marines watching the television coverage and asked what was happening. One 19-year-old Lance Corporal responded, quote, Some assholes have just lost the war for us. End quote. New Commands, New Missions, page 313. The Brahimi Mission and UNSCR 1546. One cause of the April outbreak had been the Iraqis' loss of patience with the political uncertainty of the coalition mission, which had not defined the manner or timeline in which Iraqis would ultimately be allowed to choose a new government. In the spring of 2004, the veteran Arab diplomat Lakhdar Brahimi arrived in Baghdad as a UN envoy to broker political talks among the Iraqi factions and the coalition. By June, the sides had agreed on a program for elections and a new Iraqi constitution. An interim Iraqi government, appointed by the coalition, would serve until elections in January 2005 would yield an Iraqi transitional government, which, in turn, would draft the country's new constitution. Under the UN plan, the January 2005 election would be conducted on a nationwide basis in which national parties would vie for a proportional electoral share, rather than individual politicians competing for seats from which they were responsible to a local electorate. This decision had far-reaching consequences because the proportional system would favor larger, better-funded parties, such as those receiving significant assistance from Iran, and it would amplify the impact of an election boycott by religious or ethnic groups. The nationwide proportional system also would facilitate the distribution of electoral spoils on ethno-sectarian lines. On June 8, 2004, UN Security Council Resolution, or UNSCR 1546, codified the agreement Brahimi brokered. Among its key provisions, the resolution established a timeline that required the, quote, 
holding of direct democratic elections by 31st December 2004 if possible, and in no case later than 31st January 2005, to a transitional national assembly which will inter alia have responsibility for forming a transitional government of Iraq and drafting a permanent constitution for Iraq leading to a constitutionally elected government by 31st December 2005. End quote. These dates became the principal guide for the coalition's military and political activities for the next 19 months. New Coalition Commands During May and June 2004, new operational and strategic-level coalition headquarters replaced the deactivated CJTF-7. On May 15th, the remnants of CJTF-7 were used to form Multinational Force Iraq, or MNFI, the senior Iraq command, which was tasked with overseeing strategic and political military matters. Three new subordinate commands would split the operational functions that had overtaxed CJTF-7. As Secretary of Defense, or SecDef, Donald Rumsfeld and senior military leaders had decided in late 2003, MNFI would be a four-star level headquarters with Sanchez as an interim commander. General John Abizaid had originally recommended that Sanchez should be promoted to command MNFI. By spring 2004, however, the public and political backlash to the Abu Ghraib scandal led U.S. leaders to remove Sanchez from contention. The coalition's military crises in April 2004 only reinforced U.S. leaders' impression that Sanchez and his command were not up to the task. The shift to a more robust theater headquarters had been in motion for several months. With Rumsfeld having rejected David McKiernan and, by default, the Coalition Forces Land Component Command, or CFLCC, for command of the new MNFI headquarters because of Rumsfeld's disapproval of McKiernan's performance in the invasion, only two principal options remained. Abizaid, the U.S. Central Command, or CENTCOM Commander, and Army Vice Chief of Staff General George Casey. By May, Rumsfeld had decided the Iraq Theater Command would go to Casey, and the underutilized CFLCC would remain in Kuwait, rather than returning to Baghdad, with McKiernan as its commander. Like its predecessor, CJTF-7, MNFI was staffed by individual augmentees gathered by tasking orders sent out from the various services in the Pentagon, rather than created from an experienced standing headquarters. In essence, Rumsfeld's decision to reject McKiernan had the unintended consequence of preventing a standing headquarters, CFLCC, with its trained personnel who had operated together through the invasion phase, from becoming the theater headquarters for Iraq. Under MNFI, a new three-star level multinational core Iraq, or MNCI, would focus on military operations as well as coordinating the various multinational divisions spread across the country. This much-needed change would relieve MNFI from the pressure of tactical matters and allow the four-star headquarters to function at higher levels of war. U.S. military leaders decided to form MNCI by splitting the already deployed Lt. Gen. Thomas Metz and his 3rd Corps headquarters from CJTF-7, even though 3rd Corps had just gone through a difficult absorption into the CJTF-7 structure when it arrived in Baghdad in February. Now, three months later, Third Corps would unwind that process, retrieve hundreds of its people from the CJTF-7 directorates, and return them to operational staff sections in MMCI. The process would exacerbate the challenges of staffing both organizations. It created vacancies in the theater command just as the Pentagon determined that MNFI and MNCI together would require 2,081 people more than 600 above the 1,408 that CJTF-7 had been authorized but had not come close to filling during its short life. The significant turbulence in both organizations prevented either from coalescing as a headquarters in the summer of 2004, thereby making it harder for the coalition to regain the initiative it had lost in April. Alongside MNCI, CENTCOM ordered the creation of another three-star command, the Multinational Security Transition Command, Iraq, or MNSTCI, to replace the Office of Security Cooperation and oversee the coalition's rebuilding of the Iraqi armed forces, an effort that the battles of April 2004 proved had produced little. 
The new headquarters, under the command of Lieutenant General Petraeus, just four months removed from his division command in Ninoa, faced the difficult task of consolidating a train-and-equip mission that had been severely fragmented before MNSTCI's creation. Building the new Iraqi army had been the responsibility of Major General Paul Eaton's Coalition Military Assistance Training Team, or CMAT, which worked for the CPA. At the same time, the responsibility for standing up the ICDC was decentralized to the various coalition divisions. This devolution of responsibility had created differences in organization, training, and effectiveness of ICDC units across the country. Further complicating matters, the rebuilding of the Iraqi police services in the Ministry of the Interior had been placed under the State Department's oversight, per federal law. MNSTCI explicitly had been created to resolve such dysfunctions, but from its inception, it faced continuing challenges. Like CJTF-7 and MNFI, the MNSTCI headquarters again was created as an ad hoc organization. As Major General Carl Eikenberry had recommended in his special report to Rumsfeld, both CMAT and Civilian Police Assistance Training Team, or CPAT, became subordinate headquarters under MNSTCI, a move that created interagency friction with State Department officials who felt security force assistance and security cooperation should remain under their purview. As Petraeus formed his command, MNSTCI had to work through tension over exactly where lines of decision-making authority and reporting would fall for the various components of its mission. For example, while the British initially had responsibility for mentoring and developing the Iraqi Ministry of Defense, the U.S. Embassy's newly created Iraq Reconstruction Management Office was responsible for doing the same for the Ministry of the Interior, but CPAT was responsible for developing police below the ministry level. Rounding out the changes at the headquarters level, Task Force 134, or TF-134, was created to supervise detention operations under the command of Major General Jeffrey Miller, who had led the team looking into problems at Abu Ghraib a few months earlier. The new headquarters had been created in response to the Abu Ghraib scandal as well as in general recognition of the significant problems with the coalition's detention operations. A lack of facilities had led to overcrowding at the three principal MNFI detention facilities, Abu Ghraib, Camp Cropper at Victory Base, and Camp Buka near Basra, which, as of mid-June, held 5,411 detainees. Insurgents exploited the crowded, chaotic conditions to recruit within the detention centers, a problem evident not just to coalition officers but to Iraqi officials as well. Kurdish Regional Government Interior Minister Karim Sinjari warned coalition counterparts as early as March 2004 that jihadist insurgent cells had developed in several detention facilities with the goal of radicalizing otherwise moderate detainees. These jihadist cells segregated themselves from the rest of the prison population and cultivated recruits from among newly arrived prisoners, Sinjari explained. Upon their release, the new jihadi recruits were directed to insurgent cells on the outside where some became suicide bombers. Coalition officials had recognized these problems previously, but the unclear U.S. policy concerning the disposition of Iraqi detainees delayed longer-term remedies, as had the lack of an overarching command structure for detention operations. Miller was given a responsibility to fix these problems, which grew daily with the never-ending influx of detainees, and to correct deficiencies recognized in the aftermath of the Abu Ghraib debacle. Flaws in the New Command Structure The new commands offered hope of covering operational matters better than CJTF-7 had been able to do, but the new structure was not without serious flaws. Because each of the four new headquarters were ad hoc creations rather than existing organizations, the orders establishing them had to move through multiple layers of CENTCOM and DOD bureaucracy, delaying their manning. Not until September did MNFI reach 75% strength, with two of the other commands lagging further behind. MNFI also suffered from a dearth of quality, staffed by individual augmentees who often met the bare minimum qualifications for filling DOD taskings. The MNFI plans section, responsible for the theater strategic level and operational levels of war, was symptomatic of the lack of qualified personnel. Quote, 
My staff didn't consist of War College graduates, SAMS graduates, or anybody else who would be trained as what an Army culture would accept as planners, end quote, MNFI Plans Chief Brigadier General Peter Palmer later remembered. He added, quote, I was given an Army Lieutenant Colonel reservist who had no planning background whatsoever, and a Romanian colonel whose English was pretty good but obviously knew nothing about any of this. I had an Air Force Major Space Officer and an Australian Navy Officer, and none of them understood anything about planning processes. End quote. The MNSTCI headquarters suffered similar difficulties because of its improvised nature. Petraeus had asked DOD for an active duty division headquarters that had trained as a team to for the core of MNSTCI, but with all of the active duty divisions and special forces groups either deployed or just returned from Iraq or Afghanistan, DOD instead assigned the mission to the Army's 98th Reserve Division for institutional training. The 98th was an imperfect choice, a Cold War-era creation filled with part-time drill sergeants whose mission was to increase basic training throughput in times of a national emergency. It was the first reserve training division ever used for an overseas combat mission. The 98th Reserve Division was itself an ad hoc organization, taking nearly 20% of its personnel from four other reserve divisions in order to have enough troops to deploy. The resulting MNSTCI headquarters was a slow-forming polyglot of active-duty augmentees alongside the 98th Reserve Division, which itself did not arrive in Baghdad until October. Because of these challenges, Petraeus would later recall that his new headquarters took, quote, a good four to six months to get to a basic level in terms of capability and functionality. End quote. Like the other commands, CENTCOM formed the Detention Command of TF-134 as an improvised organization instead of assigning a brigade headquarters to the mission. As a result, the individual billets filled slowly. By September, the headquarters stood at a mere 25% strength, with only 52 personnel assigned out of a required 226 to handle the problems that had led to the Abu Ghraib fiasco. At their inception, none of the new coalition commands met the needs of the Iraq mission. The complexities of the operation required a fully staffed, fully functioning headquarters made up of top-notch personnel, a claim no command could make. The Transfer of Sovereignty On June 28, 2004, Bremer handed Iraq's executive authority to the Iraqi interim government. The transfer had been scheduled for June 30th, but U.S. leaders decided, without input from MNFI, to advance the date quietly to avoid any insurgent attacks during the transfer. On the same day, Ayad Alawi was sworn in as Iraq's interim prime minister, having been selected by his fellow Iraqi governing council members. Alawi was a secular Shia politician who had been a member of the Ba'ath Party in the 1960s and early 1970s, before conflicts with Saddam Hussein resulted in his fleeing to London, where he survived a Ba'athist assassination attempt and ultimately led the Iraqi National Accord, one of the main Iraqi opposition groups. After the collapse of the regime, he had returned to Iraq and served as defense minister on the Iraqi governing council. With Alawi sworn in, the CPA disbanded and Bremer departed Iraq the same day. In place of the CPA, a new U.S. embassy opened, with veteran diplomat Negroponte as its first ambassador. The assignment was part of a long diplomatic career that had begun during the Vietnam War, where Negroponte had seen a counterinsurgency campaign firsthand. The transfer of sovereignty had a significant impact on the conduct of the war. On the one hand, U.S. and coalition leaders assumed the emergence of a sovereign Iraqi government would resolve many of the anti-occupation pressures coming from within Iraq. Coalition polling showed that 63% of Iraqis indeed did believe an interim Iraqi government would improve conditions in the country. The Iraqi Governing Council also pressed the coalition to turn over as much responsibility as possible as soon as possible. Council members demanded that the transfer of sovereignty should give the interim government, quote, absolute control of the administration of Iraq's armed forces and security apparatus, absolute control of the management of Iraq's national and natural resources, and full and complete management of Iraq's development and aid budget, end quote. 
Many coalition leaders believed that handing responsibility to the Iraqis would bestow legitimacy on the new state, which in turn would dampen support for the insurgency. U.S. leaders also hoped the transfer would lessen international criticism of the Iraq mission. In reality, however, transferring sovereignty imposed significant constraints on the coalition's mission while delivering fewer benefits than coalition leaders expected. After the transfer, the coalition's influence over Iraqi internal policy as well as its own ability to conduct operations in Iraq plummeted. The coalition voluntarily transferred authority over the Iraqi armed forces to the Ministry of Defense, meaning that the coalition ceded the power not just to appoint military officials, but also to fire incompetent, corrupt, and sectarian military and police commanders. The coalition also lost significant influence over the Iraqi budget, making it more difficult to prevent corruption in the doling out of the Iraqi government's vast reconstruction contracts. Finally, coalition units had less freedom to conduct unilateral operations or combined operations with the Iraqi security forces, especially against politically sensitive targets such as Jaysh al-Mahdi, a constraint that would blunt the coalition's mission for the remainder of the war. Had the coalition been facing only a Sunni-based nationalistic insurgency, as CJTF-7 intelligence officers assessed, the transfer of sovereignty potentially could have achieved its intended effects. However, as the Shia and Sunni cooperation in expelling the coalition began to unravel into intercommunal conflict, the transfer would accelerate the country's descent into civil war. The Iraqi interim government's state institutions were insufficient to prevent the sectarian conflict from escalating, and the governments that would follow would not themselves be neutral in the conflict. Few American military and political leaders foresaw these consequences at the time, but Iraqi leaders recognized the significance of the coming changes. While meeting with Carol Hav, the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, Counterintelligence, and Security, during a visit to Baghdad in the late spring, a group of Iraqi leaders told their American visitor, quote, You Americans are going to hand us the keys to the car and believe that you are still going to get to drive it. End quote. New Coalition Leadership On July 1st, General George Casey took command of MNFI from Sanchez. Casey was the son of Major General George W. Casey Sr., the former commander of the 1st Cavalry Division in Vietnam and one of the most senior American officers killed in that war. Casey had served as the director of the Joint Staff during the invasion of Iraq and had been appointed vice chief of staff of the Army before assuming command of MNFI. More importantly, he had served as an assistant division commander of the 1st Armored Division in Bosnia, a personally formative assignment that had given him first-hand experience in leading a multinational peacekeeping effort in a shattered country. It also exposed him to the challenges and frustrations of pressing recalcitrant ethnic groups to set aside grievances and vengeance and focus on the future. One incident had been seared into his memory that of Bosnian Muslim refugees trying to return to their homes in the Bosnian Serb town of Dugi Dio. After a tense standoff and grueling negotiations, Casey had brokered an agreement that would enable the Muslims to return so long as they could prove ownership of property and give up their weapons. However, the agreement collapsed when weapons were found in the house of the Bosnian Muslim deputy mayor. While Casey was disheartened, the episode yielded a lesson he carried with him for the rest of his career. American soldiers, usually imbued with optimism and energy, had a tendency to try to do too much, Casey believed, including trying to solve long-standing political disputes among warring factions. Quote, We were so focused on getting what we saw as our job done that we never let the Bosniaks, Croats, and Serbs do much, end quote, he explained later. In Casey's view, U.S. leaders constantly had to guard against their unit's tendency to fix problems that a host nation should fix for itself. Otherwise, the indigenous population would grow dependent upon the American Army's assistance. Such solutions, Casey believed, would not last any longer than Americans had troops on the ground. As Casey prepared to take command in Iraq, he met separately with the SECDEF, the President, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the CENTCOM commander. Of the four, only Abizaid, the CENTCOM commander, gave written instructions. In a four-page letter that served as initial guidance and higher headquarters intent, 
Abizade outlined ten objectives for Casey and asked him to report on various elements of the mission. Of the objectives, the top three were 1. Set conditions for successful Iraqi-led and supervised elections in the December 2004 to January 2005 time frame. 2. Protect key Iraqi leaders and set conditions for Iraqis to transition to this role. And 3. Build loyal, well-trained, well-equipped Iraqi security organizations. Casey dutifully would make these objectives key components of his campaign plan. Abizade deployed to Bosnia as a fellow assistant division commander in the 1st Armored Division with Casey and derived many of the same lessons from his Balkans experience. He too was concerned American soldiers would attempt too much and create a dependency among the Iraqis. In addition, Abizade emphasized to Casey that the coalition was operating on borrowed time in Iraq and that the goodwill of the Iraqi people would eventually run out. Quote, from the beginning, General Abizade did not believe the Iraqis would tolerate a long-term U.S. presence there, end quote, Casey later recalled. Quote, he was clear about that. A large armed foreign military presence was not going to be welcomed any place in the Middle East, particularly in Iraq, end quote. This idea was at the center of Abizade's antibody theory about the Middle East, which held that U.S. forces in Iraq, no matter how benevolent, were equivalent to an infection that eventually would create, quote, antibodies, end quote, among the Iraqi population that would seek to eliminate the foreign presence. As a result, Abizade believed the U.S. military presence should be reduced and withdrawn as soon as it was feasible, and more specifically, after restoring legitimacy to the Iraqi government through elections and after building up viable security forces. These were the first and third priorities in his written instructions to Casey. Casey's Bosnia lessons on the limits of U.S. military power and Abizade's antibody theory dovetailed closely with Casey's guidance from Rumsfeld. Casey recalled later, quote, Secretary Rumsfeld was worried that, in our zeal to accomplish the mission, we would try to do everything ourselves and not allow the Iraqis to gain the experience they would need to ultimately take charge. He felt that this would only extend our time there, and he encouraged me to take this attitude into consideration in my planning. End quote. Rumsfeld frequently had expressed this concern publicly, comparing turning over responsibility to the Iraqis with teaching a child to ride a bicycle. Quote, They're learning, and you're running down the street holding on to the back of the bike seat, end quote, he told reporters on March 19th. Quote, you know that if you take your hand off, they could fall, so you take a finger off, and then two fingers, and pretty soon you're just barely touching it. Leaving Iraq will be like that. End quote. Whether by fate or by design, the three principal architects of the strategy that would be employed in Iraq for the nearly 30 months all shared the same philosophical perspective on how the war should be prosecuted. There was no odd man out among them who had to be convinced of the merits of the strategy. All three were determined to apply the same remedy restoring legitimacy to the Iraqi government through elections and standing up the Iraqi security forces in order to allow the drawdown of U.S. forces as quickly as possible. MNFI and the U.S. Embassy Casey's arrival in Baghdad in June 2004 had a significant impact on MNFI, reinvigorating the headquarters that had grown demoralized and pessimistic because of the April uprisings. One general officer compared the situation inside CJTF-7 during spring 2004 to the collapse of the British Army at Dunkirk, when an overwhelmed British command had fallen behind unfolding events and sometimes issued orders for British units to proceed to locations the Germans already had taken. The general recalled, quote, When I went back to Baghdad and became part of that madness, CJTF-7 had begun to fall further and further behind the situation and the enemy's decision-making loop with CJTF-7 leaders telling themselves, if only we could stop things for 24 hours, we could get a grip on this. Well, they couldn't stop it. For the first time in my military career, I was looking around and there was a sense of hopelessness, with exhausted middle-aged men stumbling from meeting to meeting, and in every meeting, at any one time, 20% of them would be asleep. People often say that it's very difficult to define what victory is now. Well, I know what losing looks like, and I was part of it. End quote. 
For many CJTF7 leaders, Casey's arrival brought a quick and welcome change. Quote, When General Casey arrived, within two weeks he breathed new life into the organization, end quote, one senior operations officer remarked. Quote, It reminded me of the description of Matthew Ridgway taking over the 8th Army in Korea. He just infused the organization with optimism, confidence, and a sense of direction. Within six weeks, we had produced a campaign plan. End quote. In addition to the change in personality and perspective, Casey made crucial structural changes to bridge the schism that had characterized the relationship between Sanchez and Bremer, as well as between their respective organizations. The final days of CJTF-7 were degraded further by the abrupt departure of the CPA in May and June. Quote, Ambassador Francis Richardoni, a senior U.S. diplomat, was parachuted in to make CPA go away, and so they did, end quote, a CJTF-7 general officer remembered. Quote, Every night the bus would roll up, and the next morning in a meeting with the Iraqis, the CPA guy who had been the chair of that section, he'd have gone overnight. Just gone. Has anyone got the simultaneous translation headsets that were here last week? No. Have we got an interpreter for this meeting? No. It was bizarre, like being in a Kafkaesque fantasy. End quote. To repair this severe disruption in civil military operations, Casey's MNFI placed nearly 300, quote, gals and guys with guns, end quote, as Casey put it, into the embassy to handle political military affairs and plans, a step Negroponte supported. Casey himself established offices at both Camp Victory and the embassy in the Green Zone, more often working at his embassy office across from Negroponte's office. The embassy and MNFI also created joint teams to address day-to-day operations and long-term planning, as well as an interagency red team that provided alternative insights directly to Negroponte and Casey. To signal their collaborative approach, Casey and Negroponte issued a joint mission statement that applied to both their organizations, a dramatic change from the near-fratricidal working relations that often had hampered the CPA and CJTF-7. The Targeting of the New Iraqi State Page 322 Accenting the challenges the new coalition leaders would face just as they took over, Sunni insurgents in Baghdad killed Ezzedine Salim, president of the Iraqi Governing Council, on May 17th, a shocking assassination meant to intimidate the new Iraqi political class. Other assassinations followed, including the June 12th killing of Iraqi Deputy Foreign Minister Bassam Saleh Kuba, as well as the murder of Kamal al jara a senior education ministry official. On July 20th, Issam Jassim Khadam, a director general in the Ministry of Defense, was gunned down outside his home. After the spate of assassinations, the protection of the new Iraqi national leaders became a serious enough concern that many of them moved into the coalition-controlled Green Zone. Though safer, they were disconnected from the conditions experienced by the population they governed. Despite the coalition protection, insurgent attacks on key leaders continued and spread to provincial leaders. On July 14th, Nineveh Governor Osama Kashmula, who had collaborated closely with the U.S. troops in his province, was assassinated as he drove from Mosul to Baghdad. Though Nineveh had been regarded as a relatively stable economy of force area during the rotation of U.S. forces in early 2004, the governor's murder was an ominous sign that Sunni insurgents were seeking to undo the earlier successes of the 101st Airborne Division in the province. Likewise, in the seemingly stable province of Basra, the interim provincial governor, Hatsum al ainachi was shot to death outside his home on July 20th. These attacks represented a concerted effort by insurgents to undermine the legitimacy of the new Iraqi state. The establishment of the interim government and the transfer of sovereignty resulted in a short-lived phase of optimism among some of the Sunni insurgent groups. They incorrectly assumed that both acts were precursors to a complete coalition withdrawal that would be followed by Sunni insurgent victories that would return them to power. In July, in the perennially restive Anbar province, Toweed Wal Jihad kidnapped the three sons of the provincial governor, Abdul Karim Burgess. In exchange for their release, Burgess resigned his position and released a videotaped statement that he, quote, repented, end quote, for having collaborated with the coalition. When the new governor arrived, the security situation throughout the province had deteriorated to the point that he stated, quote, the province has collapsed and we feel like hostages. End quote. 
In the provincial capital of Ramadi, the insurgent body of the Ramadi Shura Council, headed by Muhammad Mahmoud Latif, had grown to the point that it could launch attacks of as many as 50 insurgents at a time, with reinforcements arriving by truck. Alongside the targeted assassinations of Iraqi political leaders, Sunni insurgents continued their strategy of hampering the new Iraqi state by targeting its critical infrastructure. On June 11th, insurgents blew up an oil pipeline between Kirkuk and a pumping station 50 kilometers to the northwest in Debus that provided fuel for one of Iraq's largest power stations, resulting in a 10% drop in nationwide electrical output. In July, Sunni insurgents continued their efforts to pressure smaller coalition members to withdraw from Iraq. Using the same method attempted unsuccessfully against South Korea, insurgents captured a Filipino contractor and threatened to kill him unless the Philippines' small force left immediately, to which the Philippine government agreed. While the departure of the 51 Filipino troops was militarily insignificant, it was a political blow to the coalition's legitimacy, increasing the number of countries that had dropped out of the coalition to five. The Expansion of the Iraqi Security Forces Page 323 The creation of MNSTCI reflected the fact that a year after the invasion, U.S. leaders tacitly had acknowledged that disbanding the Iraqi army had been a serious mistake, and the plan to replace it with three weak light infantry divisions and a local civil defense corps had failed its first major test, the April Uprisings. With the new military command under Petraeus, the coalition would try to repair the damage by building a much larger Iraqi armed force than the Pentagon had envisioned a year earlier. The UN had provided political cover for this change in UNSCR 1546, which declared that, quote, the multinational force will also assist in building the capability of the Iraqi security forces and institutions through a program of recruitment, training, equipping, mentoring, and monitoring, end quote. When MNSTCI unfurled its guidance in June 2004, the state of the Iraqi forces was dire. With the exception of only a handful of units, the Iraqi army and ICDC forces either had refused to fight during the April uprisings or had disappeared. The near-universal disintegration of the Iraqi security forces meant that Petraeus essentially was starting over, with the number of trained and equipped Iraqis frustratingly dropping to almost zero. The fiasco highlighted the flaw in the ICDC concept. Most of the units that dissolved had been ordered to fight away from their home areas, something most ICDC soldiers explicitly had expected would not be required of them. Many Iraqi troops refused outright to fight fellow Iraqis. Others, quote, simply wanted a job and did not feel morally obligated to complete their enlistment if they were unhappy with the conditions of service or had a better opportunity, end quote. Of the units that remained intact after spring 2004, many had problems with the basic tasks of paying their soldiers on time, feeding them, and ensuring they had fuel and ammunition. There also was almost no higher-level command and control of the local Iraqi units. No organization existed between the nascent Iraqi Army Brigades and the new Iraqi Ground Forces Command, while the Ministry of Defense, dissolved by Bremer's CPA Order 2 in 2003, had not been restored yet as a functioning organization. Petraeus arrived in Baghdad in June 2004 with a charge from Rumsfeld to conduct a complete review of the Iraqi security forces and the plans for their development, after which Petraeus recommended specific roles and missions for the Iraqi forces and the size and structure needed to accomplish them. It was the first time since the invasion that the coalition had taken the time to assess the Iraqi security sector in its entirety, and Petraeus's review would lead to sweeping changes in the coalition's plans for the Iraqi security forces. To begin with, both Petraeus and Casey judged the Iraqi security forces were far too small for the role it needed to play in securing the country ahead of the all-important elections of 2005. Therefore, they decided that all near-term effort should go toward creating as many infantry battalions as quickly as possible and getting them into the fight. The initial goal was for these battalions to become proficient at the platoon level so they could provide the inner ring of security during the elections just six months away. In setting goals for the size of the Iraqi security forces, Petraeus and Casey solicited recommendations from the multinational divisions about the security needs in their respective areas and considered historical counterinsurgency ratios of police and army forces to the population. 
While MNFI and MNSTCI originally held that a ratio of one policeman to 300 civilians was sufficient, after input from the multinational divisions, the ratio shifted to one policeman to 188 civilians, a change that would greatly expand the size of the Iraqi security forces. While the updated ratio would increase the size of the Iraqi police force significantly, it still fell far below the ratio most often deemed required for successful counterinsurgency operations, a ratio of one policeman to 50 civilians. Another consideration for expanding the force was the coalition's sober recognition of the negative consequences of the CPA's disbanding of the Iraqi army. Enlarging the Iraqi security forces would create tens of thousands of Iraqi jobs, coalition leaders believed, thereby draining potential recruits from the insurgency. The MNSTCI review brought an end to the bifurcated efforts to build a separate army and civil defense corps. The Iraqi army would continue as a national force meant to protect against external threats, but the term new Iraqi army was dropped in favor of the simpler Iraqi army. The change also served to re-emphasize continuity with the pre-2003 army, which was one of Iraq's few respected institutions. The decentralized ICDC effort, however, was abandoned, with control, recruiting, and funding for the remaining units pulled back to MNSTCI, and those formations renamed the Iraqi National Guard. These new, centrally built National Guard units essentially would replace the ICDC units destroyed in the spring uprising. Consolidating the ICDC effort also was meant to correct the major equipment shortages that ICDC units had suffered because of CMAT's bureaucratic hurdles and contract challenges. By the time Petraeus issued his review report, the ICDC and National Guard still wore captured pre-2003 Iraqi army uniforms, possessed just 1,800 of the 42,000 sets of body armor they required, and had almost no radios. Under Petraeus and Casey's new plan, the Iraqi army essentially would remain unchanged in size with a personnel strength of 27,000 spread across three divisions and 27 battalions, though the CJSOTF was allowed to expand the 36th Commando Battalion into a full Iraqi Special Operations Forces Brigade. However, the Iraqi National Guard would expand dramatically. Its initial size of 48,000 troops spread among six brigades and 45 battalions would grow to 77,000 personnel across six divisions, 21 brigades, and 65 battalions. The Iraqi police service would grow as well, from 90,000 local police and 16,000 border police to 135,000 local police and 32,000 border police. Altogether, the new Iraqi security forces would work toward a strength of 271,000, as opposed to the 171,000 the CMAT and CPAT had planned to build under the CPA. In addition to this force, the plan would train nearly 5,000 special police spread across two special police regiments, nine public order battalions, and an emergency response unit. These police were designed, like the Italian Carabinieri and the French Gendarme, to bridge the gap between local police forces that focused on local law enforcement and military units that eventually would focus on external threats. Plans also were developed to create a small air force and navy, and MNSTCI staffers began forming a rudimentary Iraqi joint headquarters to coordinate and lead the different services. The Petraeus Review substantively did not change plans for the Iraqi army's equipment and weapon systems, which Pentagon planners had limited in 2003 to ensure that the Iraqi military would not be a threat to its neighbors. Under MNSTCI, Iraqi army units principally would remain motorized infantry forces equipped with unarmored pickup trucks, lightly armed with few crew-served weapons, and nearly no RPGs or indirect fire weapons. MNFI and MNSTCI judged that NATO weapons were too maintenance-intensive for the Iraqi force, which would instead be armed with the former Soviet bloc weapons Iraqis were accustomed to using. Only one of the 30 army brigades would be a mechanized force equipped with Soviet BMP and MTLB armored personnel carriers and T-55 tanks. Petraeus's assessment also led Casey and MNFI to reprogram $1.8 billion from long-term electricity and water projects in the Iraqi Relief and Reconstruction Fund to pay for the growth in the Iraqi security forces and improvement in its capabilities. 
The shifting of funds represented a clash of priorities between those coalition leaders who believed investment in the Iraqi security forces was the surest way of stabilizing the country, and those who believed reconstruction and economic development should take precedence. The loss of reconstruction funds was a particularly hard blow for Major General Peter Corelli, commander of the 1st Cavalry Division and MNDB. He believed reconstruction had to be initiated first in order to create the jobs that served as the most effective route to long-term security, especially in the Iraqi capital. Robbing the reconstruction fund to pay for security forces was putting the cart before the horse, Corelli believed, and within the coalition command councils, he voiced strong opposition to Casey's reprogramming decision. However, with the approval of the U.S. Congress and the newly seated Iraqi government, the transfers went ahead by the late summer. For the time being, the Reconstruction First advocates had lost the argument. This reprogramming was the first of more than $10 billion spent on the Iraqi security forces during Casey's tenure. MNSTCI's focus on generating combat units ahead of the 2005 elections meant that the Iraqis' logistic capability had to wait, because creating organic logistics units in the Iraqi forces would slow the principal mission of standing up combat battalions. The sticker shock associated with the price tag of the Iraqi security forces also prompted Casey to fund only the minimum logistics capability required to transition security responsibility to the Iraqis. A final factor contributing to Casey's decision was the belief that the overall Iraq mission was a relatively short-term one, and that security conditions for the Iraqi security forces would naturally improve over time. Since coalition forces would be withdrawing and turning over responsibility to the Iraqis as soon as possible, MNFI leaders assumed there would not be time to build institutional and operational logistics organizations. Instead of their own logistics units, the Iraqis would have to rely on contractors for every aspect of their support functions, including combat resupply. Laundry, fuel, meals, and other basic functions all would have to be contracted with the local market, as the new Iraqi army did not have cooks or fuel handlers. Even Iraqi unit mobility depended on civilian contracted support because no Iraqi transportation corps would be established. The army also would not have a medical corps, meaning health care would have to be contracted with local Iraqi civilian facilities or, in rare cases, provided by U.S. facilities. The decision to expand the Iraqi security forces and its capabilities led to another significant change in the coalition campaign the pairing of American advisors directly with Iraqi units, a move that MNFI and MNSTCI hoped would prevent a recurrence of the Iraqi security forces April collapse. Advisory support teams, or ASTs, would embed with each Iraqi battalion, brigade, and division to coach the Iraqi units as they conducted operations. At the battalion level, the ASTs consisted of one major, two captains, and seven non-commissioned officers. Under a new Iraqi assistance group, MNSTCI eventually would establish 39 teams, with 31 coming from the 98th Reserve Division, though many of the initial ASTs were manned at only 50% strength. A New Coalition Strategy Page 326 among Casey's first steps upon arriving in Baghdad was to harness the energy of the MNFI headquarters to produce a campaign plan that was approved by Washington and published to his major subordinate commanders in Iraq, something CJTF-7 had not managed to do, though not through lack of trying. Constantly reacting to events and bedeviled by conflicting guidance from Washington, Sanchez and his command had instead relied on the original invasion plan, ordering changes through fragmentary orders as needed, but never giving the subordinate commands a common post-invasion game plan that synchronized their activities across the country. Sanchez's command had worked according to a bifurcated interim mission that called for units to continue offensive operations to root out elements of the former regime and at the same time to conduct stability and support operations. Casey had something different in mind. Taking his lead from UNSCR 1546 and interpreting Bush's intent from a speech at the U.S. Army War College in May, as well as a National Security Presidential Directive, Casey published a new campaign plan in August 2004, directing, quote, 
In partnership with the Iraqi government, MNFI conducts full-spectrum counterinsurgency operations to isolate and neutralize former regime extremists and foreign terrorists, and organizes, trains, and equips Iraqi security forces in order to create a security environment that permits the completion of UNSCR 1546. End quote. Central to the campaign, referenced by Casey's requirement to complete the UN-mandated schedule, was the holding of free and fair elections. The elections themselves would contribute to the desired end state, which was viewed as an, quote, Iraq at peace with its neighbors, with a representative government that respects human rights of all Iraqis, and with security forces sufficient to maintain domestic order and deny Iraq as a safe haven for terrorists, end quote. Casey's goals essentially would remain unchanged throughout his tenure as MNFI commander. The August 2004 plan introduced several new components into the coalition campaign. Casey had arrived in Iraq concerned that the coalition was overly kinetic in its actions, killing too many Iraqis in raids and accidentally at checkpoints, factors he suspected were creating ill will toward the coalition. In an effort to reduce these casualties, Casey originally had written a mission stating only that MNFI would, quote, conduct counterinsurgency operations, end quote. Subordinate commanders, however, had pressed him to use the wording, quote, full-spectrum operations, end quote, out of concern that, quote, when you say counterinsurgency, the troops think about chasing guys in pajamas around the jungle, end quote. In any event, the new MNFI mission statement marked the first time the coalition headquarters formally recognized counterinsurgency as a crucial component of its mission, in which reconstruction and development projects theoretically were considered as important as combat operations. The second major component of the new mission, the construction of the Iraqi security forces, was supported by the creation of MNSTCI and the restructuring of the Iraqi security forces. Casey also specified that the Iraqi security forces were the coalition's exit strategy. Functioning Iraqi security forces units would allow coalition units to draw down, a process Casey believed would have the positive byproduct of reducing the number of antibodies created against the coalition presence. Casey's campaign plan included criteria that would justify sequentially transitioning three levels of control over security matters in various areas of the country to the Iraqis. Quote, Iraqi local control, end quote, would be declared when, quote, local security forces can respond to local incidents with coalition oversight and an operating judicial system can arraign, hold, and try criminals in a timely manner, end quote, a level METS and MNCI initially hoped the Iraqi security forces could attain by October 1, 2004. Areas then could transition to, quote, Iraqi regional control, end quote, when Iraqi security forces units could operate, quote, under civil control within a province and can maintain internal security and are capable of anti-terrorism measures, end quote. Transition to the final level, quote, strategic overwatch, end quote, would take place when Iraq could handle internal and external threats on its own, at which point coalition forces would largely withdraw from the country. The exact definition of these three states was debated and redefined for the remainder of the war. Above all, the new campaign plan reflected the shared philosophical views of Rumsfeld, Abizade, and Casey that foreign presence in the Arab world was counterproductive and that efforts had to be taken to prevent Iraqis from becoming too dependent on coalition forces. Casey's staff included among its planning assumptions the dictum that foreign presence created natural resistance against itself. Quote, military slash security forces can contribute to the counterinsurgency effort, but cannot win it, end quote. Casey's red team had pronounced during July 2004 planning sessions. The team also concluded that while an Iraqi government, quote, that enjoys legitimacy in the eyes of the majority, end quote, could temporarily overcome public opposition to foreign troops, quote, nonetheless, foreign forces will never be broadly welcomed in Iraq, end quote. Casey's August 2004 guidance to MNFI operationalized these ideas, first and foremost by stressing the need to reduce the coalition footprint by closing coalition bases and moving forces outside of populated areas in an effort to reduce friction with Iraqis. 
Closing coalition bases also would help with the dependency theory, U.S. leaders believed, because it would force Iraqis to become self-reliant as large coalition units moved farther away onto what ultimately only would be nine coalition, quote, exit bases, end quote. The coalition would turn over the closed bases to the Iraqi security forces, reducing construction timelines and costs for the Iraqis. A detailed system, nicknamed Iraqi BRAC after the stateside U.S. base realignment and closure process, arose to guide the process and to ensure that coalition units would refrain from expanding or improving any base not among the nine exit bases after the fall of 2005. Surveys conducted in Iraq at the time appeared to confirm the assumptions of the principal architects of the strategy. A summer 2004 poll conducted by MNFI contractors in Baghdad, Basra, Mosul, Hilla, Diwaniya, and Bakuba found that 41% of respondents believed coalition forces should leave immediately, while 45% believed the coalition should leave after a permanent government was elected. Only 6% felt that the coalition should stay as long as was necessary for stability. Furthermore, 55% of those Iraqis surveyed responded that if coalition forces left immediately, they would feel, quote, more safe, end quote. Similarly, many of Casey's subordinates who had been in Iraq and fighting for months concurred with his plan's philosophical basis. After Casey briefed his new campaign plan to his division commanders, Major General Martin Dempsey, the commander of the 1st Armored Division and the longest deployed general officer in Iraq, wrote Casey to comment on the campaign plan's primary premise. Quote, There is definitely a point of descending consent on the near horizon beyond which we will not be welcome here, no matter how much good we're doing. We can push that point to the right if we reduce our footprint gradually and visibly. After the elections, I advocate significant reduction in U.S. forces in Iraq and suggest that they be apportioned functionally and not geographically. The functions requiring our presence include the train and equip function, protection from external threat or borders, and support of Iraqi security force against internal threat only as requested. As you know, I've lived in this time zone for three years. They, Iraqis, will not take responsibility for their problems, even if they have the capability to do so while we are here doing it for them. I strongly recommend that we continue our effort to get out of Iraqi cities, and I encourage planners to think out of the box in assigning responsibilities to forces in OIF-3, or Third Rotation of Operation Iraqi Freedom in January 2005, and beyond. End quote. This degree of support from Dempsey and other commanders reinforced Casey's sense that he was pursuing the correct course of action, and that the core philosophical beliefs that guided him were squarely on target for the Iraq mission. Glimpses of the Future Tribal Security and the Baghdad Belts As Casey and other coalition commanders began to reduce their unit's presence in Iraqi cities and decrease contact with the Iraqi population, a handful of Iraqi leaders and coalition officers considered alternative approaches that would later come to dominate the campaign. During the spring and summer of 2004, CJSOTF forces under an irregular warfare advocate, Army Major Adam Such, began a limited program to engage and arm the Albu Nimr and Albu Issa tribes of Anbar province. Concerned with the continuing threat in Fallujah and worsening security in the province, Mattis and his 1st Marine Division endorsed Such's efforts, providing materiel, funding, including pay for the Iraqi irregulars, and other operational support. However, Once the promising tribal security initiative came to the attention of the CPA and U.S. Embassy, it skidded. U.S. officials in Baghdad considered the arming of tribal militias a regressive measure out of step with long-term U.S. objectives for a new, non-tribal Iraq. In the aftermath of the April uprising and the near-universal collapse of the ICDC, U.S. leaders in Baghdad had no desire for decentralized security efforts outside Iraqi state institutions. As a result, MNSTCI, the CJSOTF, and MNFW were prohibited from supporting the tribal irregulars other than with captured insurgent weapons and ammunition. The program effectively ceased when the CJSOTF and Marine leadership rotated out of Iraq in the summer of 2004, though it provided some tactical lessons that later were useful to coalition leaders in Anbar. Meanwhile, as CJTF-7 prepared to deactivate in early summer 2004, 
Iraqi Defense Minister Ali Alawi offered coalition leaders a different idea for an Iraq campaign plan, albeit one that U.S. commanders at the time did not explore further. Alawi argued that Salafi jihadist organizations had fused with elements of Saddam's regime in a Sunni insurgency calling itself, quote, al muqawama al-Islamiya al-Wataniya, end quote, or Patriotic Islamic Resistance. The jihadists, working together, exploited symbols of radical Islam to recruit and create religious fervor, while the former Ba'athist regime elements provided structure, organization, and discipline. Referencing the captured Abu Musab al-Zarqawi letter that called for civil war, Alawi identified Baghdad as the objective of the Sunni insurgents' strategy, under which they would, quote, encircle Baghdad, not so much in the form of a classic siege, but rather through unopposed control over certain towns and districts around Baghdad. Again, this would not be in the form of actual physical control over territory. It can be simply a de facto acknowledgement by the inhabitants of these areas of the power of these groups, either by a willing acquiescence to their power or simply through fear. End quote. From these bases and safe havens located in the belts outside Baghdad, the Iraqi defense minister predicted the Sunni insurgents would launch armed raids and forays into the capital to incite sectarian violence and destabilize the government. Military control of the belts was crucial to any future campaign, Alawi concluded, although elections and a political process were needed to blunt the insurgent strategy as well. In other words, Iraq's top defense official correctly had identified for his coalition counterparts the insurgency's Baghdad Belts strategy a full 30 months before coalition leaders would acknowledge it themselves, and almost three years before the belts became the centerpiece of the Petraeus Odierno so-called surge campaign of 2007. The summer of 2004 brought new leaders, new commands, and a new purpose to a U.S.-led coalition demoralized by the April uprisings and the Abu Ghraib scandal. Taking the helm, Casey brought coherence and hope. Under Casey's new guidance, the coalition would focus on implementing the U.N. timeline for elections in 2005, while refocusing its efforts to establish expanded Iraqi security forces that U.S. leaders believed would be the coalition's ticket out of Iraq. The Petraeus assessment of the Iraqi security forces, meanwhile, resulted in redesigned Iraqi armed forces, with training, organization, and equipping of both the police and army standardized, and the Iraqi National Guard and Iraqi army merged into one force. At the same time, the turbulence of yet another transition of headquarters added to challenges inherent in the transfer of sovereignty and the continuing evolution of the insurgency would ensure that the new coalition command teams soon would be tested just as violently as CJTF-7 had been. As they raced to prepare for the elections of January 2005, the coalition divisions would find themselves fighting on multiple fronts once again. End of Chapter 13 The Changing of the Guard, Again, Spring to Summer 2004 Read by Adam Cable, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 2021Chapter 14, Part 1 Fighting to the Elections, August to December 2004 Of The U.S. Army in the Iraq War, Volume 1 by U.S. Army Operation Iraqi Freedom Study Group. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adam Cable. Chapter 14. Fighting to the Elections. August to December 2004. Page 335. From August to December 2004, Multinational Force Iraq, or MNFI, would put General George Casey's new campaign plan into effect. Driven by the United Nations election timeline, the coalition would focus on eliminating insurgent sanctuaries in seven key cities so that voting could take place on schedule in January 2005. In Casey's words, a, quote, fight to the elections, end quote. In Mosul, Tel Afar, North Babil, and Sadr City, the coalition and the Iraqi security forces would continue their ongoing efforts to stabilize the situation and remove the insurgent threat with localized operations. However, in three cities, Samarra, Najaf, and Fallujah, 
Casey and other coalition leaders judged that major operations would be required to restore government control so that elections could proceed. Removing the insurgent threat in Najaf would require the coalition to continue the war against the Sadrists while securing the kind of Iraqi political support whose absence had thwarted the spring operation against Muqtada Sadr's militants. Removing the insurgent threat to Samara and eastern Anbar, meanwhile, would require similar efforts to finish the job that had come to such a ragged halt in April. As these operations unfolded, Casey would find in Najaf a model for future combined coalition Iraqi operations, but the planned assault on Sunni insurgents in Fallujah would quickly spill over into an unplanned fight for northern Iraq and demonstrate that the coalition was facing a thinking, operationally adaptive enemy. Operations in Najaf, page 335. The proverbial ink was not dry on MNFI's campaign plan when the tenuous ceasefire with Moqtada Sadr's militia broke down, this time in the Shia shrine city of Najaf. After suffering heavy losses mainly in Baghdad and Karbala during the April 2004 uprisings and early summer, Jaysh al-Mahdi, or JAM, had gravitated to Najaf and negotiated a truce that put the vitally important Imam Ali Mosque and the adjacent Wadi as Salam Cemetery off-limits to coalition troops, essentially turning Najaf's old city into a rebel safe haven. For the coalition, the problems in Najaf were in the Multinational Division Central South, or MNDCS, area of operations, but were the tactical responsibility of the 11th Marine Expeditionary Unit, or MEU. The 11th MEU, U.S. Central Command's or CENTCOM's Theater Reserve, had arrived in the provinces of Najaf and Qadisiya on July 21, 2004 to help fill the gap left by the sudden withdrawal of Spanish troops following the Madrid-Spain terrorist attacks on March 11, 2004. Taking the place of Task Force Dragon, a composite unit from the 1st Infantry Division, the 11th MEU was the fourth coalition unit in four months assigned to hold Najaf, and trouble was not long in coming for the newly arrived Marines. Shortly after reaching the city, the 11th MEU was immersed in fighting that began with a chance encounter between an American patrol and Sadrist fighters near Moqtada Sadr's family home on August 2nd. Sadr's men responded to the meeting engagement by attacking Najaf's main police station on August 5th, and an intense battle ensued that spread into the city's previously off-limits cemetery. During two days of fighting, Marines used tanks, attack helicopters, and fixed-wing close air support to gain the upper hand, including the dropping of 1,000-pound bombs and the nighttime use of AC-130 gunships. When the fighting subsided, coalition losses amounted to a downed UH-1N helicopter, five Marines killed, and 60 wounded, while JAM lost an estimated 350 killed. The intensity of the August 5th and 6th battle convinced coalition officers that the sprawling Wadi as Salam Cemetery and the Imam Ali Shrine Complex had become insurgent operating bases too large for the 11th MEU to handle on its own. Although Casey and Lt. Gen. Thomas Metz had planned to clear Najaf of insurgents before the January 2005 elections, they had not planned to sequence that shrine city first having agreed with Prime Minister Ayad Alawi to begin with the less complicated problem of Samara. However, with the Sadrists having already precipitated a battle in Najaf, the coalition commanders seized the opportunity to remove the JAM threat first. To reinforce the 11th MEU, Multinational Corps Iraq, or MNCI, dispatched an attack helicopter battalion and two army battalions, 1st Battalion 5th Cavalry Regiment and 2nd Battalion 7th Cavalry Regiment, from the 1st Cavalry Division in Baghdad to assist the Marines in clearing the cemetery and restoring order to Najaf. To clarify the chain of command for what would be a Marine-led operation on the ground, MNCI gave Multinational Force West, or MNFW, temporary control of Najaf and Qadisiya provinces from the Polish-led MNDCS. While this change fixed the problem of working through MNDCS language barriers and political caveats, Placing MNFW over the coalition troops in Najaf slowed reporting between the city and Baghdad. This eventually led the frustrated MNCI headquarters to communicate directly with the 11th MEU, especially on matters related to the politically important Imam Ali shrine. The speed at which the reinforcing battalions left Baghdad, 1st Battalion 5th Cavalry began moving to Najaf just 12 hours after being alerted, 
made for an impressive operational maneuver but created new problems. As the two battalions departed for Najaf, all but two of their Iraqi interpreters refused to go with them, leaving the two units with a sum total of five interpreters for the first two weeks of the battle, which severely hampered the unit's ability to communicate with Iraqi security forces and local Najafis. The rapid movement of the battalions also caused consternation in the 1st Cavalry Division headquarters, which MNCI had tasked a short time before to designate a, quote, working, end quote, core reserve that was assigned battle space in the Multinational Division Baghdad, or MNDB, area, but could deploy anywhere in the country within 96 hours. In practice, the activation of the working reserve left a sudden gap in the coalition's Baghdad battle space that the 1st Cavalry Division had to scramble to fill. The situation became acute when, as had been the case in the April uprisings, the fighting in Najaf quickly spread across southern Iraq and to Baghdad. Colonel Robert B. Abrams' 1st Brigade, 1st Cavalry Division, which had fought the Sadrists in April, again faced off against JAM for 62 straight days. Fighting Among the Tombstones the fighting in Najaf drew the U.S. troops into an extraordinary urban battlefield the likes of which American forces have rarely experienced. According to Shia Muslims, any believer buried near the tomb of Imam Ali in Najaf is guaranteed to enter paradise, and as a result, the Wadi as Salam Cemetery is the largest in the world. With over five million graves arrayed in a labyrinthine complex of multi-story crypts and underground catacombs, the cemetery was effectively a city in its own right, one with political implications across the entire worldwide community of some 150 million Shia Muslims who considered it sacred ground. After MNCI's reinforcements arrived, U.S. commanders in Najaf prepared to attack from north to south through the cemetery to end its use as a safe haven by thousands of JAM fighters occupying both it and the nearby Imam Ali shrine complex. On August 9th, the attacking U.S. troops began making their way into the vast necropolis while forced to contend with a politically imposed exclusionary zone around the Imam Ali Mosque. Over the next two days, American troops fended off mortars, snipers, and improvised explosive devices, or IED, throughout the forbidding terrain of elaborate crypts in summer temperatures that exceeded 125 degrees. With little respite at night, the oppressive heat sometimes caused the coalition troops' sophisticated electronic systems to fail and, as one historian described it, quote, turned the armored vehicles into furnaces, end quote. To combat the intense heat, some vehicle crews went into battle with bags of intravenous fluid flowing into their veins. The dense collection of graves, crypts, and catacombs made for a complex three-dimensional battlefield. The threat from Sadrist and Iranian snipers inside the cemetery was serious enough to prompt coalition commanders to gather Navy Sea, Air, and Land teams, or SEAL, and Special Forces snipers from across the country, resulting in a productive teaming of special operators with Marine and 1st Cavalry Division snipers. Yet the tight urban environment also resulted in some close melees, as in one incident in which an insurgent scrambled onto a tank from 1st Battalion 5th Cavalry, shot the tank's commander and loader, and then escaped into the graveyard. In this challenging environment, the majority of the Iraqi units accompanying the coalition attackers collapsed. The 405th Iraqi National Guard Battalion dissolved under stress, the 406th Iraqi National Guard Battalion disintegrated under fire, and the 404th Iraqi National Guard Battalion in Karbala became combat ineffective when half of its soldiers refused to deploy to Najaf. Some units of the new Iraqi army performed passably in supporting combat operations, but only the 36th Commando Battalion, working with Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force, or CJSOTF, advisors, managed to conduct high-intensity kinetic combat operations. The battalion fought in the challenging urban environment and provided critical reconnaissance when a few of its native Najafi soldiers changed into civilian clothes and scouted Sadrists' positions near the Imam Ali Shrine. With this intelligence in hand, the battalion prepared to assault and clear the shrine, if Iraqi and coalition leaders ordered them to do so. Ceasefire with the Sadrists As the 11th MEU and the Army Cavalry Battalions made their way through the cemetery on August 11th, 
the Iraqi government began negotiations with the Sadrists that produced a series of sporadic ceasefires. Throughout more than a week of unproductive talks, the fighting continued, with coalition troops inflicting heavy losses on JAM and shrinking the militia's foothold in the city, while Muqtada Sadr and his spokesmen denounced the Iraqi government as illegitimate and called for a general insurrection to expel the coalition. By August 24th, Sadr and his militia were practically surrounded in the area around the shrine, while the exclusionary zone around the mosque had shrunk to a mere 100 meters. As the coalition troops prepared for a three-battalion assault on the remaining JAM fighters, Prime Minister Ayad Alawi pressed Casey to order coalition troops to attack into the shrine itself, where Sadr was reportedly sheltering. In Alawi's view, the situation was at a decisive point. Although Grand Ayatollah Ali Husseini Sistani had been in London, United Kingdom, for medical treatment during the fighting, he was due back in Iraq within hours, and the Prime Minister anticipated that the returning Sistani would call for a ceasefire that would enable Sadr and his fighters to survive and fight again another day. Meeting with Casey and other coalition leaders in his residence on the evening of August 24th, Alawi urged the MNFI commander to agree to, quote, finish the job, end quote, against Sadr while it was still possible, and announced that he was ready to authorize Iraqi troops to attack the mosque with coalition support. A skeptical Casey, judging that Alawi and coalition diplomats were on the verge of ordering a disastrous military operation that could damage Shiism's holiest structure, attempted to restrain the prime minister's inclinations. An operation in the shrine would require the attacking troops to develop extensive intelligence and use extraordinary discipline, Casey observed, and though the Iraqi commandos had demonstrated skill in less complex operations, Casey told Alawi, quote, they aren't ready to do that yet, end quote. To buy more time, Alawi suggested that Casey should close Iraq's airspace and ports in order to block Sistani's plane from landing, but Casey demurred by observing that, since Iraq was sovereign, any such decision needed to come from Alawi's government. One factor staying Casey's hand was that he believed he simply did not have sufficient awareness of the situation in Najaf to assess the coalition's options. To gain clarity on the situation on the ground, Casey decided on the night of August 24th to dispatch Metz to the Shrine City to provide a personal assessment. On August 25th, Metz reported that with the mosque surrounded, capturing Sadr was possible, but risky, and likely to involve high casualties. However, the dilemma was quickly overcome by events. To Alawi's frustration, before he could persuade Casey to order coalition forces to support an assault into the mosque to capture Sadr, Sistani landed in Basra and began brokering a ceasefire. On August 26, Sistani's efforts yielded an agreement for Sadr and his men to withdraw peacefully from the shrine. Unlike Alawi, Casey harbored no regrets about Sadr's escape from Najaf. As the days passed, Casey came to doubt that Sadr had actually been in the shrine on August 24th and 25th because some delayed reports claimed the insurgent leader had slipped through the coalition's tightening noose a few days earlier. Despite this second major confrontation with JAM, Casey judged that the Sunni insurgent groups were still a greater threat to Iraq's long-term stability. Quote, I didn't see JAM as the chief threat, he recalled later. In August in Najaf, there was a kind of countrywide uprising. But I would say that was more of a tactical threat. By that I mean, it was a lot of violence in a short period of time, but it never threatened to undermine the whole mission. The main threat was the former regime insurgency. End quote. To Casey's point, Moqtada Sadr and his militia had indeed been dealt a serious blow. Sadr had been forced to slink out of Najaf with the shrine and city back in government hands. His forces had also been devastated, with an estimated 1,500 of his fighters killed. The coalition, meanwhile, had lost seven marines and three soldiers killed. Sadr's uprising had also alienated Najaf's local leaders by disturbing the pilgrimage and religious tourist trade on which the city depended, and as a result, the political balance in Najaf shifted towards Sadr's principal rivals, Abdul Aziz al-Hakim and his Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq, or SCIRI. For many coalition and Iraqi observers, the negotiated ceasefire and Sadr's escape were an ominous development, leaving intact an organization that still posed a threat to the coalition's end state of a representative and U.S.-allied Iraqi government. In the aftermath of the battle, 
Lieutenant Colonel Miles Miyamasu, the commander of the 1st Battalion, 5th Cavalry Regiment, put it succinctly, quote, With solder, it's not over. It's just going to be different. End quote. Casey and the Najaf Model For Casey, the battle in Najaf was a model for how future combat operations should be conducted, and he attempted to copy it elsewhere several times during his command tenure. The Najaf model had three main ingredients. Iraqi security forces collaborating with coalition advisors in the military domain, supportive Iraqi government leaders providing political top cover to legitimize coalition combat operations, and economic reconstruction following closely on the heels of military operations. In political terms, Casey considered confronting Muqtada Sadr in Najaf a significant political achievement in that it had united the nascent Iraqi government against an insurgent menace for the first time. Quote, Strategically, Najaf was important to us because we needed a vehicle that would cause the Alawi government to come together and have a success, end quote, Casey recalled later. Unlike the April battle in Fallujah, the Najaf battle had seen the Iraqi government announce its support of coalition military actions, very different from the Iraqi governing council's threats to resign during the April 2004 fighting. While some of this was the result of Alawi's personal involvement, it was also a sign of the political spade work Casey and Ambassador John Negroponte had done to ensure Iraqi leaders would not blanch when the inevitable collateral damage occurred. Casey observed later, quote, One of the lessons learned from the first Fallujah was that you've got to keep the Iraqi political leadership behind the military operations, or you have a lot of military effort for nothing. End quote. Casey also concluded that the Najaf operation had validated the idea that Reconstruction would show Iraqis that after the fighting stopped, the coalition had their best interests in mind, thereby mitigating the antibody effect of coalition forces and buying additional time for training the Iraqi security forces. The sooner Reconstruction could begin after the guns fell silent, the better, Casey judged, and ideally, plans for Reconstruction would be made in parallel with plans for combat operations. By mid-November 2004, the coalition had started 226 projects in Najaf valued at over $50 million. The 11th MEU alone distributed almost $45 million in condolence payments and damage compensation claims while starting construction of eight new schools and repairing 24 more. The experience at Najaf also convinced Casey that successful combat operations required the meaningful involvement of Iraqi troops in order to put an Iraqi face on the conflict. Casey believed Iraqi troops were indispensable in politically sensitive operations such as entry into insurgent-held mosques and the capture of insurgent allied political figures. Iraqis also provided situational awareness and local intelligence that coalition units could not hope to acquire on their own. To these ends, Casey judged that Najaf had shown that Iraqi units could perform well when paired with coalition advisors. Quote, we had with the Iraqi security forces the early version of transition teams, end quote, Casey recalled. Quote, what we found was the Iraqi units do okay when we're with them. That became kind of a lesson that was going to expand into the transition strategy, end quote. This premise would later become a bedrock of MNFI's campaign plan as the headquarters reassessed the situation following the January 2005 elections. The Iraqi 36th Commando Battalion Not all of the lessons the coalition drew from Najaf were valid. Most significantly, the Iraqi security forces' performance in Najaf had been somewhat overstated. In fact, most of the Iraqi army units engaged in Najaf had performed poorly under fire or disintegrated outright, even when paired with Multinational Security Transition Command Iraq or MNSTCI's advisor support teams. The 36th Commando Battalion, the single Iraqi unit that had fought well enough to justify Casey's impressions of the security forces, was not representative of the rest of the new Iraqi army. In late 2004, most Iraqi units were close to ethnically homogenous, either mostly Shia, Kurd, or Sunni, despite MNSTCI's intent to promote ethnic mixing. By contrast, from its inception in the hands of the CJSOTF, the 36th Commando Battalion was an Iraqi unit unlike any other. The battalion had originally been authorized by CENTCOM Commander General John Abizade in response to complaints from five of Iraq's largest political parties that wanted a greater share in re-establishing security, 
and the CJSOTF had received the mission to build and mentor it. Recognizing the potential danger of ethnically homogeneous units, CJSOTF leaders rigorously enforced a heterogeneous composition that roughly matched Iraq's demographics. The Kurdish Democratic Party provided approximately 28% of the manpower for the unit, Ahmad Chalabi's Iraqi National Congress 22%, the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan 21%, Alawi's Iraqi National Congress 15%, and SCIRI 15%. The battalion had a Sunni, Shia, and Arab Kurd mix at every level, resulting in an organization whose members, in the words of one coalition advisor, quote, sort of policed each other and kept each other honest, end quote. As the diverse members of the 36th Commando Battalion had fought shoulder to shoulder in 2004, they had forged a unit identity that was Iraqi rather than ethno-sectarian, a factor that helped overcome Iraqi soldiers' inherent reluctance to deploy outside their home area. It also helped overcome the reticence common in other units to fighting and killing fellow countrymen, especially those of the same ethno-religious group. Beyond its ethnic makeup, the 36th Commando Battalion was distinguished from the rest of the Iraqi army in its assessment and selection process. Recruits who did not meet tough standards were sent home. Only 389 of 508 Iraqis in the first group of applicants completed the training, and a similar selection percentage persisted as the unit expanded over time and became part of a larger Iraqi Special Operations Forces Brigade. Coalition leaders also allowed the CJSOTF to equip the 36th Commando Battalion differently from the remainder of the Iraqi army by allowing the battalion to use North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, weapons and equipment, to include M4 rifles, body armor, sniper rifles, and U.S. night vision devices. While training and equipping the commandos with NATO equipment took time and occurred gradually, it was a decision that would both enhance the unit's capabilities and magnify its differences from other Iraqi army units. Even beyond the June 2004 transfer of sovereignty, the 36th Commando Battalion's CJSOTF advisors retained key authorities over their protégés, including making hiring and firing decisions and controlling the unit's pay factors that reduced the problem of corruption that plagued many other Iraqi units. Unlike most other Iraqi units, the battalion's advisors were paired with them throughout the organization's entire history, from initial training through employment on the battlefield, a matching that continued across multiple American rotations. Over time, the 36th Commando Battalion developed such skilled combat capabilities that some coalition advisors declared the only way to tell the Iraqi commandos from their CJSOTF counterparts was that the Americans tended to be taller. The 36th Commando Battalion's abilities and will to fight in Najaf had been impressively atypical, hardly a performance on which to make broad assumptions about the future role of the Iraqi security forces in the campaign to secure and stabilize the country. Operations in Samarra after Najaf, the coalition commands turned their attention to the insurgent stronghold in Samarra, another of the seven cities the coalition judged to be crucial to conducting successful elections. The city's situation was a volatile one, especially because it held one of Shia Islam's four holiest shrines, the al Askariya Mosque, where the remains of the 10th and 11th Shia Imams were buried and the point from which most Shia Muslims believed the 12th Imam disappeared from the earth. However, Samarra was also a Sunni-majority city and former Ba'athist stronghold of 340,000 people that, by fall 2004, had fallen into insurgent hands. The sectarian issues involved and the town's relative proximity to Baghdad meant that its position as an insurgent base was a threat to the January elections. Casey also judged that Samarra, like Najaf, was another, quote, strategic opportunity for the Iraqi interim government to have success against insurgents and terrorists in a Sunni area, end quote, all of which pointed toward a large-scale coalition operation to secure the city before 2004 was over. Though the 1st Infantry Division had retaken the city in the April uprisings, Samara's security situation had deteriorated as Combined Joint Task Force 7, or CJTF-7, withdrew U.S. units from Iraqi cities in May and June. In June 2004, just two months after the division had cleared Samara, the city council president had been intimidated into resigning, 
the city's police force had defected, and the local Iraqi National Guard battalion commander had deserted, leaving his unit to disintegrate. By fall 2004, only one CJSOTF Operational Detachment Alpha, or ODA, was stationed inside the city, with one battalion from the 1st Infantry Division garrisoned a 30-minute drive away, meaning the city was under neither coalition or government control. Recognizing that the city needed to be retaken, Major General John Batiste's 1st Infantry Division conducted shaping operations from July through September in preparation for a large-scale assault. The shaping operations were designed to wear down insurgent forces by luring them into battle and thus enabling the coalition to understand better the insurgent networks. The division also received, at the last minute, six Iraqi army and police battalions to lend additional legitimacy to its operations. By the time the shaping operations had matured, the task of taking the city itself had become much simpler. On October 1, 2004, the division launched Operation Baton Rouge, a two-day clearing of the city by six U.S. battalions under its 2nd Brigade combat team. In those two days of combat against a well-prepared enemy, the brigade combat team killed 127 insurgents and captured 128 more, while losing one soldier killed and eight wounded. The long preparatory phase allowed the coalition troops to spare the city from significant destruction, and, as a result, civilian casualties were minimal. At the MNFI level, Samara seemed to validate the lessons of the Najaf model, especially in terms of the Iraqi role. Two of the six Iraqi battalions assigned to the operation fought fiercely. A special police commando battalion and the 36th commando battalion, supported by MNSTCI and CJSOTF advisors, respectively, performed tasks that would have been politically sensitive for coalition troops, including clearing a hospital used by insurgents and forcibly entering the insurgent-held al Askaria Mosque. As soon as the heaviest fighting concluded, the 1st Infantry Division initiated 22 reconstruction projects valued at $10 million to help garner popular support. Unfortunately, obtaining long-term support and funding for reconstruction proved elusive, as future Shia-dominated Iraqi governments were slow to provide national-level assistance to the Sunni-majority city. At the tactical level, however, Samara yielded some lessons that were contrary to MNFI's plans. The 1st Infantry Division had learned that keeping cities secure required U.S. troops living in the city, not commuting to their area of operations from distant bases. Having been forced to cope with the results of what happened when no coalition forces were based in the city, after the battle, the division moved forces back into Samara and reopened outposts inside the city's confines. The Second Battle of Fallujah, November 2004, page 344. Fallujah in Insurgent Hands Buoyed by the success of combined operations in Najaf and Samara, the coalition next focused on insurgent-held Fallujah, the city Casey had selected to be the last stronghold cleared before the elections because he believed it would be the most difficult. Since the first battle of Fallujah in April 2004, the city had become a magnet for both Iraqi Sunni insurgents who wanted to join the resistance against the United States and foreign militants who sought to join what they considered a worldwide jihad. By the late summer of 2004, the Fallujah Brigade that had been left to secure the city in April had become a visible failure, with its various portions either ineffective or joining the insurgency. Ironically, the coalition-created Fallujah Brigade was effectively replaced by the Fallujah Resistance Brigade, a loose insurgent confederation directed by a Fallujah Mujahideen Shura Council comprised of leaders from 39 different insurgent organizations. While no one leader controlled the council, Sheikh Abdullah Janabi, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, and Fallujah native Omar Hadid were its dominant personalities. The council also enjoyed the support of prominent cleric Harith al-Dari and his Association of Muslim Scholars, which considered itself the political wing of the Sunni insurgency. Despite their operational collaboration, the loose confederation of Fallujah insurgents at times broke down in power struggles and disagreements over strategy and religious orthodoxy. Within Toid Wal Jihad, Omar Hadid, a Fallujah electrician who had risen to prominence as a battlefield commander, often clashed with the Jordanian Abu Musab al Zarqawi. Other conflicts among the various groups at times escalated into violence. 
When the Albu Issa tribe attempted in July to set up a new Jordanian-trained police force in its tribal area, Sheikh Abdullah Janabi's men kidnapped the nephew of the Albu Issa Sheikh as punishment, after which the Albu Issa tried, but failed, to assassinate Janabi. Also in July, a dispute between the more pragmatic Janabi, who believed in limiting insurgent attacks to avoid a large-scale coalition response, and Zarqawi, who believed in striking the coalition whenever possible, devolved into fighting, with Janabi issuing a fatwa ordering the killing of Zarqawi's local emir. Demonstrating how quickly alliances shifted, in August, Janabi's group cooperated with Zarqawi's Toid Wal Jihad to capture the compounds of the 505th and 506th Iraqi National Guard battalions near Fallujah. After defeating the two garrisons, the attacking insurgents tortured and killed several Iraqi National Guard leaders and converted the National Guard bases into insurgent headquarters. The executions of the National Guard leaders, who were members of the Albu Marai tribe, led that tribe to change sides and support the coalition, demanding vengeance for the killings. By September, the temporary alliance between Janabi and Toid Wal Jihad had broken down again, with Janabi openly critical of the group's more brutal methods and implementation of extreme religious standards. As Zarqawi's Toid Wal Jihad gradually made Fallujah its headquarters, foreign fighters flocked to the city, swelling the number of insurgents there to as many as 4,000. Fallujans made up about 50% of this number, other Anbaris roughly 30%, and foreign fighters 20%. The rise of Toid Wal Jihad and other Salafi groups, as well as the influx of foreign fighters, radicalized the insurgency in the city and led to the imposition of Sharia law and basic functions of an Islamic state in many neighborhoods. Religious police began patrolling the streets to promote virtue and punish vice. Religious judges were appointed to rule over Sharia courts, and public punishments and executions became commonplace. In the words of Lue Ali Hussein, a Shia civilian from Fallujah, quote, Foreign fighters began to drift into the city as things got tenser. Yemenis, Saudis, Moroccans, Palestinians, Syrians, Lebanese, thousands of them. They took over the whole city. The foreigners were uneducated and had weird ideas about religion, like they had been brainwashed by fanatics. They forbid smoking, for example. Anyone caught with a cigarette would have his fingers chopped off. They would not allow vegetable sellers to display cucumbers and tomatoes next to each other because they considered that too erotic. They would put underwear on sheep. They apparently thought it was against Islam to allow a female animal to expose her genitals. End quote. Implementing Zarqawi's sectarian agenda, the jihadists began to intimidate and kill Shia civilians in Fallujah. Quote, I never had any troubles being a Shia in Fallujah during all my years there, Luwe Ali Hussein explained later, and in the early days of the resistance, Iraqi Shia and Sunnis were working together just fine. But as the foreigners began to take over, Shia like me were pushed to the side and eventually threatened by these outsiders. End quote. After Sunni jihadists executed several of his Shia friends, Hussein fled to Baghdad and joined JAM, never to return to Fallujah. By September, the first MEF staff headquartered just outside Fallujah had clearly recognized this metastasis and characterized the city as, quote, a safe haven for foreign fighters, terrorists, and insurgents, a cancer on the rest of Anbar province, end quote. The Politics of the Fallujah Operation Mindful that political pressure had halted the April 2004 assault on Fallujah, coalition leaders in late 2004 were determined to lay a better political groundwork with their Iraqi government counterparts ahead of the November operation. Paired with Negroponte, Casey began working to persuade Alawi of the need to retake the city. Quote, We have to start together, stay together, finish together. End quote, Casey recalled telling Alawi, quote, If we start this, you've got to commit to me that you'll have the political support to finish it. End quote. As part of his end of the bargain, Alawi delivered a series of emergency decrees to facilitate operations in Fallujah, including a mid September edict that disbanded the Fallujah Brigade and the city's police force to simplify the identification of enemy fighters and avoid the optic of coalition forces fighting men in Iraqi government uniforms. On November 7th, just before combat operations began, 
Alawi declared 60 days of emergency rule and a traffic ban in the city, as well as the closure of the borders with Syria and Jordan to make the arrival of insurgent reinforcements or the escape of insurgent leaders more difficult. The Prime Minister also went on Iraqi television and radio to explain the government's actions. Scarred by the information operations failures of the first Battle of Fallujah in April, when the media had depicted the fight against insurgents in the city in highly charged terms, Metz and other senior leaders made information operations a key component of the pending mission. Reporters were embedded with almost all key ground units to facilitate reporting that could discredit false insurgent claims of coalition war crimes. Alawi also recognized the importance of the battle of perceptions and observed to Casey that there was, quote, a risk of the impression being given of an impending U.S. invasion of Fallujah rather than a combined Iraqi-slash-MNFI operation, end quote. To counter this idea, Alawi and Casey agreed that Arabic media reporters should embed with Iraqi units taking part in the operation, and an Iraqi general should serve as spokesperson for the operation and be the primary conduit to Arabic media outlets. One target, in particular, would require special information operations handling. Fallujah's hospital had been a rich source of insurgent propaganda during the April battle, when, as MNCI Commander Metz explained, quote, The enemy would use the hospital as a safe haven every time we would strike the insurgency. They would claim all these atrocities and go to the hospital, and like Baghdad Bob, the Iraqi Minister of Information during the invasion, there was Dr. Bob that would just tell of all the atrocities which we knew were not true because we would watch the strikes with UAVs and watch the one or two people that were taken to the hospital instead of 30. End quote. Mindful of the hospital's importance, coalition commanders developed early plans for the 36th Commando Battalion, supported by CGSOTF advisors, to seize the hospital during the opening phase of the operation and prevent its use once again by insurgent propagandists. Al Fajr in Fallujah. Originally named Phantom Fury, the operation to retake Fallujah was renamed Al Fajr, Arabic for New Dawn, at Prime Minister Alawi's suggestion to emphasize that it was a combined Iraqi coalition operation. In Casey's conception, the operation was meant to secure the approaches to Baghdad and prevent car bomb factories and insurgent cells from sabotaging the election in the capital just a few weeks away. By the time detailed operational planning for Al Fajr began, the senior Marine leadership of MNFW had changed, with Major General Richard F. Natonsky replacing Major General James Mattis as commander of the 1st Marine Division, and Lieutenant General John F. Sattler replacing Lieutenant General James T. Conway as commander of 1st MEF and MNFW. Natonsky nested his intent for the operation within that of MNCI to eliminate the insurgent sanctuary, set the conditions for local control, and secure the approaches to Baghdad. However, Sattler's greatest concern, as well as the concern of MNCI officers who had been scarred by the premature termination of the first Fallujah battle, was in generating sufficient combat power and resources for the operation. Concluding that the upcoming operation would require more than Regimental Combat Team, or RCT-1, already assigned to the Fallujah area, Sattler ordered Regimental Combat Team 7, originally assigned the stretch of the Euphrates Valley from the town of Hit to the Syrian border, to consolidate on Fallujah. Meanwhile, at the operational level, Metz and MNCI ordered significant reinforcements to move to eastern Anbar. Mindful that the insurgents had cut the coalition supply lines in April, MNCI assigned 2nd Brigade 1st Cavalry Division to MNFW to protect rear areas and lines of communications around Fallujah. MNCI also committed the Corps Reserve, a striker battalion from Mosul, to assist 2nd Brigade in establishing a cordon around Fallujah, freeing Natonsky and his Marines of the task of protecting their rear area as they focused on the city. MNCI and MNFW also built a massive stockpile of supplies near Fallujah to avoid the logistical pressure that had come near to breaking the coalition in April. The stockpiling amounted to a rejection of the coalition's normal Walmart-style, just-in-time logistics delivery, but as Natonsky observed, quote, Walmart doesn't have to contend with ambushes or improvised explosive devices, end quote. Other units were drawn from elsewhere in Iraq and outside the theater. The 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry Regiment, a battalion from the 1st Cavalry Division that had fought alongside the Marines during the Battle of Najaf, was attached to Regimental Combat Team 7, 
while 2nd Battalion, 2nd Infantry Regiment from the 1st Infantry Division in MNDNC was attached to RCT-1. The two army battalions would provide much-needed armor capability that had been absent from the April battle, and a battalion of army field artillery would provide additional fire support. In a rare move, British leaders deployed the United Kingdom's Black Watch Battle Group, a battalion task force, from Dikar province to the eastern portion of MNFW's sector in North Babil, freeing the RCT-1 units there to join the Fallujah battle. However, in a demonstration of the challenges of coalition warfare, moving the battle group required Prime Minister Tony Blair's approval in a process that took nearly three weeks. Also joining MNFW in Fallujah was the 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit, CENTCOM's theater reserve that had been reconstituted after the commitment of the 11th MEU to Najaf. The 24th MEU's deployment was a short-notice alert that sent it to Iraq by aircraft and cargo ships rather than the normal mode of amphibious assault ships. The additional Marines went to North Babil province to allow RCT-1 to concentrate its forces further on Fallujah. A third MEU, the Okinawa-based 31st, which served as the theater reserve for the Pacific Command Area of Operations, was ordered to deploy rapidly to Iraq to provide additional reinforcements for the operation. Altogether, the three MEUs provided over 6,000 additional Marines to MNFI, more than a full-strength Army Brigade combat team. Finally, six Iraqi battalions assembled to participate in the operation, two of which, the 36th Commando Battalion and a battalion from the Special Police Commando Brigade, had been involved in almost every coalition combat action in 2004. The operation unfolded in three phases marked by far more deliberate preparations than had occurred in April. The first consisted of shaping actions, including airstrikes and psychological and information operations to confuse the entrenched insurgents and kill key leaders. Special Operations Forces played a key role in this phase, driven in part by their recognition of Abu Musab al-Zarqawi's rise to the top of the insurgency. Political anxieties within coalition headquarters and the Iraqi government, still raw from April's truncated operation, led to a prohibition on ground assault missions into the city, so the special operators turned to precision manned and unmanned airstrikes instead. Obtaining approval for these missions was difficult, as fear of civilian casualties led to approval levels that ranged from the MNFI headquarters to Secretary of Defense or SecDef Donald Rumsfeld, and often targets disappeared before they could be struck. To speed up the approval process, special operators found an innovative way to minimize collateral damage by pairing a joint direct attack munition guidance system with the smallest bomb in the U.S. Air Force inventory and using a completely vertical angle of attack to drop the bomb. The result was a weapon that could flatten a single house with little damage to nearby buildings. With these changes made, Approval authority was delegated to Special Operations Forces for most missions, and they worked with the MNFW headquarters to identify and strike key targets that would help in the coming battle. Information operations also played a critical role in the first phase of the operation as the coalition sought to prevent scenes of civilian suffering that were prevalent during the April battle. Warned by leaflets and broadcasts of the impending assault on their town, the vast majority of Fallujah's civilian population fled. With the city mostly empty of civilians, MNFW began the second phase of the operation, isolating Fallujah by seizing the peninsula, western bridges, and the city's hospital, while jamming communications within the town and cutting off its electricity. On the evening of November 8th, Marines and soldiers began the third phase, the actual assault of the city, with RCTs 1 and 7 attacking abreast from north to south, supported by the Army's 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry Regiment, and 2nd Battalion, 2nd Infantry Regiment. Concerned that the railroad tracks and high berms on the north side of the city would be a barrier to armored vehicles, the assault force breached them, using a combination of combat engineers and close air support that included dropping 2,000-pound guided bombs, after which the lead elements entered the outskirts of the city early on the morning of November 9th. Coalition analysts had estimated in October that 4,500 hardcore fighters were waiting in the city, against which MNFI had gathered nearly 18,000 soldiers, marines, and special operators. As the coalition troops moved into the city, they faced a well-entrenched enemy that had emplaced hundreds of IEDs to disrupt the assault, 
forcing the attackers to move slowly from house to house and block to block in urban fighting reminiscent of the Battle of Hue during the Vietnam War. The toll on tactical leaders was high. The 2nd Battalion, 2nd Infantry lost its command sergeant major, while the company commander and executive officer for Company A were both killed, leaving its first sergeant in temporary command. In a show of special operations and conventional force collaboration, SEALs integrated their forces with Marine battalions to add momentum to the advance, a combination that proved highly successful with SEAL snipers achieving 66 confirmed kills during the battle. Against this onslaught, the insurgents mounted a fluid defense, organized in small groups of three to six men equipped with small arms and rocket-propelled grenades. The insurgents originally planned to reposition their forces elsewhere in Anbar and North Babil before the battle to be able to open a second front as the coalition began its assault. However, the numerous coalition troops dedicated to the cordon around Fallujah trapped the insurgents inside the city. The strength of the cordon and the speed at which it appeared surprised the insurgent leaders, who had expected a weak perimeter around the city similar to the one the coalition had in place during the April battle. Yet, while the cordon prevented the opening of a second front, it was not airtight, and Zarqawi, Janabi, and several other Mujahideen Shura Council leaders escaped on November 8th. As the main effort of the coalition assault, RCT-1 and 2nd Battalion 7th Cavalry attacked the western portion of the city, which included the densely packed Jolan district, while RCT-7 and 2nd Battalion 2nd Infantry mounted a supporting strike in the eastern portion. With their M1 tanks and M2 Bradley fighting vehicles, the Army battalions proved to be much quicker at clearing terrain than the Marine commanders had expected, arriving at Highway 10, the city's main east-west road which coalition planners had named Phase Line Fran, by 2200 on November 9th. The rapid advance led MNFW to scrap its initial plan for RCT-7 to pivot west to clear the area south of Highway 10 alone, while RCT-1 consolidated north of the highway. Instead, on November 11th, RCT-1 continued clearing south, shoulder to shoulder with RCT-7. As the insurgents' operating space contracted, their fighting cells grew in size, sometimes reaching 50 fighters, many of whom chose to fight to the death rather than flee. Meanwhile, though MNFW had hoped that the rebuilt Iraqi army units would independently mop up insurgents that had remained behind in the northern part of the city, the Iraqi units proved unequal to that task, forcing each RCT to leave a full Marine battalion north of the highway to do the job. By November 13th, MNFW had crushed virtually all organized resistance, but fighting would continue for weeks as small cells of insurgents who had remained behind were gradually rooted out in sustained search and attack missions. End of Chapter 14, Part 1 Fighting to the Elections August to December 2004 Read by Adam Cable, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 2021Chapter 14, Part 2, Fighting to the Elections, August to December 2004, of The U.S. Army in the Iraq War, Volume 1, by U.S. Army Operation Iraqi Freedom Study Group. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adam Cable. Chapter 14, Part 2, Fighting to the Elections, August to December 2004. The Fall of Mosul As the assault on Fallujah proceeded, the coalition was unexpectedly spared the worldwide attention that had undermined the April 2004 operation. The sudden death of Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat on November 11th dominated the Arabic-language airwaves and distracted the Arab world and much of the international media from the events in Fallujah. Perceiving that the coalition had been given a window of opportunity in information operations, Casey pressed Sattler to take advantage by accelerating the operation, telling the MNFW commander, quote, We've got to get this over before they put Yasser in the ground. End quote. Despite the relative dearth of international attention, however, the battle in Fallujah was sending shockwaves through Iraq and, as it had done in April, spilling over into fighting elsewhere. 
In Haditha, soon after RCT-7 had left its area of operations, insurgents seized control and executed the town's police force on a local soccer field, sending a warning to tribes in Anbar that cooperating with U.S. troops was cause for severe punishment. The most significant spillover was hundreds of kilometers away in Ninoa province. On November 10th, fewer than 48 hours after U.S. troops began their assault on Fallujah, Fighters from Abu Musab al-Zarqawi's organization and other Sunni insurgent groups mounted a coordinated attack on Mosul, taking advantage of the coalition's economy of force posture there. The attack led to the shocking collapse of Mosul's government security forces within 24 hours. Though the fall of Mosul happened quickly, it had been months in the making. In the time since Brigadier General Carter F. Ham's Task Force Olympia had replaced then-Major General David H. Petraeus's much larger 101st Airborne Division in early 2004, Sunni insurgents had realized that Ninawa province was an economy of force area for the coalition and had begun to flow on the path of least resistance toward Mosul. Facing insurgent threats, Ninawa's police forces became reluctant to investigate the insurgent activity. Mosul University, to which the United States had contributed $3 million, fell under the control of fundamentalist Sunnis who imposed gender segregation and banned coalition force visits. Intimidation hollowed out Iraqi army units, with one Iraqi National Guard battalion experiencing 100% turnover in two months due to soldiers being absent without leave, and another battalion losing its commander when he resigned under threat. By midsummer 2004, Zarqawi's fighters, Ansar al-Islam, and other insurgent groups had taken control of the strategic city of Tel Afar, about 80 kilometers west of Mosul astride the main highway to Syria. As Tel Afar became a staging base for foreign fighters entering from Syria, Task Force Olympia had mounted an operation to retake the city of 200,000 people. In September 2004's Operation Black Typhoon, the 3rd Brigade 2nd Infantry Division, Stryker, cleared Tel Afar in a difficult battle resembling the April 2004 operation in Fallujah. The intense fighting resulted in 102 insurgent deaths, the destruction of a portion of the city, and the exodus of almost half of the population. The level of destruction stoked international and local discontent, with the Turkish government accusing U.S. forces of killing 58 Turkoman civilians during the operation. Despite the operation's costs, once it had ended, the thinly stretched U.S. brigade had withdrawn from the city to a base 10 kilometers away, allowing Zarqawi's jihadists and other insurgents to re-establish themselves. By mid-October, Ham recognized that his command was in grave danger. On October 18th, he sent an urgent warning to Metz, the MNCI commander, that Mosul could fall to insurgents at any moment if the coalition did not take immediate action. However, with all available forces committed to Fallujah, including CENTCOM's theater reserve, Metz had no troops to provide. On October 29th, Ham again signaled his concerns, this time briefing Casey that, quote, The point of collapse is very near. Mosul, the leading city in the north, is in jeopardy of being lost to anti-Iraqi forces' control due to neglect by the Iraqi interim government. End quote. Thus, the Sunni insurgents' assault on Mosul on November 10th had been neither a hasty target of opportunity nor entirely unexpected. As al fajr's lengthy shaping operations unfolded and coalition troops massed around Fallujah, Zarqawi and other insurgent commanders had exploited the light coalition footprint in Mosul to deliver a counterpunch and relieve pressure from their fellow insurgents in Fallujah. Interrogations later revealed that the insurgents had decided to focus on Mosul out of a belief that, quote, they couldn't stop things in Baghdad or disrupt the election significantly because there were seven or eight brigades in Baghdad, but there was only one brigade up north. End quote. On November 10th, the Sunni insurgents quickly overran much of Mosul and recaptured Tel Afar, ransacking and burning government buildings and seizing five of Mosul's Tigris River bridges. Mosul's security forces, which the coalition had been training for nearly a year, disintegrated as insurgents moved from one police station to the next, demanding the surrender of the police at each station and seizing their weapons and equipment. After only two days of fighting, an active insurgent force of 400 to 500 with a support base of 2,000 to 2,500 had driven 80% of the city's 4,000 police officers from their posts, leaving about 35 stations unmanned or destroyed. 
Following reports that some of the police officers had supported the insurgents' assault, the Iraqi government fired Mosul's police chief, Brigadier General Mohammed Barhawi. Ham later recalled, quote, We did, in fact, lose control. End quote. The fall of Mosul forced MNCI to scramble to turn back the insurgent counterattack. Responding with operational-level maneuver again to reposition his scarce resources, Metz directed his corps reserve, the 1st Battalion 5th Infantry Regiment, Stryker, to leave the cordon around Fallujah and return to Mosul, from which it had come just days before, within 72 hours. After this move, however, MNCI did not reconstitute its corps reserve because there was not an uncommitted maneuver unit in the entire theater. With no other coalition units immediately available, commanders instead committed two of the Iraqi Interior Ministry's Special Police Commando Battalions, paramilitary units with a mission similar to that of the Italian Carabinieri. The battle to retake Mosul would last nearly a week. Given the initial confusion, the two U.S. battalions in Mosul, 1st Battalion 24th Infantry Regiment and 3rd Battalion 21st Infantry Regiment, first had to determine which police stations had fallen and which were still held by the Iraqi security forces. By November 13th, the two units had gained a better understanding of the insurgent situation and began conducting battalion-level clearing operations, with 1st Battalion in West Mosul and 3rd Battalion in East Mosul, as the commandos helped recapture police stations throughout the city. Equipped as light infantry, the Iraqi police commandos rode into battle in unarmored pickup trucks provided by MNSTCI and quickly ran into trouble in West Mosul. On their way to rescue Iraqi police trapped in the 4 West Police Station on November 14th, a quick reaction force of Iraqi commandos and their U.S. advisor, Colonel James H. Kaufman, were encircled and almost overrun. Nearly out of ammunition and surrounded by 60 wounded and dead Iraqi commandos, Kaufman rallied the Iraqis to beat back several attacks until U.S. strikers arrived, actions for which Kaufman would receive the Distinguished Service Cross. Four Americans died during the battles to clear the city, compared to 71 insurgents confirmed killed. While insurgents no longer controlled the terrain outright, intermittent fighting would continue in Mosul through the end of December 2004. The Mara's Dining Facility Bombing and the Combat Outpost Tampa Attack To restore sufficient order in Mosul to allow the January 2005 elections to proceed there, MNCI committed three additional infantry battalions to MNBNW, one each from the 82nd Airborne Division, the 25th Infantry Division, and the Oregon National Guard. After the elections, the units would return to their parent brigade combat teams and render Nineveh province an economy of force once again. Recognizing that this force would not be a long-term solution to the challenges of Mosul, Casey requested additional special operations forces for Nineveh province. To meet Casey's request, the special operations task force in Iraq grew in size, with the new elements going directly to Mosul. There, they established a collaborative relationship with the conventional force leaders in MNBNW, as had been done in MNFW. However, the clearing of the city and the arrival of the reinforcing troops did not render the Sunni insurgents of Mosul impotent. On December 21st, an Ansar al-Sunnah suicide bomber wearing an Iraqi military uniform blew himself up in the dining facility at forward operating base Marez, the largest coalition base in Mosul. The bombing killed 21, including 14 American soldiers, and wounded 75, making it the most deadly single attack on U.S. troops since the invasion. The following week brought another large insurgent attack. In the wake of the Iraqi security forces' collapse in Mosul, 1st Battalion 24th Infantry Commander Lt. Col. Eric Carrilla decided to reverse course on MNFI's directives to consolidate forces and instead established platoon-sized combat outposts throughout West Mosul. Regaining footholds in the insurgent-dominated territory was not easy. The battalion fought multiple battles during December, culminating in a December 29th assault on combat outpost Tampa, in which a suicide bomber rammed a dump truck filled with artillery shells into the base entry point, followed by an assault force of at least 50 insurgents. The outpost's relief force was ambushed, but after the arrival of close air support and additional forces, the American troops beat back the attack. During the fighting, the battalion suffered one soldier killed and 20 wounded. 
Carilla's men would be awarded three silver stars and eleven bronze stars for valor. After the December 2004 fighting, insurgent strength in Mosul waned considerably, leaving the insurgency incapable of complex attacks within the city limits for most of the following year. Nevertheless, the Marez bombing in particular had lasting consequences. That the Marez attacker penetrated U.S. facilities in the guise of an Iraqi soldier had the undoubtedly intended effect of driving a wedge between American troops and their Iraqi security forces counterparts in Mosul. As one officer in the 1st Brigade 25th Infantry Division, Stryker, described it, the attack, quote, caused many U.S. soldiers to distrust the ISF and by default become less interested in training them, escorting them around the battlefield, and integrating them into their mission planning, end quote. This newfound mistrust led to less interaction between the Iraqi security forces and coalition units, which in turn began a downward spiral for some of Mosul's Iraqi units. Quote, On the flip side, the same officer continued, the 11th IRA, or Iraqi Regular Army Battalion, soldiers felt this distrust from their U.S. counterparts, felt the reality of fanatical violence hit extremely close to home, and they began to debate whether or not they were truly dedicated to the cause for which they were fighting and dying. Many IRA soldiers departed on leave and never returned. Many simply deserted under the cover of darkness. By the second week of January 2005, the 11th IRA had only two officers and 21 soldiers remaining. End quote. The aftereffects of the highly publicized Marez bombing were felt throughout the country. The attack led local coalition commanders in many places to restrict Iraqis' access to coalition facilities, including some that had previously been shared. As a result, Iraqi security forces members on many shared bases were no longer allowed to eat in the same dining facilities as their coalition counterparts, and units in many areas found themselves unable to adhere to the old adage that good military advisors must be willing to eat, sleep, and fight alongside the soldiers they are advising. Sunset of Al-Fajr Back in Fallujah, the elimination of Iraq's worst insurgent safe haven had come at a relatively high cost for U.S. troops, with 57 Marines and six soldiers killed and more than 600 American troops wounded. The original estimate of insurgent strength had been relatively accurate, as MNFI detained 2,052 insurgents during the battle and killed an estimated 2,175. As a testament to the intensity of the fighting, the November Battle of Fallujah by itself accounted for a quarter of all insurgents killed by coalition forces in 2004. Information gleaned from captured insurgents yielded surprising insights into the insurgency in Anbar. Contrary to coalition officials' expectations, nearly 60% of the detainees were married, and a similar percentage had former military experience. Most were young, with 62% under the age of 30. Also, surprisingly, only 7% claimed to be unemployed, meaning that economic dislocation was not a prime motivator. One-third of those captured were from Ramadi, one-quarter from Fallujah itself, and only 6% from Baghdad. These characteristics painted a picture of disaffected Sunnis who supported the insurgency part-time, principally for political, ideological, or religious reasons, and only secondarily as a way to supplement their incomes and support their families. In essence, the data reconfirmed MNFI's firmly held belief that they had a, quote, Sunni problem, end quote. At Al-Fajr's end, the coalition found itself in possession of a city full of rubble. The level of insurgent resistance throughout the operation meant there was significantly more collateral damage in Fallujah than had been the case in Najaf or Samarra. The assaulting coalition troops had used 386 close air support strikes and more than 14,000 indirect fire rounds against targets around the city. More than 60 of the town's 200 mosques and 20% of its residences were destroyed, with many more homes damaged. Four months after the operation, only 30% of the city's population had returned. As coalition and Iraqi troops searched buildings and neighborhoods in the battle's aftermath, the stunning degree to which Fallujah had become an insurgent sanctuary became clear. 
In addition to insurgent fighting positions and bunkers, U.S. troops found 568 large weapons caches, 24 bomb factories, and 13 command and control nodes spread throughout the city. They also discovered torture chambers and sophisticated audiovisual production facilities used to create insurgent propaganda. Insurgents had used 47 mosques as fighting positions, and, though this action invalidated the mosque's protected status under the laws of warfare, jihadist propaganda had highlighted mosque damage in inflammatory media releases picked up by some regional media outlets. The Battle of Fallujah had a significant impact on the insurgency's leadership. During the fighting, coalition troops killed Omar Hadid, Zarqawi's operations chief and rival, who had remained behind in Fallujah to lead the fight. Hadid's death eliminated Zarqawi's only native Iraqi competitor for the leadership of Toweed Wal Jihad, and Zarqawi chose to assume Hadid's duties personally to cement his control over the organization. With many other Sunni insurgent groups weakened decisively by their losses in Fallujah, Zarqawi and Tawid Wal Jihad moved to the forefront of the Sunni resistance, a position they would not cede for the remainder of the war. Those insurgents who survived the battle and managed to slip through the cordon around the city resettled in areas where they perceived the coalition was weak, including Ramadi, the Triangle of Death in northern Babil, Haditha, and Al Qaim, and other border areas. With the influx of fighters from Fallujah, Haditha deteriorated so quickly that by early 2005, insurgents had set up a camp to recruit and train replacements for fighters killed in al Fajr. Despite Fallujah's year-long history as key insurgent terrain, coalition leaders did not leave a large footprint of U.S. forces in the city to take part in holding and reconstructing it. Almost as quickly as additional combat power had surged in for al Fajr, it surged back out. All of 2nd Brigade 1st Cavalry Division departed Fallujah less than one month after the operation concluded, while RCT-7, which had left vast tracts of Western Anbar uncovered for the battle, returned to its original battle space. The quick reduction of U.S. combat power led some of the remaining tactical leaders in Fallujah to fear that the coalition's gains in the city might be short-lived. Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey R. Chassani, RCT-1's operations officer, encapsulated this concern when he wrote to his commander, Colonel Michael Shupp, that it was premature to think the insurgency in Fallujah had been destroyed. Quote, Why would higher headquarters want to create a vacuum like this after successfully crushing an insurgency that has been a thorn for more than a year? I understand there are other fish to fry in Iraq, that we are not the only show. What I do not understand is why higher headquarters would not want to ensure there was some semblance of stability in Fallujah before they walked away from Fallujah. They are going to walk away thinking they did their part, and the smoldering heap of rubble that is Fallujah is going to start sparking again, because higher headquarters failed to follow through with the resources we needed to smother the embers. Then, they are going to ask us why we let the embers become a fire again. End quote. The drawdown of combat power in the city, Chassani concluded, amounted to, quote, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, end quote. However, with just 18 U.S. combat brigades in the country and plans to downgrade the number to 13 by March 2005, MNCI had few good options. Massing two additional brigades worth of combat power in Fallujah had already incurred significant operational risk by exposing other areas to insurgent counterattack, as the fall of Mosul had illustrated. Chassani was right, and the situation in eastern Anbar would see another deterioration in 2005 to 2006 that would eventually require additional clearing operations. But being right mattered little in the absence of sufficient troops. Lessons from the Insurgent Sanctuary Cities for coalition commanders, the planned operations in Najaf, Samara, and Fallujah, and the unexpected one in Mosul, yielded a number of lessons, both good and bad. After an initial year of tension between special operators and conventional units over uncoordinated special operations raids and territorial responsibility, Operation al Fajr brought a significant advance in collaboration between the two. Special Operations Commanders attached liaison officers to conventional units and began weekly synchronization meetings with conventional commanders. 
Discarding past practices, Special Operations Commanders decided that maintaining the trust of conventional battle space owners was more important than the results of any single Special Operations Force or SOF mission, and for the first time, SOF commanders began to forego missions based on battle space owner preference. The relationship between SOF and conventional forces was far from perfect, but it had begun moving toward the highly efficient working relationships that would prevail later in the war and in Afghanistan. In tactical terms, Fallujah had also shown the value of armor and mechanized forces in urban combat. The Marine infantry units assaulting Fallujah had benefited from the support of the tanks and Bradley fighting vehicles in the accompanying Army mechanized battalions, especially during the initial entry into the city and in breaching obstacles thereafter. The initial MNFW plan had called for the mechanized battalions simply to cordon the city, but as their value became apparent, the army units played a key role in clearing the city. The importance of heavy forces in urban environments was an unexpected lesson that was validated repeatedly throughout the war. In other areas, the coalition's approaches had not worked as well. While Iraqi troops fared better in November than they had in the First Battle of Fallujah, when many had refused even to deploy to the city, their combat contributions in Operation Al-Fajr were once again not as significant as coalition leaders had hoped. With the exception of the 36th Commando Battalion that cleared insurgent strongpoints in mosques and assaulted high-value targets, the remainder of the Iraqi units were used in supporting activities, such as following behind the American units to conduct searches and process detainees. Though MNFI hailed the Iraqi troops' contribution, Natansky judged after the battle that the Iraqi units were far from standing on their own. Quote, They had no means to communicate from a battalion to a brigade or from a battalion down to a company in any distance. Their vehicles, although the units that came down to Fallujah had trucks with some armoring on it, are ill-equipped. Ultimately, to be successful, as an independent unit, they need to have command and control and be able to exercise as a staff, but they also need combat service support. The Iraqi security forces are dependent on us for food and water, ammunition and supplies, and even health care. End quote. Finally, when put to the test, the practice of using a, quote, working operational reserve, end quote, had simply amounted to creating a risky gap in one area of operations to fill a hole in another. MNCI's after-action review of the Najaf battle noted that, quote, the concept of a working reserve does not provide for rapid deployment. The operational reserve can deploy faster than 96 hours if it is not committed to missions, but this adds risk to the stability of Baghdad, end quote. This was a lesson that was repeatedly relearned over the next two years as working operational reserves were called on to support emergencies, leaving the terrain that they normally covered at risk. The fall 2004 operations in Najaf, Samara, and Fallujah cleared Shia and Sunni militants from the major insurgent sanctuaries that had threatened to derail the critical January 2005 elections. By December 2004, coalition leaders were generally confident that the impending voting could take place, an issue that had been in serious doubt when Casey took command the previous summer. Coalition troops had shown that even the best entrenched insurgent groups could not hold terrain in the face of a concerted coalition offensive, and that the coalition commanders had greatly improved the integration of the most effective Iraqi security forces units into coalition operations. MNFI had shown it could blunt insurgent propaganda and had managed to build a partnership with Iraqi political leaders in vital security decision-making. Together, these factors exorcised some of the demons of April 2004. Even so, the battles against the insurgent cities had been incomplete and, quote, the fight to the elections, end quote, had highlighted some of the coalition's military limits. Muqtada Sadr and his forces had lived to fight another day, while the Sunni insurgency, sensing the coming blow on Fallujah, had been able to shift its forces operationally and overrun Mosul, arguably Iraq's most important Sunni city. The battle in Fallujah had revealed that the coalition's combat power was spread thin, with no buffer and no real operational reserve. It would now be in the hands of Iraqi voters and political parties to determine whether the fall's costly fighting could be parlayed into lasting stability. End of Chapter 14, Part 2
Fighting to the Elections, August to December 2004. Read by Adam Cable, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 2021. Chapter 15, Part 1. Transformation in a Time of War, January to April 2005. Of The U.S. Army in the Iraq War, Volume 1 by U.S. Army Operation Iraqi Freedom Study Group. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adam Cable. Chapter 15. Transformation in a Time of War, January to April 2005. Page 365. By the end of December 2004, Multinational Force Iraq, or MNFI, had successfully cleared what its leaders saw as the largest hurdle to the holding of elections on the United Nations, or UN, timeline. Despite the setback in Mosul, the coalition had neutralized the insurgent safe havens, allowing the voting to take place on time with few disruptions. The aftermath of the elections was steeped with change. The interim government of Ayat Alawi would transition into a lame-duck caretaker as the major political factions entered into an intense competition over the premiership. At the same time, another near-complete rotation of MNFI's forces would bring new frictions inside the coalition. The army's continuation of its planned transformation resulted in the deployment to Iraq of National Guard and Reserve forces to an unprecedented degree far beyond the limited operational reserve role for which they had been prepared. The coalition also developed a new campaign plan that transformed the mission in Iraq, changing its focus from defeating the insurgency to the setting of conditions for transitioning responsibility to the Iraqi Security Forces, or ISF, and Iraqi government. In the process, MNFI refocused many coalition units on an advisory mission, a role the U.S. military had largely not performed since the Vietnam War. As coalition forces were transforming, so too was the insurgency. Shia resistance groups, bloodied by nearly a year of costly failed uprisings, were dramatically changing their organization and operating modes. The Sunni insurgency, reeling from losses during the November battles in Fallujah and elsewhere, was also evolving into a new threat, as Islamist extremist organizations eclipsed militant groups associated with the former regime. All three of these principal groups, coalition, Shia insurgency, and Sunni insurgency, were responding to the same rapidly changing operating environment as well as to the tempestuous waxing and waning of Iraqi public opinion, with each group attempting to adapt to the changing conditions faster than its foes. The January 2005 Transitional National Assembly Elections Page 365 Securing the Elections As the elections approached, General George W. Casey Jr. judged that more combat forces would be required to overcome what he expected would be an intense insurgent effort to thwart the voting and deal the coalition a decisive political defeat. The potential threats were great enough that some coalition leaders were concerned the elections might not actually occur. MNCI Commander Lt. Gen. Thomas F. Metz, for example, believed that, quote, If there was ever really a time, like the Tet of 1968, the enemy would expend all tactical resources for a strategic win, it would be to crash the election, end quote. Casey believed that coalition forces were, quote, operating in a window of vulnerability, end quote, because of the feebleness of the ISF, Iraq's economy, and its weak governmental capacity, and that terrorists and insurgents would seek to take advantage of that window. As a result, in late October 2004, Casey requested extensions to the year-long deployment of nearly 6,500 soldiers a two-month extension for the entire 2nd Brigade 1st Cavalry Division in Multinational Division Baghdad, or MNDB, and a two-week extension for elements of the 1st Infantry Division in Multinational Division North Central, or MNDNC. In early December, the 2nd Brigade 25th Infantry Division in MNDNC and Multinational Force West's, or MNFW's, 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit, or MEU, in Najaf, also received two-month extensions, increasing the number of extended troops to over 15,000. Along with the extended units, 
two parachute infantry battalions from the Division-Ready Brigade of the 82nd Airborne Division deployed to Iraq in early December for a four-month period spanning the elections. The decision to expand the footprint of American soldiers, which ran counter to the core concepts of the campaign plan, was a difficult one for Casey, who worried that the additional deployments might cause the Iraqis to question the legitimacy of the Iraqi interim government. Given the threat to the political process, however, he ultimately decided it was a risk worth taking. These decisions brought the number of U.S. forces in Iraq to over 150,000, the highest level since the invasion. The election itself was a complex logistical problem, with more than 6,000 polling stations and 14 million eligible voters to protect. On top of the challenge of such large, raw numbers, all deliveries of ballots and voting equipment had to be coordinated with multiple election monitoring organizations to ensure the transparency and legitimacy of the vote. The delivery of ballots and equipment left no room for error because a shortage or compromise of ballots on election day could have strategic implications. Election support activities were sometimes costly. As part of these efforts to secure polling sites, ballots, and the overall electoral process, a Marine CH-53 Super Stallion crashed in a sandstorm on January 25th, killing 31 in what became the coalition's single largest casualty-producing event of the war. The loss of six other Americans in separate incidents on the same day also made it the deadliest day for U.S. troops since the start of the war. In advance of the elections, both the coalition and the Iraqi authorities took extra measures for security. MNCI directed subordinate units to increase their operations in order to kill or capture insurgents who posed a threat to the voting. Information that coalition troops in normal times would not have acted on because of its quality now generated operations to take as many potential threats off the street as possible and throw the insurgency off balance. At the same time, Iraqi Interior Minister Fala Naqib put in place tough security measures that included a nighttime curfew, a ban on carrying weapons, and driving restrictions that made swaths of the country off-limits for vehicles. Iraq's borders were also closed on January 29th as an additional measure to prevent foreign fighters from infiltrating and disrupting the elections. General Babakir Zabari, the chief of staff of the Iraqi Joint Forces, suspended leave for all Iraqi forces from January 25th through the elections, a measure that significantly increased the number of Iraqi troops available for election security. Because Iraqi soldiers traditionally took one week of home leave each month, one quarter of the Iraqi forces would have been off duty on election day without Zabari's order. To ensure the physical security of elections and showcase the effectiveness of the ISF, two rings of security would surround voting sites. An outer ring of coalition forces would stop any larger scale attacks, while an inner ring within sight of the actual polling stations would be comprised exclusively of ISF, thereby putting an Iraqi face on the security band that Iraqis would see. These preparations were for good reasons. In the final weeks leading up to the election, Sunni insurgents made concerted efforts to intimidate voters into not participating and derail the overall process. On December 30th, Ansar al-Sunnah, the Islamic army in Iraq, and the Mujahideen army jointly warned Iraqis they faced death as apostates if they participated in the elections, after which the entire 700-person electoral commission in embattled Mosul promptly resigned. The insurgents also continued their attacks on political leaders and infrastructure as a way to undermine the legitimacy of the new Iraqi government and derail the electoral process. On January 4th, insurgents assassinated the governor of Baghdad province, Ali al-Haidari, the most senior Iraqi official killed in over six months. On January 7th, insurgents caused a brief nationwide power blackout by attacking transmission lines in Tikrit and the Baiji power plant. On January 23rd, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi joined the insurgent chorus, calling candidates, quote, demi-idols, end quote, and declaring those who voted to be kufar, or apostates, who could be legally killed without penalty. Zarqawi also claimed that the elections were a coalition conspiracy to bring the Shia to power. On January 27th, the eve of the elections, insurgents blew up a school chosen to be a polling station in Baghdad and posted a video of the execution of a candidate on Prime Minister Ayad Alawi's electoral list. 
the decision not to delay the elections. The biggest threat to successful elections came not from the insurgency, but from the political process itself. As Election Day approached, various Sunni politicians and political factions, including Iraqi interim president Ghazi al-Yawar, approached MNFI requesting the election be postponed so they could mobilize additional Sunni participation. Fearing the possibility of a boycott, Sunni leaders had come to realize that the most significant pitfall of Iraq's election was the nationwide single-district, single-list system. If Sunni Arabs boycotted the vote, the single-district meant a national parliament would be formed anyway, and Sunnis would be effectively excluded from the process of constructing the new Iraqi constitution, a result with potentially permanent consequences. Quote, this election has a unique role of drafting a constitution, end quote, Yawar told reporters. Quote, How can you draft a constitution unless all ethnicities, sects, religions, and political ideologies are included? End quote. By late November, with fighting in Anbar and Nineveh still ongoing, 15 Iraqi political parties from across the Sunni Arab and Kurdish political groupings had formally requested an election delay. Those urging delay included interim Prime Minister Alawi, who worried that the devastation that had been wrought on Fallujah during Operation Al-Fajr a mere six weeks before the elections would deter Sunnis from participating. Despite Alawi's and the Sunnis' requests, U.S. leaders decided to move ahead with the elections as scheduled. In a joint letter to Alawi on November 29th, Casey and Ambassador John Negroponte stressed that, quote, a decision to delay the election will unavoidably be understood by everyone as military success for the insurgency and a counterbalance to the success of the battle for Fallujah. In other words, having announced that we were battling to provide room and space for the election, we will in essence be saying that that effort has failed, at least for the moment. End quote. Postponing the election would also have been difficult to sell to Grand Ayatollah Sistani and other Shia leaders who were clamoring for elections they expected would cement a Shia political majority. The letter also noted that asking for additional extensions for forces whose deployment had already been extended for the elections was extremely difficult. During one MNFI meeting, Casey had dryly opined that an extension should not be granted in hopes that political conditions would improve because, quote, Rarely does anything in this country get better with time. End quote. The Vote and the Boycott On January 30th, Election Day, many of the senior coalition leaders held their breath as polling sites opened, unsure that Iraqis would show up to vote. Ahead of the elections, several estimates from the intelligence community had predicted that the elections simply were not going to be able to happen. But despite 108 reported attacks on Election Day against polling stations, roughly 8.5 million Iraqis had voted, a 58% turnout. The decision to generate Iraqi troops rapidly to secure the voting paid off. Having been trained to the standard that had been decided upon in MNFI and MNSTCI's summer 2004 baseline review, the Iraqi army successfully functioned as platoons and held the inner cordon around polling sites. Deterred by the Iraqi forces and blunted by Casey's and Metz's plans, insurgent groups were simply unable to prevent the vote. For the American troops who witnessed the voting, the Iraqi population's bravery in the face of insurgent threats was astonishing, as was their determination. Because of the bans on driving, many Iraqis walked for miles for the opportunity to vote in their country's first democratically held election in decades. To a degree, MNFI's broader strategy of fighting to the elections had succeeded, and at the operational level, the Sunni insurgency was reeling from the loss of its Fallujah sanctuary and thousands of fighters. During December 2004, insurgent attacks in Anbar fell precipitously to 50% of what they had been before Operation Al-Fajr, and insurgents were unable to mount attacks that would effectively shut down the election. The bans on driving and the national curfew were especially effective, and the attacks the Ramadi Shura Council had planned to launch into Baghdad, as well as plans to use car bombs against voters in Fallujah, simply could not take place as a result. For American soldiers, the sight of millions of Iraqis voting in their first free elections in 54 years was a wonderful, feel-good moment akin to an earlier generation's liberation of Europe. 
One brigade commander in Baghdad later described the event as, quote, the single most professionally inspirational day of my life, end quote. The elections produced nearly unbridled optimism among many in the coalition that the campaign plan had been the correct path to follow, that the elections had, as coalition leaders described it, quote, locked in irreversible momentum, end quote, that gave the Iraqis, quote, an alternative to the insurgency, end quote. In terms of creating a new government, however, the January elections were inconclusive. Alawi's Iraqi National Accord had clearly lost, garnering only 40 seats representing 14% of the vote, but among the winners there was no consensus on who would replace him as prime minister. The United Iraqi Alliance, a Shia Islamist grouping that had secured the endorsement of Grand Ayatollah Sistani, had clearly won, with 140 seats and 58% of the popular vote, but the group was far from monolithic. It was an amalgam of various Shia Islamist factions, Sistani supporters, the Dawa Party, the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq, or SCIRI, a handful of smaller parties, and even Sadrists who had joined the political process despite Moqtada Sadr's calls for a boycott. Because seating a president and prime minister required a two-thirds majority of the seats in the National Assembly, the United Iraqi Alliance needed to caucus with the coalition of Kurdish parties, the Kurdistan Alliance, which had earned 75 seats and 26% of the vote. As a result of the fragile alliances within and among the various parties that had to be formed, a full four months would pass before the parties would agree on a new prime minister and cabinet. The long negotiation created a significant loss in political momentum for the Iraqi government and an extended lame duck period for Alawi, who, by the time his coalition lost the elections, had governed for just seven months. As Alawi, interim president Ghazi al-Yawar, and other Sunni leaders had expected, millions of Sunni Arabs boycotted the election. Casey's strategy of clearing seven key insurgent-dominated cities had allowed the elections to take place, but they had not created an environment that encouraged Sunnis to vote. In Nineveh, voter turnout was only 17%, most of whom were Kurdish voters. In all of Sunni-majority Anbar, only 16,682 Iraqis voted, about 2% of registered voters. Sunnis boycotted for a variety of reasons. Some, in a bizarre example of how conspiracy theories can trump reality in the Middle East, entered the election period convinced that Sunni Arabs were actually a demographic majority in Iraq, and that Saddam Hussein had perpetuated a myth of the Shia majority as a boogeyman to instill fear among Sunnis and create a rationale for his rule. Even if they did not vote, many Sunnis believed they would so outnumber the Shia that the elections would be discredited by their absence, and the Sunnis would then naturally win any ensuing sectarian conflict. Others were swayed by calls from insurgent leaders for a boycott, or were driven off by insurgent threats and intimidation. Still others, particularly tribal leaders in Anbar, supported the boycott because they feared elections would upend their traditional standing and influence. In the weeks after the election, the extent of the Sunnis' miscalculation became clear. Their boycott guaranteed the election spoils would go to Shia Islamist and Kurdish nationalist parties whose aims were antithetical to those of the Sunnis. Of 275 seats in the transitional National Assembly that would write their country's constitution and shepherd the country toward independence, Sunni Arabs earned only 16 seats, a dramatic underrepresentation. Estimated by the UN and the coalition to be roughly 20% of Iraq's population, Sunni Arabs would hold just 5% of the seats in the assembly. By comparison, Turkomans earned 13 seats and Christians earned 3 seats, even though both groups combined made up about 5% of Iraq's population. When combined with the abuse of mainly Sunni Arab detainees in Abu Ghraib prison, the perceived destruction of Sunni Arab Fallujah just two months earlier, and intense operations by coalition special operations forces, Sunnis viewed the election outcome as evidence that the coalition had embarked on an anti-Sunni project. Thus, for many Sunnis, instead of a unifying moment for the Iraqi nation, the election was a justification to continue fighting. As a result, 
the election outcome had helped sow the seeds for future sectarian conflict and a core element of MNFI's end state for the coalition campaign, that the Iraqi government should be representative of its population, had been thwarted. On February 3rd, just four days after the elections, Negroponte sent Casey a September 1967 clipping from the New York Times. In the celebratory post-election atmosphere, the article was a caution. Quote, U.S. encouraged by Vietnam vote, end quote, the Times headline read. Quote, officials cite 83% turnout despite Viet Cong terror. United States officials were surprised and heartened today at the size of turnout in South Vietnam's presidential election, despite a Viet Cong terrorist campaign to disrupt the voting. End quote. Negroponte's warning was simple and prophetic. There was much work still to be done, because successful elections alone were no guarantee of democracy and stability. The Operational Consequences of Force Transformation With the stress of the election concluded, U.S. commanders deemed it safe for unit redeployments to resume, and U.S. forces began another massive unit rotation. While the yearly rotations generally created friction and a loss in momentum, the rotations of 2005 created particular turbulence because they were the first that involved transformed, or modular, units. Because of the late 2003 decision by Chief of Staff of the Army General Peter J. Schoomaker to follow through with Army transformation during wartime, the Institutional Army underwent sweeping change, as did the units it provided for Iraq and other operating theaters. Originally begun in the late 1990s, transformation had aimed to make the Army leaner, more rapidly deployable, and equipped with the most modern technology. However, it was an operationally disruptive process. Even in 1999, a much quieter operational period than 2004, Secretary of the Army Louis Caldera had described transformation as, quote, changing the wheels while driving at 70 miles an hour, end quote. At the center of the transformation was the creation of modular brigade combat teams with six battalions of different types instead of three maneuver battalions of the same branch that existed in untransformed or legacy brigades. Modularization would streamline differences among brigades, and the army would move from an inventory of 17 different types of brigades to only three. This change was meant to create flexible units that could deploy more rapidly, with all necessary supporting elements already contained within the organization. The increased deployability was intended to enable the army to respond more quickly to conventional threats, such as North Korea, or to react to contingency operations, such as in the Balkans, Panama, and Somalia. A product of the revolution in military affairs, the modular units would theoretically enhance their combat power through new weapon systems, better connectivity, and improved situational awareness, all of which would supposedly allow for a reduction in each brigade's manpower. The transformed brigade combat teams retained only two maneuver battalions, but added a smaller Reconnaissance, Surveillance, and Target Acquisition, or RSTA, squadron to replace the third maneuver battalion that Legacy Brigades had. The RSTA squadron had only about half the personnel of a maneuver battalion. It was lightly armed, based on the assumption that the unit would not have to fight to gain information or use scouts to make contact with the enemy, but would instead detect the enemy through sensors deployed by higher-level units. This assumption was severely tested in Iraq, and the reduction in personnel would prove to be a significant limitation in manpower-intensive counterinsurgency operations. The transformed brigades would also have their own field artillery battalion, a support battalion, and a special troops battalion that contained military intelligence, engineer, and signal personnel. Division headquarters were transformed as well, stripped of many assets that were pushed down to the brigade combat teams. The traditional divisional artillery headquarters, military intelligence battalion, and divisional engineer battalion were dissolved. Having suffered more casualties from friendly than enemy air power since the end of the Korean War, the Army liquidated most air defense units at the division level. While pushing intelligence assets down to brigades was helpful in the counterinsurgency fight, it would also create challenges. The division headquarters responsible for tracking events and synthesizing the enemy picture across multiple brigades in their battle space would no longer have some of the assets they had once used for this purpose. 
With the notional personnel excess trimmed from brigade combat teams and divisions, the Army intended to use the personnel, quote, savings, end quote, to grow additional brigades, adding one brigade combat team per division. In a sense, the transformational changes were a shell game in that the Army's configuration would change, but its overall strength would not. Transformation was also a race against time to meet the demands of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, measured in brigade combat teams. As the Army transformed more divisions, the number of brigade combat teams in the Army inventory would increase. By 2004, Transformation added three brigades to the Army's roster for potential employment. By the end of 2005, three more were added, and in 2006, another four, for a total of ten new deployable brigade combat teams in three years. Stresses on the Force in 2004, as military planners selected the replacement units for the 2005-2006 mass rotation of forces as well as the emergency deployment of forces prompted by the April uprisings, the Army only had 34 combat arms brigades in its active component and 39 in the reserve component. Nearly every active unit in the Army had already deployed once, and Secretary of Defense, or SECDEF, Donald H. Rumsfeld, was extremely reluctant to approve unit extensions beyond the year-long standard. The Iraq theater requirement was 15 brigades. The Operation Enduring Freedom, or OEF, requirement was two brigades. The combined missions in Kosovo and Bosnia took another brigade combat team, and for the standing mission to deter North Korea, the Army preferred to maintain two brigade combat teams on the peninsula. The requirements were heavy enough that in January 2004, Rumsfeld, who was loath to increase the size of the Army, had agreed to use emergency authorities granted by Congress to temporarily exceed the Army end strength by 30,000. In this context, the Army faced a quandary. Army leaders wanted to continue to transform, but the transformation process would require taking brigades offline from deployments in order to reorganize them, equip them with new weapons and sensors, and train them. Because the Army had run low on available active duty brigades for the 2005 rotation, it had to either postpone transformation or reach deep into the Army inventory to deploy active duty and National Guard brigades that it did not usually deploy. The Army selected the second option, choosing to continue transformation with the hope that its perceived long-term advantages would outweigh short-term risks of deploying less experienced guard and active duty brigades. Among active brigades, the Army decided to deploy a brigade from the 2nd Infantry Division in South Korea that had not deployed outside the peninsula since the end of the Korean War and had served as a strategic deterrent to North Korea for more than a half century. The 2nd Brigade, 2nd Infantry Division was typically manned by soldiers on a one-year tour without their families. Signifying the level of turbulence and change the Army was experiencing, during 2004, all Army personnel in Korea were given the option to extend for an additional year in exchange for a bonus payment. Nearly 8,000 personnel had taken the bonus, including many in the 2nd Brigade. Thus, when the Brigade was notified that it would deploy to Iraq for an additional year, it meant that some soldiers would live apart from their families for nearly three years. Another unusual brigade size unit that would deploy to Iraq in 2005 was the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, or ACR, which served as the opposing force, or op for, at the Army's National Training Center in California. When the regiment received its deployment order, it had significant equipment shortages because its principal mission was to operate replicas of Soviet-style weapons in war games against U.S. units, a fact that regimental leaders had trouble making staffers at higher echelons understand. Quote, I had more Op-4 surrogate vehicles than I had M1 tanks, Bradleys, M4 rifles, you name it. And as we began the process of getting ready to deploy the regiment, I had staffers at Headquarters DA, or Department of the Army, and Forcecom, the U.S. Army Forces Command, when we would send requests for equipment say, Why are you guys calling us? You guys already have all this stuff. End quote. While both the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment and the 2nd Brigade 2nd Infantry Division were technically capable of deploying in the event of contingencies, Few had expected such a situation would ever arise. By 2005, the Army's rotation policies were having other important effects on the active force as well. 
In 2005, the Army continued to use brigade combat teams as its primary means of measuring dwell time between deployments to ensure that repeated rotations did not exhaust units and personnel, but this method did not accurately capture the strain on individual soldiers. Since Army policy required that deploying brigade combat teams should have a full complement of personnel, all too often, soldiers returning from one deployment were transferred to an organization that was about to begin another, and would thus find themselves back in Iraq mere months after they had left. This challenge was especially true in low-density specialties such as interrogators, Arabic linguists, unmanned aerial vehicle personnel, and military police, among others. Army leaders did not make these decisions capriciously, but because they were the least bad of the available options given the capped end strength of the army. Units had to deploy with sufficient combat power to ensure they could accomplish their mission, and sacrifices had to be made. For this reason, on June 3, 2004, the Army issued a stop-loss order preventing soldiers in units deploying within 90 days from retiring or leaving the service. The same month, the Army announced that it would involuntarily recall to active service up to 5,600 members of the Individual Ready Reserve to help fill critical specialties and requirements. Committing the National Guard Recognizing the Army's dilemma in managing transformation and combat deployments simultaneously, the very kind of issue for which Casey had once been responsible as the Army's Vice Chief of Staff, Casey accepted the Army's plan to deploy eight National Guard brigades for the 2005-2006 MNFI rotations. Quote, we had to use the National Guard brigades in 2005 so that the next iteration of brigades that came in would be fully modularly converted, end quote, Casey later recalled. Quote, it gave the regular army the breathing space to convert the modular brigades so that when they came over, they were more capable than the ones that had been there, end quote. The concept of using National Guard brigades as part of a limited operational reserve had been part of a national military strategy for decades. After the Vietnam War, then Chief of Staff of the Army General Crichton Abrams established a total force concept that moved large numbers of the Army's combat service support units into the Army Reserve and National Guard, thereby ensuring that any large-scale military commitment would require a national mobilization of the reserve component. Likewise, the National Guard would also contribute combat units to the total force in the form of round-out brigades that were assigned to mobilize and deploy with active duty divisions, thereby bringing those divisions up to full strength. However, when the concept of round-out brigades was tested during the mobilization of Army forces for Operation Desert Storm, it failed, with none of the three activated round-out brigades receiving a certification that they were ready for combat. With the end of the Cold War bringing a reduction in the Army's active component from 18 divisions to 10, correcting the flaws of the roundout system became crucial. In its place, the Army established a new program that created 15 Enhanced Separate Brigades, or ESB, in the National Guard. These brigades were the Guard's highest priority combat units, receiving additional resources, training, and personnel to make them ready to deploy to a combat zone within 90 days of mobilization. Nearly all of the National Guard brigades that deployed to Iraq in 2005 and 2006 would come from this pool of enhanced separate brigades. Even though enhanced guard brigades were an important component of the U.S. national security strategy, conventional wisdom held that they would be used similarly to their roundout predecessors, with a brigade or two deploying at a time to fill operational requirements. There had been little expectation that they would be deployed en masse, eight brigades in one year. This decision to deploy nearly three divisions worth of National Guard brigades during the same rotation would have a substantial operational impact. By March 2005, there were 69,147 Guardsmen in Iraq, making up nearly half of MNFI's total strength. With transformation in progress among the Army's active division headquarters, the 42nd Infantry Division from the New York National Guard was activated to serve as an MND headquarters, becoming the first National Guard division to deploy into combat since the Korean War, and the first to command regular Army brigades. To help synchronize the division's efforts as it assumed battle space in Iraq, the Army assigned an active duty brigadier general as one of the assistant division commanders, and sprinkled active duty personnel throughout the division's staff. 
Casey left most of the complex political and tactical issues associated with where to assign the National Guard brigades to the MNCI commander, though he did monitor their locations. Quote, we put them in places that were not necessarily the highest risk places, end quote, he recalled later. Quote, good commanders put their good guys in the tough spots and the less good guys in the other spots. In my mind, I knew that I was not going to get quite the capability out of the National Guard units as I got out of some of the others, but I did not think it was going to be a lot different. End quote. Major General Peter Corelli, the MNDB commander who would see his 2nd Brigade replaced by the 256th Brigade from the Louisiana National Guard at the end of 2004, saw a similar gap. He assessed that the incoming Guard Brigade was, quote, less capable based on force structure and equipment, end quote, and was six months away from being as well trained as an active duty brigade. Metz, meanwhile, recalled that for his tenure as MNCI commander, quote, Major General John Batiste of the 1st Infantry Division put the 30th Separate Brigade, North Carolina National Guard, in a province that wasn't as tough of a province but nonetheless needed those troops to task. General Corelli of the 1st Cavalry Division didn't have the option in Baghdad. He had to give a part of the city to the 39th Brigade out of Arkansas, and they just had to step up to the plate. Were they as good as the Blackjack Brigade, 2nd BCT, 1st Cavalry Division, on day one? Probably not. Were they as good when they left? Probably so. End quote. Several of the National Guard brigades were not assigned their own area of operations, but instead had their subunits detached to augment other brigades or were assigned theater security missions. In only one case among the 2005 unit rotations did Casey become directly involved in emplacing a National Guard brigade. When MNCI assigned the 2nd Brigade, 28th Infantry Division, Pennsylvania National Guard, to the insurgent stronghold of Ramadi, a skeptical Casey advised MNCI to change the decision. Quote, I went back probably two or three times and said you really have to figure a different place for the 2nd BCT, 28th Infantry Division Brigade. Putting them in Ramadi is not setting them up for success, end quote, he recounted. Regimental Combat Team, or RCT-8, a Marine unit whose battle space was adjacent to the area of operations that 2nd Brigade 28th Infantry Division Pennsylvania National Guard would be assuming, shared Casey's concerns that Ramadi might be beyond the abilities of the National Guard unit. Quote, The 228th Infantry Pennsylvania ARNG, Army National Guard, is going to one of our worst areas, replacing 2-2 BCT, one of the Army's best units, end quote, RCT-8 leaders reported to MNFI counterparts, adding that the assignment was, quote, a recipe for disaster, end quote. One difference in capabilities between National Guard brigades and their regular Army counterparts was that, despite the ESB initiative, many National Guard units lacked the same modern equipment. While the Army had fielded the upgraded family of medium tactical vehicles in the 1990s, the workhorse vehicle of the National Guard wheeled fleet remained the antiquated deuce and a half, or two and a half ton truck, a vehicle so old that the last one had rolled off the production line in 1977. An even more significant disparity was the National Guard unit's shortage of armored vehicles, a problem that had bedeviled the coalition from the start of the war. By December 2004, the Army only had 69% of the armored or hardened vehicles that it needed in Iraq, and for National Guard units, the shortfall was even more acute. The issue of insufficient armor protection for many of the deploying National Guard units came to a head when Rumsfeld visited National Guard soldiers in Kuwait who were preparing to move into Iraq. During a December 8, 2004 meeting at which the SECDEF took questions from soldiers, Specialist Thomas Wilson of the Tennessee National Guard's 278th Regimental Combat Team complained that members of his unit had to, quote, scrounge through local landfills for pieces of rusty scrap metal and bulletproof glass, what they call hillbilly armor, to bolt onto their trucks for protection against roadside bombs in Iraq, end quote. The situation was so dire that Lt. Col. John Zimmerman, the 278th Regimental Combat Team's staff judge advocate, noted that 95% of the unit's trucks had insufficient armor and that the regiment had been provided 70 tons of steel plates to bolt or weld on in order to compensate. To these complaints, the SECDEF responded, quote, 
You go to war with the army you have, not the army you might want or wish to have at a later time. End quote. The Unit Exodus of 2005 After the January elections, the new coalition units began to arrive in Iraq and assume responsibility for battle space. Third Corps, which formed the MNCI headquarters, was replaced by 18th Airborne Corps from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and Third Corps Commander Metz handed command of MNCI to 18th Airborne Corps Commander Lt. Gen. John R. Vines on February 10th. Vines was an infantry officer who had spent almost his entire career in airborne or ranger units and had parachuted into Panama during the 1989 invasion. More importantly, he had commanded all U.S. and coalition forces in Afghanistan in 2003. In mid-February, Multinational Brigade Northwest's, or MNBNW's, headquarters, Task Force Olympia, made up of personnel from First Corps, was replaced by Task Force Freedom, comprised of personnel from the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment. Task Force Olympia's only major maneuver element, the 3rd Brigade's 2nd Infantry Division Striker, had been replaced by the 1st Brigade 25th Infantry Division Striker in mid-October 2004. Some of the original mistakes in the creation of Task Force Olympia were corrected during this transition. While the amount of combat power was not increased and MNB and W remained an economy of force operation, the task force commander was upgraded to a two-star position and filled by Major General David M. Rodriguez. The shortage of headquarters personnel was also addressed by the addition of nearly 150 soldiers, including 50 military intelligence specialists, to help piece together the intelligence picture across Ninawa province. Unfortunately, since the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment was a regimental headquarters performing the functions of a division headquarters, Almost all of the additional personnel were individual augmentees pulled from units across Iraq and across the Army, some without the requisite position specialty or experience. In MNDNC, the 1st Infantry Division was replaced by Major General Joseph J. Toledo's 42nd Infantry Division, the National Guard unit from New York. The 42nd Infantry Division itself was a patchwork with two active duty brigades from the 3rd Infantry Division, as well as the 278th Regimental Combat Team from the Tennessee National Guard and the 116th Cavalry Brigade from the Idaho National Guard. The Marines in MNFW rotated later than the Army forces, mostly in March. 1st MEF and Lt. Gen. John F. Sattler handed over responsibility to Major Gen. Stephen Johnson, Deputy Commander of 2nd MEF. With the MNCI commander as a three-star general, the Marine Corps had decided to make the senior Marine in Iraq equal in rank to the other MNDs. The Marines considered consolidating the MEF and Marine Division headquarters, but ultimately decided to retain the two organizations. Below the MEF headquarters, now identified as 2nd MEF Forward, Major General Richard A. Huck's 2nd Marine Division replaced Major General Richard F. Natonsky's 1st Marine Division. The 2nd Marine Division brought with it two regimental combat teams from Camp Lejeune, RCT-2 and RCT-8, to replace RCT-1 and RCT-7, respectively. In Baghdad, the 1st Cavalry Division was replaced by the 3rd Infantry Division under Major General William Fuzzy Webster. Webster's division was assigned one less brigade combat team than the 1st Cavalry Division, but nearly double the territory, since MNDB's area expanded to include part of the area formerly controlled by the Spanish Brigade in Multinational Division Central South, or MNDCS. The Skrena Incident In Multinational Division Southeast, or MNDSE, a single incident prompted the final withdrawal of the Italian contingent and the creation of another brigade-sized hole in the fragile southern sector. On March 4, 2005, agents from the Italian Military Intelligence Service obtained the release of Giuliana Screna, an Italian journalist who had been kidnapped by insurgents and held for ransom for a month. In the immediate aftermath of her release, the Italian agents transporting her to the Baghdad airport came upon a traffic control point manned by troops of 1st Battalion 69th Infantry, a New York National Guard unit. The Italians had not coordinated their mission and route with MNFI or any other coalition elements, and as the vehicle carrying Screna sped toward the checkpoint, the New York soldiers on duty gave warnings from a spotlight and a green laser. 
Fearing the Italian's vehicle was a car bomb when it did not react to the warnings, the American soldiers fired at the vehicle, wounding Screna and one Italian agent while killing another, Major General Nicola Calipari. Coming after the 2003 Nasseria bombing that had killed 19 Italians, the Screna shooting caused the collapse of Italian popular support for the Iraq mission. Less than two weeks after the incident, Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi announced that Italy would withdraw its 3,000 soldiers, the fourth largest coalition contingent at the time. The Netherlands, Poland, and Ukraine, facing similar domestic pressure, also announced they would leave the coalition. Arrival of the Transformed Units as the units of the third rotation of Operation Iraqi Freedom, or OIF, arrived in Iraq in early 2005, the 3rd Infantry Division typified the challenges of transforming the army in the midst of war. Having redeployed to Fort Stewart, Georgia in September 2003 after being the main effort of the invasion force, the division was chosen to return to Iraq as part of the troop rotation that would occur in early 2005. Because its equipment had been left in Iraq in 2003 to be reused by the units replacing it, the division had arrived home with only 10% of its reportable equipment, much of which had to be sent to maintenance depots to be refurbished. This shortage made training difficult and forced unit leaders to become creative to prepare the division for war a second time. Quote, We had to go back to doing something from the 1920s, establishing pools of equipment that would be handed off from company to company as they went out to train, end quote, Webster recalled. One unit even used golf carts from the Fort Stewart golf course to practice mounted maneuver and convoy operations because they had no combat vehicles. At the same time the division faced these training challenges, army leaders decided to make the first, quote, modular division, end quote, and instructed Webster to reorganize his units. Quote, figure out how to find four or five brigades out of the three that you have now, end quote, chief of staff of the army, General Schoomaker, told Webster, adding that the new brigades should be, quote, sustainable by themselves and capable of plugging in and deploying with any division headquarters, end quote. The smaller, modular brigades were outfitted with new technology designed to improve their tracking of both friendly and enemy forces, along with new equipment designed to make the brigades more capable than legacy brigades. As Webster realigned battalions to grow the additional brigade, he was only able to apportion to each brigade two maneuver battalions, but Schoomaker believed the loss of the 3rd Battalion could be mitigated by the improved capability of each brigade. Schoomaker also assumed that if two maneuver battalions were insufficient in a brigade combat team's area of operations, the theater commander could take a battalion from elsewhere in the theater and strengthen the main effort. Unfortunately, this assumption ran headlong into the widespread shortage of forces that already existed across Iraq, and maneuver commanders across the country were feeling starved of combat power. When the 3rd Infantry Division deployed to Iraq, the concept of brigade modularity was tested immediately. MNCI assigned two of the division's brigades to the 42nd Infantry Division in MNDNC, while the 3rd Infantry Division, assigned to MNDB, would retain two of its own brigades, but receive the 256th Brigade of the Louisiana National Guard, the 3rd Brigade 1st Armored Division, the 2nd Brigade 10th Mountain Division, and later the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment. The plug-and-play nature of the modularized or transformed brigade combat teams created additional challenges. Often, the division headquarters had not worked or trained with the brigades assigned to them in Iraq. For many units, the critical component of mission command, that commanders should be intimately familiar with their subordinate leaders and vice versa, was simply not in place. As legacy brigades were replaced by transformed brigades and vice versa, operational leaders began to observe important differences in capability. Because of their diminished manpower, transformed brigades that replaced legacy brigades often had difficulties covering the same battle space. The RSTA squadrons created the most problems. As Webster realized in Baghdad, they were, quote, too light and too small for the kind of fight we were in. They were not capable of independently gathering reconnaissance and surveillance information for us, and they were not capable of conducting security operations by themselves. So, it caused us to change. 
In the case of each brigade, we had to change the size of the piece of ground that we gave them, and the number of tasks that we gave them had to be reduced because the recon and surveillance organizations were smaller than the battalions or squadrons that they replaced. End quote. To add to the newly arriving brigade combat team's challenges, many were broken up as they arrived, with some of their battalions detached to perform different missions. The idea that brigades were modular and interchangeable began to extend in practice to battalions, which army leaders had not intended to be plug-and-play organizations that could be assigned to different brigade headquarters without any impact on their effectiveness. The 11th ACR illustrated this new trend as its subordinate battalions were chopped away from the regiment to perform three different missions in Iraq. The regimental headquarters served as the backbone of MNBNW, replacing Task Force Olympia, but the regiment's first squadron was assigned to the 3rd Infantry Division in Baghdad, and the 2nd squadron rounded out the Mississippi National Guard's 155th Brigade Combat Team in North Babil. The breaking up of unit cohesion and the familiarity of unit leaders created significant problems with retention, casualty notification, and the process of ordering replacements, as well as with other more subjective measures of performance. As the transformed brigade combat teams were broken up and their battalions reassigned to other brigades to meet the needs of the battlefield, Transformed battalions with their enhanced connectivity and command and control capabilities were often teamed with legacy units that did not have the additional technology and situational awareness, effectively negating some of the transformational capabilities. The transformed brigades, likewise, suffered growing pains as some commanders who had spent their careers in armor or infantry units now had an organic artillery battalion and other support units they were responsible for training in peacetime and employing during wartime. Over time, many MND commanders came to favor the legacy brigade combat teams for their manpower instead of the transformed brigades. Striker brigades were similarly in high demand because they had three maneuver battalions, like legacy brigades, but also an additional RSTA squadron, giving them a total of 757 more soldiers than a transformed brigade. The striker brigades also had other enhanced capabilities, such as better situational awareness, more human intelligence specialists, and additional unmanned aerial vehicles. Striker vehicles earned respect because they were survivable, quiet, and fast, with tremendous tactical and operational maneuverability. Strikers could maintain a speed of 60 miles an hour, and some strikers traveled more than 88,000 kilometers in a year-long deployment. At the tactical level, the strikers carried an entire squad of infantry, 11 soldiers, far more than in Bradley fighting vehicles and up-armored high-mobility multi-purpose wheeled vehicles, or HMMWV. In terms of both troop strength and capability, in the manpower-intensive counterinsurgency fight, striker brigades received almost universal acclaim. Iraqization Page 383. The Transition Strategy. The newly arrived forces were called on to implement a revised campaign plan. Even before the January election outcome was known, MNFI had conducted a campaign process review that, coupled with a counterinsurgency study conducted in September to October 2004, reinforced the lessons of Najaf that building the expertise of the ISF was the most critical ingredient in successful counterinsurgency operations. Improving host nation capability was so important, the fall 2004 study had concluded, that, quote, no great power had ever succeeded in a counterinsurgency without a capable indigenous partner, end quote. Accordingly, in April 2005, Casey's headquarters published an updated plan that aimed to suppress the insurgency through coalition combat operations that bought time and space for a new main effort, training and equipping the ISF so that the counterinsurgency campaign could be transitioned to their responsibility. While Casey's August 2004 mission statement had focused equally on conducting full-spectrum counterinsurgency operations and on training and equipping the ISF, the new April 2005 mission statement read, quote, In partnership with the Iraqi Transitional Government, or ITG, 
MNFI progressively transitions the counterinsurgency campaign to the ITG and Iraqi security forces, while aggressively executing counterinsurgency operations to create a security environment that permits the completion of the UNSCR or United Nations Security Council Resolution 1546 process and the sustainment of political and economic development. End quote. While the mission statement changed significantly with a new focus on transition, the end state of MNFI's campaign remained unchanged. Quote, Iraq, at peace with its neighbors and an ally in the war on terror, with a representative government that respects the human rights of all Iraqis and security forces sufficient to maintain domestic order and to deny Iraq as a safe haven for terrorists. End quote. To underscore this change in strategy, Casey emphasized to his BCT commanders that their mission was, quote, to help the Iraqis win, not to win it for the Iraqis, end quote. He also warned against creating Iraqi dependency on the coalition, noting that, quote, the longer the coalition leads the fight, the more dependent the ISF, or Iraqi security forces, becomes, end quote. These statements echoed the same concerns he had expressed when he took command, lessons he had drawn from his tenure in Bosnia. The Military Transition Teams The updated campaign plan would unfold in four phases. During Phase 1, MNFI would deploy roughly 250 transition teams of military advisors to improve the quality of the Iraqi army units and some national police units. The teams, which MNFI considered to be its main effort, had originally been named assistance teams, but were renamed transition teams when Rumsfeld balked at the name, noting that the term assistance could imply long-term dependence. A small effort of 15 teams would also be assigned to work with the Iraqi border forces that fell under the Interior Ministry's Department of Border Enforcement. Alawi had rejected pairing transition teams with local police because of sovereignty concerns, so within the Ministry of the Interior, there would only be transition teams with the special police forces, commandos, public order brigades, and specialized mechanized brigades, and the border police. In early December 2004, MNFI began the process of requesting personnel for the transition teams from the Joint Staff and Service Chiefs. Knowing that it would take the services time to notify personnel of the new assignments and prepare them for deployment, MNFI ordered each multinational division in Iraq to create internal transition teams out of its on-station units to support Iraqi army units in their sectors, a step Casey believed would speed up the transition process by at least six months. In what could be a record-breaking speed for clearing infamous Pentagon bureaucratic hurdles, the proposal for the externally sourced transition teams went from concept to troops on the ground in a mere six months. However, the ease with which the program cleared the Pentagon bureaucracy masked some significant disagreements about the design of the teams. MNFI planners had originally envisioned teams of 20 troops each that would embed within Iraqi units down to the company level, the echelon at which planners believed the advisors could best affect the Iraqis' fighting ability. This initial plan would mean a personnel requirement of 5,000 non-commissioned officers and field-grade officers, a figure that dismayed the joint services in the Pentagon who would have to strip many stateside units of their mid-level leaders to meet the requirement. Casey also had judged that teams of 20 U.S. troops would be unwieldy and would impinge on Iraqi sovereignty, and approved a team size of 10 advisors instead, for a total personnel requirement of 2,500. Because of the force protection risks involved, he also balked at embedding down to the company level and instead authorized embedding the advisors at Iraqi division, brigade, and battalion levels. Casey's decision did not sit well with the planners responsible for organizing the transition teams who tried to dissuade him by arguing that, quote, the lack of embedded support at the company level is counter to lessons from successful coin operations and counter to U.S. slash U.K. practice with other indigenous armies, end quote. To collect enough manpower to restore the company-level advisors, they proposed eliminating division-level advisors and pairing transition teams with only a portion of the ISF, but Casey was not swayed by this argument. Another debate arose over whether the U.S. military should use individual augmentees or standing units to form the advisory teams. 
As chief of staff of the army, Schoomaker disagreed with the concept of creating small advisory teams of individual replacements. He believed the advisory mission should be given to standing brigades and battalions whose commanders would be accountable for its success. Cognizant of the drawbacks of the Vietnam-era individual replacement system, Schoomaker was reluctant to deploy individuals rather than cohesive units. He also feared that individuals deployed as advisors would be lost in the personnel system and forced into back-to-back deployments, causing them to burn out faster. By contrast, Casey and MNFI believed many army units were already struggling to adapt to the counterinsurgency environment in Iraq and could not be expected to train the ISF as well. In addition, as he had concluded from his Bosnia experience, Casey believed most U.S. units would be too hands-on in an advisory role, inclined to do too much of the work rather than developing the Iraqis to do it for themselves. These problems would be minimized if the advisory teams were composed of individuals that Casey and MNFI could train and shape in Iraq. He and MNFI thus insisted on individuals, and Schoomaker and the Army eventually acceded. The military transition teams, or MIT, therefore, would be ad hoc organizations made up of individuals from across the Army and other services. The notion of sending senior non-commissioned officers and field-grade officers to work in small teams outside the Army organizational structure to live with Iraqi forces in order to train them was revolutionary for the institutional army in the post-Vietnam era. In an effort to sell the newly transformed strategy and bill for additional forces to the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General John Abizade explained that, quote, As we follow General Casey's vision to shift our main effort to clearly concentrate on ISF development, we will also need to face cultural change for our own armed forces. We'll need people living with small Iraqi units and police outposts in isolated and exposed places. Managing such risk will be difficult, especially as the enemy adapts. We must stay focused on a strategy for Iraqi success. Iraqization. End quote. The newness of the MIT mission meant there was no existing training system for the advisors, and there was noticeable institutional friction in setting up the preparatory training for the initial teams. Quote, The Army couldn't get it set up fast enough to have a productive thing back here in the States, so we had to do it ourselves, end quote, Casey told military historians in 2008. To that end, Casey ordered MNFI to create a two-week training program in Iraq called the Phoenix Academy, to train the advisors in their specialized tasks. The program was ready by late April, before the first external MITs began arriving. The MIT mission also highlighted a long-running challenge that had bedeviled MNFI since the start of the war, obtaining sufficient Arabic linguists to serve as interpreters. Even before the transition teams were stood up, MNFI had been unable to meet the insatiable need for Category 1 interpreters, Iraqi nationals or other non-U.S. citizens who handled most tactical interactions, and the command was nearly 1,500 linguists short, resulting in a 64% fill of the critical requirement. Because of their need to work closely with the ISF, the transition teams would require an additional 1,200 linguists. As a result, MNFI's main effort, the development of the ISF, would be initially hobbled by a severe shortage of interpreters. End of Chapter 15, Part 1 Transformation in a Time of War January to April 2005 Read by Adam Cable, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 2021Chapter 15, Part 2, Transformation in a Time of War, January to April 2005, of The U.S. Army in the Iraq War, Volume 1, by U.S. Army Operation Iraqi Freedom Study Group. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adam Cable. Chapter 15, Part 2, Transformation in a Time of War. January to April 2005. Debate over the role of special operations forces. The Army and MNFI debates over the construct and sourcing of the transition teams also extended to special operations forces. 
Many in both MNFI and the Institutional Army argued that the Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force Arabian Peninsula, or CJSOTF-AP, and Army Special Forces operators, long regarded as the premier force in conducting foreign internal defense and training partner militaries, should do more to help fill the onerous burden of the transition teams. Accordingly, MNFI requested additional Special Forces units through U.S. Central Command, or CENTCOM, and the Pentagon, but the Joint Staff disapproved the request after U.S. Special Operations Command and U.S. Army Special Operations Command objected on practical and philosophical grounds. From a practical standpoint, there simply were not enough Special Forces troops in the Army to meet Casey's requirement of partnering with roughly 250 Iraqi battalions. Each Special Forces group notionally had 54 Operational Detachment Alphas, or ODAs, of 12 men, each of which, by doctrine, could train a host nation battalion when at full strength. However, by 2005, some groups had so few personnel that they had shuttered some ODAs and combined others in order to constitute fully manned teams. Two Special Forces groups were already committed to -to back-to-back rotations in Iraq, with another two committed to Afghanistan, and the final group had a sizable commitment in the form of the JSOTF in the Philippines. Mathematically, fulfilling Casey's transition team requirement for a single year-long rotation required committing four of the five Special Forces groups to Iraq without regard to Afghanistan or any other missions across the geographic combatant commands. Even so, Partly as a result of the acrimony involved in the rejection of MNFI's request, a compromise was reached that agreed to a one-time surge of SOF advisors, and the number of Special Forces battalions deployed increased from two to three for a period of seven months. These advisors deployed to train the Iraqi army in Nineveh province and Mosul, where the Iraqi army had all but collapsed in November 2004, and where Casey would soon be making a push to reestablish control of Iraq's western border. The decision to reject a larger special operations commitment, as well as the CJSOTFAP's rejection of a larger role in training the ISF, also reflected a philosophical disagreement over the proper role of special operations forces in Iraq. One element of the disagreement centered on how best to train the ISF. The MNSTCI and MNFI model, in the opinion of CJSOTFAP leaders, compromised quality to stress quantity based on the premise that counterinsurgency required a certain numeric troop-to-population ratio to be successful. Many in the CJSOTF-AP believed that the emphasis on achieving high numbers of Iraqis trained, without emphasizing the quality of training, paralleled the misguided use of body counts in Vietnam. As one CJSOTF-AP commander explained, quote, It was the reverse of the body count. It was not the number of guys who we're killing. It was the number of guys you were training. Just like a body count, that does not really tell you whether you are obtaining your strategic or operational goals. The training body count, how many guys are in the Iraqi security forces, does not tell you anything about your strategic or operational objectives and how well you are doing towards achieving them. End quote. Others who evaluated MNSTCI's programs shared these concerns. Retired General Gary F. Luck and his Iraq Security Assessment Team visited Iraq to review MNFI's campaign plan and strategy to develop the ISF in January 2005. They advised MNFI to, quote, shift focus to quality of ISF versus quantity, individually and collectively, end quote, noting that one of the most important keys to success for the Iraqi military was the will to win. The disagreement over how to build the ISF ran deeper than a simple debate of quantity versus quality. CJSOTF-AP leaders believed they had developed a successful model in the 36th Commando Battalion and the Iraqi Counterterrorism Force, including forced ethnic mixing, a rigorous selection process, better equipment, long-term partnership, and the ability to pick unit leaders, and did not want to dilute it. In the view of MNFI and MNSTCI leaders, however, the 36th Commando model could never produce a force large enough to secure the entire country. Instead, MNFI and MNSTCI had pressed the CJSOTF-AP to change the mission of its ODAs and focus on increasing the throughput for basic training as a way to accelerate ISF growth, believing the CJSOTF-AP's model to be too slow. But because the CJSOTF-AP was merely under MNCI's tactical control, 
MNFI could not change the CJSOTFAP's base mission, and the organizations simply agreed to disagree on how best to train the ISF. There were other reasons that the CJSOTFAP turned down the expanded mission. With CJSOTFAP commanders changing roughly every seven months, maintaining consistency in the organization's direction was difficult. The changes in commanders brought not only personality differences, but also divergences in the ethos of the two special forces groups that formed the CJSOTFAP. As units rotated, Foreign Internal Defense, or FID, fell in and out of favor, often eclipsed by direct action missions that provided more immediate and tangible, albeit fleeting, results. Some CJSOTFAP commanders believed that they were contributing more by conducting tactical direct action missions to kill or capture high-value individuals on MNFI's target list, and considered conducting FID with the Iraqi Special Operations Forces, or ISOF Brigade, simply an extension of that kill-capture mission. Similarly, some of the CJSOTFAP's principal partners, the multinational divisions that owned Battlespace, were eager to see the products of its human intelligence network and the results of its direct action missions, and did not have patience for the time-consuming efforts required to improve the ISF. The effect the CJSOTFAP might have had on the Iraqi forces was watered down by some CJSOTFAP commanders, who believed their ODAs should not train Iraqi units larger than platoon size, despite the doctrinal standard that an ODA could train an indigenous battalion. Because SOF leaders had decided not to forward deploy a general officer in Iraq as part of a higher headquarters for the CJSOTFAP, the disconnects and divergences between the two SOF groups and among different leaders were never adjudicated. This mistake also hurt the CJSOTFAP's ability to deliver advice and situational awareness to MNCI and MNFI. With a rare responsibility that geographically stretched across the entire country, including areas where no American forces were present, such as MNDCS and the Korean-led MNDNE, the CJSOTFAP had a unique perspective on Iraq. Unfortunately, with no general officer assigned, the CJSOTFAP commanders were unable to attend many of the MNFI-level meetings whose attendance was limited to the General Officer Corps. The absence of a SOF General Officer and a higher echelon headquarters also hampered unity of effort among the various SOF entities deployed to Iraq, and at times considerable friction developed among them because of overlap in missions, targets, and terrain. This deep familial conflict laid bare the fact that SOF units would reconcile and achieve synergy with conventional forces before reconciling among their own disparate elements. In interviews conducted after the war, 10 CJSOTFAP commanders, every one questioned, lamented that there should have been a higher SOF headquarters in Iraq, led by a SOF general. Reduction of the Coalition Footprint during phases two through four of the campaign plan, the coalition would progressively transfer responsibility for security operations and territory to the Iraqis. Each transfer was meant to be conditions-based, dependent on the rated performance of the ISF. In phase two, transition to provincial Iraqi security control, ISF would take the lead in planning, directing, and sustaining counterinsurgency operations, while coalition units would shift to a supporting role and decrease their presence and footprint. The plan's ambitious goal was to reach this stage for all of Iraq by November 30, 2005. Abizaid and Casey relayed this plan to have Iraqi forces in the lead of the counterinsurgency fight by the end of the year to Alawi in the days after the election, but the generals would eventually have to renegotiate the plan months later with a new prime minister and a shifting security situation. In Phase 3, Transition to National Iraqi Security Governance, provinces would return to provincial Iraqi control, in which provincial leaders and ministers in the national government would take responsibility for Iraqi security. Because Alawi had refused to allow MITS to collaborate with local police, Coalition leaders anticipated this transition would not take place before mid-2006. In the final phase, Iraqi security self-reliance, the relationship between the Iraqi government and the coalition would evolve into a more typical security relationship between allied states, with embassies serving as the main coalition presence. In this phase, 
coalition forces would move to, quote, strategic overwatch, end quote, outside of Iraq, but were prepared to return if needed. At the same time that MNFI published its new campaign plan, it also published a contingency plan that established procedures for what the coalition would do as the Iraqis reached each successive stage of the transition. One element of the contingency plan addressed coalition basing, with the goal of reducing the footprint from phase to phase. Although the plan was based on Iraqi performance, it set a baseline for coalition base closures by phase. Of the 108 bases operating as of April 2005, some 7 to 10 were to be closed during Phase 1, 46 to 49 during Phase 2, and 45 to 51 during Phase 3, leaving only four long-term bases at Al-Assad, Talil, Balad, and Erbil. Another element of these procedures involved determining the size of the coalition troop presence in Iraq over time. In June and September 2005, Casey and MNFI would use assessments of the ISF to make decisions on whether to reduce the force structure for the January 2006 rotation of forces. This would, quote, take the form of early departures from theater, a diversion of inbound forces to fill the requirement for a strategic reserve brigade in Kuwait, or the decision to retain forces in CONUS, continental United States, on prepare-to-deploy orders, end quote. The contingency plan sanguinely predicted that these assessments would allow for a reduction to 12 U.S. brigades and four Allied brigades on the ground in 2006. MNFI would then conduct another assessment after the December 2005 parliamentary elections, but Casey's headquarters expected that conditions would likely improve enough that by mid-2006, the coalition presence could be reduced through early withdrawals to just nine U.S. brigades and two Allied brigades. The next assessment would be conducted in June 2006, by which time Casey and his officers expected the situation to be stable enough to require only six U.S. brigades and two Allied brigades in the early 2007 rotations. As U.S. combat power decreased along these lines, Abizaid and Casey hoped to replicate the model used in Bosnia and Kosovo, with a multinational organization assuming responsibility for the mission from the Americans. In a January 15, 2005 memorandum, Abizaid described this preferred end state as the transitioning of, quote, MNFI to ISFOR, or Iraq Stabilization Force, with a UN or international mandate with fixed end date, force size fixed at 50,000 inside Iraq led by a non-U.S. commander, U.S. contribution limited to no more than 20% of the force, is separate and distinct from training effort led by U.S. commanders under MACI, or Military Assistance Command Iraq, authorities. The idea here is to speed Iraqization, de-Americanize the effort, rejuvenate international effort, let Iraqis get out front. End quote. The impetus to hand off the mission to another foreign entity resulted in coalition attempts to garner support for either a NATO mission or a Muslim force led by Jordan's King Abdullah. These efforts were ultimately unsuccessful because neither NATO nor the Arab states viewed the mission with the same degree of optimism that the United States did in the wake of the January elections. Casey's confidence in predictions that a rapid growth in ISF capabilities would lead to a rapid drawdown in combat power was not shared by all in the coalition. When the newly arrived 28th Airborne Corps, serving as the MNCI headquarters, was asked in February 2005 to comment on the planned timetable, its staff responded that, quote, Early 2006 is too early to off-ramp BCTs. This capability will not be likely until we get into national control. This is due to the requirement to provide direct support and general support to the ISF. C4I, Command, Control, Communications, Computers, and Intelligence, Logistics, Joint Fires and Effects, QRF, or Quick Reaction Force, Force Protection, Reconstruction, etc. End quote. MNCI's input reflected its leaders' concerns that, quote, decisions in MNF proposal to off-ramp are tied to phase and time and not conditions, end quote and added that any off-ramps should begin at battalion level and below once the right conditions existed. The Transition Readiness Assessment While MNFI would reject the recommendation to begin off-ramps at the battalion level and ultimately discount worries that 2006 was too early to off-ramp forces, 
It immediately acted on MNCI's recommendation to develop a conditions-based assessment that would help determine when coalition forces could withdraw. In spring 2005, the coalition commands created a system for the soon-to-arrive MIT advisors to evaluate the Iraqi units they advised with a view to using the data to inform the coalition's decisions on troop withdrawals. The new Transition Readiness Assessment, or TRA, would assign each Iraqi unit an overall rating from 1, fully capable of planning, executing, and sustaining independent counterinsurgency operations, to 4, describing a unit that was still being formed and incapable of conducting counterinsurgency operations. These overall ratings were determined by a series of 15 questions, on each of which an Iraqi unit would be rated in descending order of proficiency as green, amber, red, or black. The responses to the questions would then be entered into algorithms that would ultimately produce the overall TRA rating that would serve as an important element in decisions to off-ramp brigades and close coalition bases. The TRA metrics were a product of significant collaboration among MNCI, MNSTCI, the Joint Staff, and Casey. They were designed to be, quote, simple for the Iraqis to understand and simple for the commanders on the ground to come up with the assessment, end quote, as one MNSTCI officer recalled. Quote, ultimately, you want to know, can you turn battle space over to this Iraqi unit, end quote. Implicit within the assessment system, however, was the understanding that even a TRA-1 unit would not be fully ready to operate independently without the coalition's logistical, fire support, and medical evacuation assistance. However, a TRA-1 rating meant to MNFI planners that U.S. units could begin to disengage large American combat units from an Iraqi unit's area and turn over battle space. The 15 questions that calculated the TRA rating were divided into six major groupings, personnel, command and control, training, sustainment slash logistics, equipment, and leadership. Almost all of the questions were quantitative. For example, all three of the questions under equipment and three of the four questions under personnel assessed only whether an Iraqi unit had the equipment and personnel it was authorized. There was little subjectivity to the assessment and little ability for coalition advisors to note, for example, whether an Iraqi unit was proficient in using the equipment it had on hand. No rating in the assessment explored the important subjective questions of sectarianism, willingness to fight, and unit cohesiveness. Only one of the 15 questions addressed training, and it assessed the percentage of mission-essential tasks on which a unit was proficient. Coalition advisors could include a subjective narrative with the assessment, but it did not contribute to the overall calculation of TRA ratings, nor did it override the TRA rating that derived from the calculations of objective data. Some tactical-level coalition leaders later found the selection of TRA metrics and their overly objective nature problematic. Major Stephen Campbell, a British officer in MNDSE, explained, quote, The measures of effects, effectiveness, were coming down from coalition, from the force up in Baghdad, were things that were irrelevant, like, is the Iraqi security forces fully manned? I'm like, yes, it's fully manned. It's fully manned with militiamen. The historical record will be quite entertaining on this, because you're going to find a bunch of categories that are color-coded green for good to go, yet the text boxes that go with them are going to say something horrific, like, The Iraqi security forces in MND Southeast are completely dominated by Shia militias. They sponsor attacks on the local population and against the occupation. They are sponsored by Iran. We have no control over them. Assessment, green. I was allowed to write what I wanted to in the box as long as the thing was green, because by their criteria, it was green. End quote. Nevertheless, the overall rating was a critical component of the campaign plan because, in Casey's words, it was used to make, quote, judgments about when we might transition areas to the Iraqi army and, ultimately, provinces back to the Iraqis, end quote. The Transformation of the Insurgency, page 391. The Shia Militias and Iran. At the same time that the U.S. Army was undergoing its transformation, Shia insurgent groups were undergoing their own transformation after one and a half years of combat. The Shia militant groups, Jaish al-Mahdi or JAM in particular, 
had taken significant casualties in the April and summer 2004 fighting, killing off many of the less capable leaders and fighters. After absorbing these heavy losses, those JAM leaders that remained concluded that to use the same tactics and engage the coalition in open warfare would be to invite extinction. The surviving leaders decided that external assistance was needed to fight effectively against the coalition. In what must have been a difficult decision for such an independent-minded thinker, Moqtada Sadr acceded to his subordinate's recommendation to reach out to the Iranian regime for additional assistance. Qais al-Khazali, one of Sadr's top lieutenants, later explained to coalition officials that, quote, After the fall of Najaf in August of 2004, he and others in the Sadrist movement were unhappy with the way JAM fought and the way Muqtada al-Sadr conducted his military leadership. Ghazali and his followers decided to fight in a more disciplined manner with better units, and they reached out to Qasem Soleimani for help. End quote. As commander of the Quds Force, the subset of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps responsible for covert operations in Iraq and other Middle Eastern countries, Qasem Soleimani welcomed the request for assistance because it gave the Iranian regime additional options to destabilize the American and coalition effort beyond its covert support for SCIRI, the Badr Corps, and Dawa. One British intelligence officer who served in MNDSE and witnessed the JAM transformation later described why the Iraqi militia sought Iran's support and how that support transformed it. Quote, They'd, the JAM, realized that fighting us in the streets with the rifles and RPGs or rocket-propelled grenades was a good way of not ever receiving your pension because we'd just kill them. They couldn't take us on openly like that, so they went over to the Iranians, and the Iranians had done this work in Lebanon with Hezbollah before in the 1980s, so they basically take their manuals from that particular conflict and use it in this context. They got sophisticated IED technology that was above what our countermeasures could defeat. They came back with different structure, covert, cellular insurgency, closer to terrorism in its tactics than an open insurgency. End quote. The CODS Force established a comprehensive training program for these new cellular organizations, which would soon be known as special groups. The training took place mainly in camps in Iran, with additional training sometimes held in Syria and Lebanon. Some of the training was conducted by Lebanese Hezbollah members, who were well respected by their eager Iraqi students because of their experience fighting Israel and their ability to speak Arabic, unlike the Farsi-speaking Iranian trainers, who had to instruct through interpreters. The April and summer 2004 fighting also transformed the Sadrist insurgency by creating fissures in an organization that had been previously relatively unified. Khazali's initiative to reach out to Iran had political overtones. Deeply frustrated by what he and other Sadr lieutenants saw as Moqtada Sadr's erratic and often incompetent leadership, Khazali likely hoped that the overtures toward Iran would give him an opportunity to become the rightful leader of JAM, or possibly create his own organization. Ghazali's resentment of Sadr dated to the 1990s, when Ghazali had been a highly regarded pupil of Sadr's Ayatollah father, and it is likely he considered himself more qualified to lead the Sadrist movement than Moqtada Sadr, his former classmate in the Elder Sadr's clerical school. Over time, these tensions would begin to splinter the movement. For the Iranian regime, the volatile Sadr movement could serve as an effective cover for the actions of the Badr Corps, which some coalition leaders believed to be a force of stability, in contrast to Jaish al-Mahdi. In reality, the Badr Corps was often just as brutal as JAM, but conducted itself more covertly, focusing on operations to exact revenge on Sunni leaders and manipulate the new Iraqi government. Rather than launching overt militant operations, Badr leaders were content to work their way quietly down an assassination list of prominent Sunnis, coordinating their actions with SCIRI to achieve political effects. For the next year, as the Shia groups underwent their Iranian training and prepared for the next round of conflict, the situation in MNDSE and Baghdad was deceptively quiet. The Shia militants' overt activities were limited, but the Shia groups were active in pursuing their goals nonetheless. While some MNFI leaders believed the coalition had defeated the Sadrists and other Shia insurgents in 2004, 
In reality, 2005 was the calm before the storm. The Iranian regime, happy to expand its influence in Iraqi politics, was seizing a new opportunity to keep the United States off balance. The Ascendancy of Al-Qaeda in Iraq Sunni insurgent groups also underwent a significant change after suffering heavy losses in the battles in Fallujah, Mosul, and other Sunni cities. The insurgents associated with the former regime had been hit particularly hard, and in their weakness lost their leading place in an insurgency they themselves had begun. As though to illustrate this change, in April, the Syrian regime handed over to coalition custody Saddam Hussein's half-brother, Sabawi Ibrahim al-Takriti, who had been a leader of foreign regime elements operating from Syria. The defeat of insurgent elements in Fallujah led to a geographic restructuring of the insurgency. After the battle, insurgent groups dispersed across the country, reconsolidating in Baghdad, North Babil, and the Ramadi Fallujah and Al-Qaim Haditha corridors in Anbar. Fallujah had become terrain the insurgents could no longer access, at least for the near term. Many of the surviving groups were forced to go underground, and they spent the beginning months of 2005 trying to re-establish their organization and infrastructure in Anbar as a temporary lull settled across the province. A large force of insurgents also displaced to the Lake Tartar region due to its remoteness from coalition forces. The depth of insurgent operations in the area became apparent on March 23, 2005, when a rare coalition foray into the insurgent sanctuary to raid a training camp resulted in the largest engagement since Al-Fajr. During a day-long battle that involved air support, Iraqi special police commandos, and elements of MNDNC, 85 insurgents were killed, as well as seven Iraqi police commandos. The most significant change within the Sunni insurgency, though, came when Abu Musab al-Zarqawi's group, Tawid wal-Jihad, evolved from an independent jihadist group into a part of al-Qaeda in late 2004 and early 2005. While the battles of the summer and fall, when the coalition, quote, fought to the elections, end quote, were effective in buying space and time for the election to occur, they also created a fertile breeding ground for the Sunni religious militants. The battles that destroyed swaths of the Sunni cities of Samarra, Tal Afar, Mosul, and Fallujah had destroyed much of the local and regional economies as well, leaving large segments of the Sunni population as refugees or impoverished. Reconstruction funds promised by the coalition and Iraqi leadership became mired in the Iraqi government's bureaucracy and sectarianism. In this economic void, Zarqawi's group was able to use its deeper pockets to hire young men away from other, more secular or nationalist groups. With the collapse of many Sunni resistance groups associated with former regime elements, many of the rank-and-file members switched loyalties and joined Zarqawi. The switch altered the demographics of his organization so that in Anbar most of his fighters were men who had served as military or security personnel under Saddam. Some of these former regime members brought with them the wealth and economic connections they had accumulated under Saddam, such as Sheikh Ghazi Sami Abbas, a Fallujah businessman who had become one of the five richest men in Iraq and who helped shelter Saddam's wife and daughters after the fall of Baghdad. Other sources of Zarqawi's money included smuggling, extortion from Iraqi civilians, and kidnappings and robberies. Zarqawi also received considerable external financial support in 2005 from al-Qaeda's senior leaders, who recognized Iraq's central place in the global jihad. With these finances, Zarqawi's organization was essentially able to outbid to the Iraqi government and the coalition for foot soldiers. While a low-ranking member of the Iraqi army or police was paid roughly $150 per month, Zarqawi could pay $100 to $200 for a single small arms, mortar, or IED attack, and even paid civilians $10 a day to spy on coalition forces. In October 2004, Zarqawi himself swore allegiance to Osama bin Laden and changed the name of his organization to Qaidat al-Jihad fi Bilad al-Rafadain, or Al-Qaeda in the Land of Two Rivers, Iraq, to reflect the new commitment. To coalition forces, Zarqawi's renamed organization became known simply as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, or AQI. By January, bin Laden rewarded Zarqawi's pledge of fealty by naming him Emir, or Commander, literally Prince, of Al-Qaeda's forces in Iraq. 
The swearing of allegiance was the result of extensive negotiations between the two groups and the realization of the mutual benefits a merger would bring. For Zarqawi's group, association with al-Qaeda brought brand recognition, an important factor in seeking financial donations and new recruits. Coupled with Zarqawi's efforts to capitalize on the post-Fallujah weakness of former regime elements, the merger ensconced Zarqawi at the top of the insurgency. For bin Laden and al-Qaeda, Zarqawi's group was instantly the most active and most violent branch of its global franchise, and by the end of 2004, bin Laden had concluded that Iraq should be the central campaign in his broader war against the West and its Arab allies. Like bin Laden, Zarqawi saw Iraq as central to a larger scheme, declaring in September, quote, The spark has been lit here in Iraq, and its heat will continue to intensify, by Allah's permission, until it burns the Crusader armies in Dabiq, end quote. Referring to a prophecy contained in a hadith, Zarqawi intimated that the conflict in Iraq would eventually lead to a battle in the Syrian town of Dabiq, where Islam would finally triumph over the West in the Armageddon. Such declarations had powerful religious meaning but also made headlines, which proved beneficial to the parent organization's recruiting and fundraising. At the same time, Al-Qaeda's senior leaders in Pakistan were concerned with Zarqawi's barbarism and his focus on targeting Iraq's Shia and starting a civil war, a plan that he had outlined to Al-Qaeda's senior leadership in the 2004 letters carried by Hassan Ghul. As a result, Al-Qaeda had insisted on two conditions for the merger. First, that Zarqawi focus his attacks against the United States, which Al-Qaeda saw as the more dangerous, quote, far enemy, end quote, and second, that Zarqawi not provoke intra-Muslim conflicts until after the United States was defeated in Iraq. Zarqawi would essentially ignore this agreement from the start, much to the consternation of al-Qaeda's leaders who had asked the Jordanian to organize an attack against the continental United States to demonstrate his commitment to the broader jihad. Indeed, even as Zarqawi negotiated the conditions of his union with al-Qaeda, he made political and tactical moves toward his goal of igniting a civil war in Iraq meeting with leaders of Ansar al-Sunnah and Jaish Mohammed in Abu Ghraib in early January to plan a joint campaign against the Shia-led government in Baghdad. An integral part of his strategy was to increase the number of foreign suicide bombers infiltrating the country and use them to target the elections and the new government. While Ansar al-Sunnah would ally with al-Qaeda in Iraq after the meeting, the attempted alliance with Jaish Mohammed would soon break down, and the two groups became bitter enemies. From late December onward, Zarqawi continued his attacks against the Shia without let-up. On December 15th, a bombing killed seven at a Shia shrine in Karbala and wounded an aide to Grand Ayatollah Sistani. In the next two weeks, twin bombing attacks killed 70 in Najaf and Karbala, while a car bomb that targeted the SCIRI party headquarters in Baghdad killed 13 and nearly killed Abdul Aziz al-Hakim. On January 12th, two senior aides to Sistani were killed in separate attacks in Karbala and Salman Pak. On February 22nd, Zarqawi's operatives carried out five nearly simultaneous suicide bomber attacks across Baghdad that killed 39 and wounded 150 Shia celebrating Ashura. A week later, a suicide car bomber dispatched from Anbar by Zarqawi's cousin detonated his vehicle in the midst of Iraqi army and police recruits in the Shia city of Hilla, killing 122 in the single worst bombing of the war to that point. With the body count mounting, Zarqawi's offensive began to have its intended effect, causing Shia patience for nonviolent responses to wear thin. In January, frustrated by the seeming inability of the coalition and the government to stop Zarqawi's terror attacks, members of the Dawa Party and the Badr Corps formed the Mukhtar Battalion, a Shia death squad focused against Salafis, Wahhabis, and Baathists. They represented the first of what would soon become a wave of Shia militant groups targeting the Sunni communities of central Iraq. Zarqawi's ascension represented a tectonic shift in the insurgency. The Sunni Arab resistance, made up mainly of former regime elements that had been the backbone of the insurgency, fell into the background as Zarqawi rose to prominence. The loss of Fallujah, as well as concerns about Zarqawi's extremist attacks on Iraqis, led many of the less religiously extreme Sunni insurgents to seek ways to rejoin the mainstream and reconcile with the new government. Muhammad Mahmoud Latif, the head of the Ramadi Shura Council, 
met with other insurgent leaders in Hit in early 2005 to advocate for a political solution to the conflict, and even asked Dulaim tribal leaders to serve as intermediaries with the Iraqi interim government. Though Latif supported the election boycott of January 2005, his overtures created a schism within the Sunni insurgency between rejectionists and those willing to join the political process. The rift between Latif and Zarqawi deepened so quickly that in the wake of the disastrous Sunni boycott, open fighting erupted in Ramadi between AQI and more nationalist insurgent groups. By February, Latif and others temporarily stopped targeting coalition forces in order to fight al-Qaeda in Iraq and other Salafi groups that promoted takfir, a religious duty to kill apostates. The schism was not solely between Latif and Zarqawi. In March 2005 in Kuseba, foreign fighters from AQI fought pitched battles with local Sunni insurgents who had grown tired of fighting coalition forces and of the extremist version of Islam that Zarqawi's group brought with them. In the same month, Harith al-Dari's Association of Muslim Scholars issued a fatwa that prohibited the killing of Iraqi National Guardsmen, to which AQI defiantly responded by increasing its kidnappings and assassinations of ISF. Car bomb attacks against the Anbar contingent of special police commandos became so numerous that the unit effectively disintegrated as a result. Undeterred, Latif and several other insurgent leaders joined forces with Dari in late March to form the Sunni Shura Council, which sent envoys to the Iraqi government to propose, as a reconciliation measure, that over a thousand Iraqi police be replaced with former regime officers. To a degree, the offer signified Sunni leaders' realization that they had made a mistake in boycotting the January election. As word spread of the proposal, other Sunni leaders endorsed the initiative, including some of those who had headed Sunni insurgent groups in 2004. Ahmed al-Khalida from the Ramadi Shura Council, Khalid Shirabi from Mosul, some Syrian-based former regime elements, supporters of Sheikh Abdullah Janabi, and even an errant AQI leader, Abdul Qadir al-Damuk. For these leaders, contributing Sunnis to the ISF did not mean supporting the coalition. Instead, it meant they would be building a bulwark to prevent Shia encroachment into Anbar and setting themselves up potentially to retake control of the Iraqi government once the coalition withdrew. To demonstrate their resolve, they offered a symbolic three-day cessation of attacks against coalition forces in April that was ultimately respected by over 2,500 insurgents. Unfortunately for those willing to reconcile with the coalition, al-Qaeda in Iraq reacted quickly and violently to these events, targeting the renegade Damuk for assassination and forcing him to flee the country, and also targeting members of the Ramadi Shura Council. The brutality and effectiveness of AQI's vengeance campaign, combined with the nationalist insurgent leader's seemingly desperate outreach to the new government, seemed to signal to the insurgency's rank and file that groups such as the Ramadi Shura Council were losing, at least for the time being. The View from MNFI MNFI only partially recognized the transformations occurring within the Shia and Sunni insurgencies. While MNFI leaders correctly assessed that Zarqawi and his organization had become a major threat, it was difficult for the coalition to shift from its initial focus on former regime elements and acknowledge the degree to which Zarqawi had usurped the Ba'athists' place as the dominant force within the Sunni resistance. An MNFI assessment in January 2005 concluded, quote, The primary threat is former regime elements. Zarqawi remains spectacular and effective, but is not the primary threat. End quote. Likewise, MNCI's April 2005 intelligence assessment concluded, quote, The insurgency in Iraq is principally Sunni Arab, centered on former regime elements, particularly former Ba'ath Party and former regime military and intelligence service members. Foreign Islamic extremists are a relatively small yet lethal problem in Iraq. End quote. The same estimate also downplayed both Zarqawi's union with al-Qaeda and Zarqawi's ultimate objectives, noting that the, quote, possible merger, end quote, aimed to, quote, develop Iraq into a training ground for a generation of global jihadists, end quote. They believed that Zarqawi's intent, as evinced by the captured Ghul letter, was to, quote, create tension between Sunni and Shia factions within Iraq to forestall the peaceful transition to Iraqi sovereignty, end quote. 
In hindsight, these assessments completely missed the import of Zarqawi's call to incite civil war in Iraq and between the Shia and Sunni sects across the Middle East. Further demonstrating the disconnect between the coalition's assessments and the true state of the insurgency, at the end of 2004, six of the top ten targets on the MNFI high-value target list were still former regime elements. The number one high-value target was Izat Ibrahim al-Duri, while number two was Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. Of the 31 names on the list, 17 were part of Zarqawi's organization or other affiliated jihadist organizations, while 13 were associated with former regime elements. Notably, only one name was associated with Shia militant groups. In the big picture, MNFI was effectively targeting only Sunnis, and the Sunnis knew it. While the successful elections were a moment to savor, the Sunni boycott would prove to have far-reaching negative consequences. Almost as soon as the election results were tallied, Sunni Arab leaders began to realize that their gamble on a boycott had been a horrible mistake. While many in MNFI wrote off the boycott as a hard lesson for the Sunnis, in reality, Sunni Arabs became terrified that they had enabled the handing over of the country to the Shia. This disconnect in perceptions would persist for over a year, and consequently, the election results, quite paradoxically, made progress on the political track more difficult than progress in security matters. Coalition leaders saw elections as a unifying factor, one that would lend legitimacy to the Iraqi state and decrease violence in the country as the elected government found its bearings. In the course of events, however, the elections would soon be used by political actors to capture the machinery of government and use it to promote their sectarian agendas. At the same time that MNFI judged its campaign had achieved, quote, irreversible momentum, end quote, in Iraq, the institutional army in the United States was experiencing considerable stress on its forces. Continuing to transform in the midst of two wars without a significant increase in the army's end strength, forced army leaders to make the difficult choices of operationalizing the National Guard, the nation's strategic reserve, and deploying some units that had not been resourced for combat duty. Other active duty army units, whose core functions and expectations had not included deploying on contingency operations, were pushed into deploying and faced similar challenges to the operationalized National Guard units. When these units began arriving in Iraq, they faced further challenges as they were called to implement an entirely new campaign plan, a transition strategy that emphasized preparing the ISF rather than fighting insurgents. This new approach proved difficult for army units for whom advising and collaborating with host nation forces had not been a core component of any training or other preparation. In the best traditions of the army, these units would improvise, making do without doctrine or experience to guide them inaugurating a long campaign of pairing with Iraqi units to ready them to take control. End of Chapter 15, Part 2 Transformation in a Time of War January to April 2005 Read by Adam Cable, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 2021Chapter 16, Part 1, Going West, April to August 2005, of The U.S. Army in the Iraq War, Volume 1, by U.S. Army Operation Iraqi Freedom Study Group. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adam Cable. Chapter 16, Going West, April to August 2005, page 407. During the waning days of the lame-duck Ayad Alawi government, the spirits of the Multinational Force Iraq, or MNFI, staff and leadership had been buoyed by the announcement that a new cabinet and prime minister had finally been selected. For the first time, a freely elected Iraqi government was formed. MNFI believed that this event signaled that its campaign plan was on track and that the country was on the path to a fully legitimate Iraqi government that could assume the responsibility for its own security. Yet, under the veneer of this optimism, ethnic tensions roiled Iraq, threatening to overwhelm the entire process. Abu Musab al-Zarqawi and his al-Qaeda in Iraq, or AQI, would soon undertake a terrorist offensive in Baghdad, targeting government officials and Shia communities in an attempt to destabilize the new government and provoke a Shia response. 
As this sectarian violence began to increase in central Iraq, General George Casey faced a choice about where to employ the coalition's limited combat power. In central Iraq, where the bulk of the damaging sectarian attacks were taking place, or on the Iraq-Syria border, where AQI and other Sunni insurgent groups enjoyed freedom of movement into Iraq. New Government and New Sectarian Violence Page 407 The Jafari Government and the Madi'in Incident on April 7, 2005, after two months of negotiations among the major parties, the newly seated Iraqi parliament elected Jalal Talabani, the leader of the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, to the position of Iraqi president, with Sunni tribal leader Ghazi al yawar and the Supreme Council for Islamic Revolution in Iraq's, or SCIRI's, Adel Abdel Mahdi as vice presidents. Talabani immediately named Dawa party leader Ibrahim al jafri as prime minister-designate, meaning that Jafri would have one month to form a government. Jafri had emerged as the United Iraqi Alliances, or UIA's, consensus candidate after almost two months of negotiations among the major parties. Jafri's installation as prime minister marked the end of the Iraqi interim government and the beginning of the Iraqi transitional government, whose primary purpose was to draft a national constitution. For the first time in its modern history, Iraq was about to come under Shia political control an opportunity that Iraq's Shia leaders were not going to squander. However, the month-long period of Jafari's government formation was fraught with tension. On April 16th, the week following Jafari's appointment but before he had actually entered office, reports surfaced in the mixed-sect town of Madain, 16 kilometers south of Baghdad, that Sunni insurgents had taken as many as 150 Shia hostages, threatening to execute them if the remaining Shia did not abandon the village immediately. The specter of such overt sectarian cleansing on top of already strained sectarian relations created a political crisis in Baghdad. Iraqi National Security Minister Qasem Daoud, a Shia politician close to Grand Ayatollah Ali Husseini Sistani, described the reported incident as, quote, an attempt to drag this country into civil war, end quote, while other members of the National Assembly described it as, quote, a kind of ethnic purge. End quote. Three battalions of the Iraqi army surrounded Madain prepared for a Fallujah type house to house battle, but as Iraqi troops moved into the town, they found no insurgents, only townspeople who claimed to reporters that no hostages had been taken. In the days following the incident, Sunni and Shia politicians disagreed bitterly on what had happened. Sunni politicians denied the hostage-taking and massacre had taken place, claiming a hoax had been perpetrated as a pretext for, quote, striking the Sunni areas around Baghdad as a preface to sparking riots and fights between the two sects, end quote. Shia political groups and government officials claimed the hostages had been killed and dumped in the Tigris, a claim that was bolstered three days later when local officials pulled 57 bodies from the river a few miles downstream at Suwaira. Talibani announced that the corpses at Suwaira were those of the massacred Madain hostages, and SCIRI leader Abdul Aziz al-Hakim wrote interim Prime Minister Alawi to provide the names of those that SCIRI believed were responsible. In one of his last acts before leaving office, Alawi asked General George W. Casey Jr. to open an investigation into the Madain, quote, assassinations, end quote, to which Casey replied that the Iraqi government should conduct the investigation with U.S. help assuring Alawi that the names of the alleged terrorists SCIRI had furnished would be added to the coalition's intelligence database. The reported Madain massacre illustrated that Iraq had become a sectarian tinderbox, where a single instance of sectarian violence, or even a rumor of one, was enough to provoke a national-level crisis and serious talk of civil war. The incident also served as a microcosm of the larger Iraq at the time. After the incident, rather than cooperate on a joint investigation to determine what happened, Sunni and Shia politicians created differing narratives of what occurred, complete with their own facts that they exploited for personal and political gain. It also revealed the true nature and complexity of the, quote, fog, end quote, of Iraq, giving clarity to the depths of the challenges that the coalition faced in trying to determine what really happened in the aftermath of a significant episode with operational implications. In a cogent example of the coalition's limited situational awareness in the area of sectarian violence and cleansing, 
MNFI officials remained unsure of what exactly had happened in Madain, even though it was mere kilometers from the MNFI headquarters in Baghdad. Into this sectarian swamp waded Ibrahim al-Jafari. Jafari's leadership of the Dawa party, one of the few political factions without a militia, made him an acceptably non-threatening prime minister option for the various members of the UIA, and Jafari was able to garner enough votes to be seated on May 3, 2005, as the first freely elected prime minister in post-Saddam Hussein, Iraq. Jafari's Dawa Party was originally a reformist Islamic organization founded in 1959 by young Najaf-based clerics and laymen who modeled themselves after Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood. Jafari, a Shia Arab and trained physician, joined the party in 1966, shortly before the Baathists came to power. The ascendancy of the Baath brought considerable pressure on Dawa, including arrests and harassment, which resulted in the organization evolving into a revolutionary movement by the mid-1970s. When Saddam cracked down on the party at the outset of the Iranian Revolution and the Iran-Iraq War in 1979-1980, many Dawa members fled to Iran, including Jafri. By the end of the 1980s, the exiled Dawa had fractured into multiple branches, and Jafri moved to London. After Saddam's fall, he returned to Iraq and served as one of the two deputy presidents in the Iraqi interim government. On April 28, 2005, Jafari received the parliament's approval for his proposal to create a cabinet consisting of 32 ministers and three deputy prime ministers. Following its clear election victory, the UIA meant to ensure that as the government formed, Shia leaders would control a majority of the ministries, including the most powerful ones. Ministerial positions and the executive power associated with them were among the most important trophies to the new Shia administration in what was soon to become a de facto war to capture control of Iraq's state institutions. The eventual division of ministries reflected 16 Shia ministers, 8 Kurds, 6 Sunnis, 1 Christian, and 1 Turkoman. Notably, Bayan Jaber, a SCIRI activist with ties to the Badr Corps, became Iraq's interior minister, and three Sadr supporters assumed ministerial positions, despite the fact that Moqtada Sadr had called for a boycott of the election. Although new Defense Minister Sadun Dulaimi was a Sunni, the UIA balanced his role by appointing a Shia as his deputy. Bayan Jaber and the Interior Ministry the distribution of ministries to the political parties within the UIA created fiefdoms that were accountable to their party leaders rather than to the new prime minister. The most clearly detrimental posting was Bayan Jaber as the interior minister. The coalition initially met Jaber's appointment with optimism. At Multinational Security Transition Command Iraq, or MNSTCI, Lieutenant General David H. Petraeus came away from initial meetings with Jobber hoping that he would prove to be less corrupt and more focused on security than previous Interior Minister Fala Naqib, whom the coalition suspected had stacked the ministry with cronies. Naqib had also been responsible for staffing the special police with former officers from the Republican Guard and Special Forces, a step the Shia and Kurdish parties had vehemently criticized. However, Jabber quickly proved to be worse than his predecessor was. Shortly after taking over the ministry, Jabber purged the special police of 300 Sunni leaders, labeling them, quote, criminals, end quote, and replaced them with Shia officers, mostly members of the Badr Corps. In his first weeks in the ministry, Jabber hired 15,000 new recruits into the special police, the majority of whom were Shia. As the demographics of the commandos and other special police shifted, becoming majority Shia, the units took on the nicknames of the, quote, Wolf Brigade, end quote, and the, quote, Scorpion Brigade, end quote. And under the pretext of hunting down insurgents and terrorists, the brigades began a campaign of extrajudicial violence and intimidation in Sunni neighborhoods. Jabber initiated a shift in the Interior Ministry's local Baghdad strategy from defensive to offensive actions under the name Operation Lightning and greatly increased the number of police battalions in Baghdad. While this change had little impact on the number of insurgent attacks in the Baghdad area, it did result in accusations by the Sunni Arab parties that the Interior Ministry was deliberately, quote, allowing large-scale infiltration of Shia militias and alleged death squads into its ranks, end quote. 
As this infiltration progressed, reports became more frequent from Sunni neighborhoods that, quote, gunmen in police uniforms routinely abducted people from their homes, cars, and in one particularly flagrant case, hospital beds, end quote. According to Finance Minister Ali Alawi, quote, It was common knowledge that Baghdad's 60,000-strong police force was divided between the Mahdi Army and the Badr Organization, end quote, with 12,000 former Badr Corps members absorbed into the police commandos. With its focus on the Sunni insurgency and on transition to the Iraqi security forces, MNFI failed to recognize this escalation in government-sponsored sectarian violence. In briefings during mid-2005, several of Casey's senior intelligence analysts warned their commander that their greatest fear was that the Iraqi security forces would become dominated by the Shia, which could spark sectarian violence and a civil war, a danger Casey discounted since the Minister of Defense and the majority of Iraqi army generals at that time were Sunni. The Rise of Sectarian Cleansing Partially as a reaction to the formation of the Jafari government, sectarian elements crept into Baghdad's mixed-sect areas aiming to establish bases of operation and cleanse neighborhoods. For AQI, the objective was to intimidate Shia living in Baghdad and destabilize the first Shia Iraqi government in the nation's modern history. To this end, Zarqawi formally announced the creation of the Umar Brigades on July 5th, although it is likely that they were operating before the announcement. The brigades were named after the second caliph, Umar, who, in a symbolic reference to the contemporary struggle against Iran, had conquered Persia and spread Islam through South Asia. Virulently anti-Shia and anti-Iranian, they began targeting Badr Corps leaders and Shia civilians in Baghdad and Anbar, successfully assassinating Badr commanders Kari al-Amri and Adel Khosk Khabar. Using sophisticated media campaigns that created a strategy for each major city in Anbar province, the brigades were largely successful in harnessing Sunni fear and painting Zarqawi as the defender of Iraq's Sunni population. Shia militias from Jaish al-Mahdi, or JAM, and Badr responded to AQI's violence with their own attacks as a way to cement their hard-won political gains, protect their own neighborhoods, and extend their influence and control. Often, these sectarian elements first threaten civilians of rival sects, pressuring them to move. When intimidation failed, they quietly resorted to violence to achieve their objectives. One resident of the primarily Sunni neighborhood of Amaria described how the initial phases of the sectarian infiltration occurred. Quote, In 2005, we began to see how insurgents, al-Qaeda, were taking root in the gangs roaming Amaria. The first sign that al-Qaeda was moving into our area was the graffiti. Then, one of the mosques in the area known for its sectarian leanings became a gathering point for those of the al-Qaeda mindset. That was when this new ideology began emerging in the neighborhood. People started saying that Shiites were infidels. Many of my Shiite neighbors fled then. End quote. Shia militias, both Jaish al-Mahdi and the Badr Corps, were using strikingly similar tactics in other mixed neighborhoods of Baghdad and North Babil. Saman Dlaur Hussein, a Sunni who lived on the sectarian border between the Baghdad neighborhoods of Mansur and Washash, described how the Jaish al-Mahdi militia moved in. Quote, Everything started to change for the worse, around the beginning of 2005. The troubles started with three suicide car bombs in Washash. Then we started to hear stories about how the Mahdi army was forcing Sunni families to leave Washash. There was no killing during this time that we knew of, no murdering of Sunni families. Sunnis were being made to leave Washash under threat, but widespread murders were not happening yet. As the neighborhoods around Baghdad split along sectarian lines, it became difficult to move around the city because of the checkpoints set up by insurgents and militias. A lot of my classmates began dying in their neighborhoods. End quote. The sectarian gangs often disposed of their victims' bodies in the Tigris River, resulting in scores of bodies being recovered each month downstream of Baghdad at Salman Pak and Suwaira, as had potentially been the case with the Madain hostages. Despite the level of terror, the violence was controlled. Acts of intimidation were usually methodically planned and often covert. 
On both sides, functioning organizations managed the violence, preventing it from becoming chaotic and uncontainable. The developments were not just a Sunni-Shia affair. As the sectarian violence escalated and rival militias and extra-governmental armed organizations began to propagate, Kurdish parties also recognized what was happening and became more overt in expanding their own extra-governmental security apparatus, which had existed as a failsafe to prevent another genocide. In July 2005, Talibani began to establish an official all-Kurd presidential security brigade outside of the Iraqi security forces. Even though Casey sent a formal letter strongly warning him against the move, Talibani went ahead with the formation of the unit, based in his presidential compound in Baghdad's Karada neighborhood. With ethno-sectarian armed groups, both official and unofficial, springing up across the map, Baghdad was becoming an armed camp. MNFI had assessed that violence would spike during the volatile period while the government was forming and then die down. However, as the new government took office and attacks remained high, MNFI was slow to appreciate its true sectarian nature and depth. Even so, MNFI leaders intuitively knew that something had changed. In an April video conference with Secretary of Defense or SecDef Donald Rumsfeld, Casey had acknowledged the escalating trend and added that, quote, the feel is different, end quote, without being able to articulate the shifting character of the conflict. At the same time, however, the MNFI commander optimistically noted that the violence was still below the levels that prevailed before Iraq had regained its sovereignty, and that Iraqi security forces continued to grow significantly in size. Despite the rosy statistics, Casey's intuition was correct. The conflict was undergoing a tectonic shift, morphing from an insurgency to a sectarian conflict. Al-Qaeda's Car Bomb Offensive To this already bitterly toxic sectarian environment, AQI added a massive car bomb campaign in Baghdad that exceeded in size or scope all of its previous campaigns. In the mind of Zarqawi, the formation of the Jafari government and the handing over of the reins of power to Shia apostates was caused to launch an offensive against Baghdad's Shia civilian population. Determined to incite civil war, Zarqawi employed tactics that were distinct from the more secular Sunni resistance organizations in their nihilistic violence, killing hundreds of innocents by design to achieve his overall objective. With the ascendancy of Zarqawi and al-Qaeda in Iraq, a sea change had quietly taken place in the war. The focus of the Sunni insurgency was no longer on expelling the, quote, occupying forces, end quote, but on killing Iraqis, specifically apostate Shia, in support of Zarqawi's goal of starting an apocalyptic sectarian civil war in Iraq and beyond. Describing Zarqawi's blind hatred of the Shia, one coalition analyst noted that, quote, if he had gas chambers and ovens, he would be throwing the Shia in them, end quote. Years later, while imprisoned as coalition detainees, some of Zarqawi's senior lieutenants described the AQI leader's desire to incite a global sectarian war by comparing him to the Joker, Heath Ledger's character in the 2008 movie The Dark Knight, whose central desire was, quote, to watch the world burn, end quote. It was to this end that the Jordanian launched the car bomb campaign and infiltrated extremists into Baghdad neighborhoods. The spike in these attacks in the capital during the period surrounding Jafari's swearing-in was striking. During the 13-day continuous surge in activity that lasted from the end of April until May 11th, AQI carried out 79 car bomb attacks against primarily Shia targets. On the last day, Baghdad endured nine such assaults that killed 112. By the end of May, the number of bombings reached 142, the highest monthly total for 2005. In June, the bombings and sectarian violence continued unabated, resulting in the deaths of 1,347 Iraqi civilians, the most since the invasion phase of the war. On July 15th, Baghdad was hit by eight car bombs in a 24-hour span. The next day in Musaib, 56 kilometers south of Baghdad, a single suicide bomber killed over 100 and wounded 150 more destroying 150 shops and a Shia mosque when his device set off a nearby propane tanker. 
The majority of these suicide bombers were foreigners. Saudis and Kuwaitis were chosen, often personally, by Zarqawi. After their selection, they were ensconced in a safe house with four to five other bombers as the car bomb itself was constructed, separated from others and fed a daily diet of religious readings and diatribes to strengthen their resolve. The isolation also offered AQI the opportunity to videotape their, quote, suicide statement, end quote, which was a critical element in the deadly cycle of recruiting new bombers. As the bombings continued throughout the summer, a pall of fear hung over Baghdad. For Baghdad residents, simply leaving home to shop or run errands became a risky proposition because a car bomb or suicide bomber could strike public areas at any moment. The sense of fear was especially strong on public transportation because of the predilection of suicide bombers for targeting the city's buses, and because most Iraqis had no other transportation option. One Baghdad resident recalled that, quote, Many buses were a target for bombings during the bad period, and we were always reminding each other to stay off the crowded ones. The idea was that a bomber would probably not waste explosives on a minibus carrying few people, so if your bus pulls up and it's packed... Better to wait for the next one in the hope that it is less crowded. End quote. This pervasive sense of dread was an indicator that the sectarian violence was rapidly becoming self perpetuating. AQI and the Sunni insurgents launched car bomb and kidnapping forays into Shia neighborhoods, while Jaysh al Mahdi and other Shia militias continued their campaigns of intimidation, violence, and sectarian cleansing against Sunnis. At the same time, many Iraq special police units conducted a campaign of illegal arrests, torture, and execution of Sunnis. By midsummer, sectarian killings of all types had reached unprecedented highs, with the Baghdad morgue recording 1,100 violent deaths in July. A full 900 of the victims showed evidence of some type of torture or execution, such as cigarette burns, hands tied and bullet in the head, or power tool wounds. During this critical period of governmental transition and sectarian horrors, the U.S. Embassy lacked an ambassador. Ambassador John Negroponte had departed Iraq on March 17th after being selected by President George W. Bush to serve as the first director of national intelligence. Serving in his place, the charge d'affaires, Ambassador James Jeffrey, was a career foreign service officer who had served as an infantry officer in Vietnam and had been deputy chief of mission during the turbulent transition from Coalition Provisional Authority, or CPA, to the embassy. Jeffrey was highly capable, but was an interim leader of America's diplomatic efforts who had to manage two portfolios, as well as navigate relationships with some Iraqis who were circumspect and restrained in their relations with the embassy, until the new ambassador arrived. Coalition Response in Anbar and Nineveh Page 414 Re-establishing Control of the Western Border While the overall level of sectarian bloodshed did not alter MNFI's new transition plans, the size and scope of al-Qaeda in Iraq's suicide car bombing campaign led to extensive deliberations on how best to stop the attacks. In June, Casey began to suspect that the car bomb campaign was threatening the legitimacy of the Iraqi government and thus the coalition's center of gravity because AQI's ability to bomb targets with impunity created the perception that the government was incapable of protecting its citizens. Casey also feared that the bombings could unhinge the October constitutional referendum and December parliamentary elections, effectively derailing the coalition's campaign plan. Major General Richard P. Zahner, MNFI's Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence, commented, quote, We had days of 17-plus VBIED operations in Baghdad, and the question really boiled down to at what point were the Shia going to cease exercising restraint in the face of an extraordinarily violent campaign, end quote. The question was an apt one. Even for the most restrained Shia community leaders, patience was running out. On July 16th, Grand Ayatollah Sistani, who previously urged the Shia not to retaliate violently against the sectarian attacks, began calling on the Jafari government to, quote, defend the country against mass annihilation, end quote. 
worried that an end to Shia patience could lead to sectarian reprisals against Sunnis that in turn could threaten the upcoming elections, coalition leaders began exploring how to stem the tide of bombings. The vital components of the car bombs were following two infiltration routes, or rat lines, that originated in Syria, MNFI and Multinational Corps Iraq, or MNCI analysts determined. They also believed that the vast majority of the suicide car bomb drivers were foreign fighters who had to infiltrate along these routes because Iraqis were purportedly less willing to participate in suicide operations. These factors led Casey to conclude that targeting the infiltration routes and the foreign jihadist car bombers who used them could be decisive for stopping the wave of attacks in central Iraq. By re-establishing control of Iraq's western borders, Casey believed the coalition would cut both infiltration routes into Anbar and Nineveh provinces, thereby preventing the bombings. The first infiltration route crossed near the border town of al Qaim in Anbar province and followed the Euphrates River Valley past Haditha, Ramadi, Fallujah, and into Baghdad. The second originated along historic desert smuggling routes in western Nineveh province near the town of Sinjar, traveled east through Tel Afar to Mosul, then followed the Tigris River Valley south through Salahuddin province into the Baghdad region. Casey's and Zahner's judgment that the main security problem was externally driven aligned with the public narrative of many senior Iraqi leaders. Senior officials, such as National Security Advisor Mawafik Rubai, charged that Iraq's violence stemmed not from internal strife, but from foreign powers who sent suicide terrorists into Iraq to thwart the political ascendancy of Iraqi Shia and Kurds. Most of the internal fighting these Iraqi leaders contended was merely a response to this foreign intervention. At any rate, the belief that the foreign-facilitated car bomb network constituted the greatest threat to the coalition's objectives represented a shift in MNFI's perceptions. Before June, MNFI had considered former regime elements intent on derailing the political process to be its principal enemy. But as the number of car bombs increased, MNFI leaders came to the conclusion that foreign fighters and terrorists, especially Zarqawi's AQI, were the greatest danger to the coalition campaign. Despite this considerable change in threat assessment, MNFI leaders saw the sectarian attacks as tactical moves best answered by repositioning coalition tactical forces rather than by altering the plan to transition responsibility to the Iraqi security forces. On June 23rd, Casey reported to Rumsfeld that, quote, the nature of the insurgency has not changed in a way that invalidates our strategy or places our campaign plan at unacceptable risk, end quote. Still describing the insurgency somewhat monolithically, Casey's report also sanguinely judged that, quote, insurgents will retain sufficient popular support to sustain operations. Intimidation will have limited effects, but will not increase popular support to the insurgency. Attacks against civilians will continue, but will not prevent growing optimism and support for the political process, end quote. The report concluded with the optimistic statement, quote, support for the government is growing, end quote. In retrospect, it appears that MNFI saw the transformation of the insurgency in 2005 as a change in management rather than an alteration in aims or ideology. Thus, MNFI officials failed to address Zarqawi's plan, known to the coalition since his correspondence had been captured in early 2004, to ignite a sectarian civil war, even as the sectarian situation in central Iraq grew more combustible. Syria's Role the idea that the coalition needed to re-establish control of the border was also a tacit recognition of the role that Syria was playing in the conflict. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad provided open sanctuary to foreign jihadists and Iraqi insurgents and even assisted them on their way to the border. One striking example of this was the Syrian regime's support to Izzat Ibrahim al-Duri, the former deputy leader of Saddam's Ba'athist regime, to whom the Assad regime supplied weapons via Syria's intelligence services. Duri had seen the shifting political sands within the insurgency and had become a de facto ally of Zarqawi and al-Qaeda in Iraq, using his former Iraqi intelligence service contacts to smuggle the Syrian weapons across the border. To leverage the former Ba'athist infrastructure fully, Duri told former Ba'athists that they would be reinstated to senior positions when the Ba'ath returned to power. 
while Assad, a leader of the Shia minority Alawite sect, gave sanctuary to Sunni jihadists that would normally be his arch enemies, the jihadists returned the favor. For jihadists such as Al Qaeda in Iraq, ignoring the Alawite, quote, apostate, end quote, ruling Syria gave them the freedom to infiltrate Iraq easily with foreign fighters, weapons, and supplies. The route had become so important that by the summer of 2005, news correspondents had begun calling the upper Euphrates River Valley, quote, Iraq's Ho Chi Minh Trail, end quote, as a way to explain its importance. A senior Sunni insurgent known as Abu Ahmed later recalled, quote, All the foreigners I knew got into Iraq that way. It was no secret, end quote. MNFI's intelligence analysts estimated that 100 to 125 foreign fighters entered Iraq each month through the Euphrates River Valley route. Most foreign fighters entered Syria by flying into the Damascus airport. From there, facilitators from local mosques would transport them to safe houses. The volunteers would then be assessed for their skills, with experienced fighters sent quickly across the border while raw recruits entered training camps. At the camps, the recruits learned military skills and took classes on Iraqi dialect and customs in order to assimilate better into the Iraqi population. When the fighters were ready to enter Iraq, they used two main infiltration routes from Syria into Iraq, both of which MNFI had correctly identified. In the north, they would enter through the Tel Kushik border crossing or back roads near Shadadi or Kamishli. Once inside Iraq, Fighters who had shown less promise went through a second training cycle near Biaj, while experienced fighters proceeded to Tel Afar, or Mosul. A southern route passed through Albu Kamal, through Al-Wadid, or across the vast expanses of the Jazira Desert north of the Euphrates, before moving on to Al-Qa'im, Ramadi, or Baghdad. For the Assad regime, support to Iraq's Sunni insurgency was a way to regain leverage against the United States at a time when the Syrian military was being ousted from Lebanon by the U.S.-backed Cedar Revolution. Allowing Salafi fighters to enter Iraq through Syrian territory would help keep the United States off balance, while perhaps preventing Iraq from becoming a U.S. ally from which attacks against Syria could be launched. The mission was important enough that senior regime officials headed by Bashar al-Assad's own brother-in-law, Asaf Shawkat, were directly involved in facilitating foreign fighters into Iraq. Helping jihadists flow into Iraq also served as a relief valve for the Syrian regime's own domestic Sunni opposition. Each Syrian jihadist killed across the border equaled one fewer problem the regime might have to contend with in the future. Providing official support and transportation to the jihadists also enabled Assad's security services to identify and track individuals and groups in Syria's domestic opposition, cataloging them for potential future use. Because disrupting the insurgent sanctuary inside Syria was beyond the authority and means of the operational commanders in Iraq, Casey worked with General John Abizade at U.S. Central Command, or CENTCOM, and senior U.S. officials in Washington to address the problem. Abizade, who recognized the extent of Syrian regime involvement, argued in a July 2005 letter to Rumsfeld, quote, We must send a clear message that they, Syria, will either secure their borders to include insurgent flow in and out, or we will do it for them, end quote. To achieve this end, Abizade proposed several options, including armed reconnaissance into Syrian airspace, using ground forces to strike Syrian targets of opportunity while in hot pursuit of insurgents retreating across the border, and a naval show of force in the eastern Mediterranean. While reviewing these options, CENTCOM officers assessed that 65-75% to 75 of the foreign fighters entering Iraq came through Syria, with Damascus as a, quote, funnel point for foreign fighter entry to Syria. End quote. They further noted, quote, Restricting the flow of foreign fighters on a 600-kilometer eastern border is difficult. We must focus on Damascus as the entry point. End quote. Accordingly, Abizaid and General Richard B. Myers, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, proposed to Rumsfeld that the United States bomb the Damascus airport to stem the flow of foreign fighters and to send a signal short of invasion that Syria should stop supporting the infiltration routes. The two generals believed that even if Syria did not comply, damaging the airport could effectively shut down the foreign fighter pipeline fueling Zarqawi's car bomb campaign. Though Rumsfeld did not endorse the military leader's suggestion, 
At a higher level, the National Security Council was also exploring options for the Syria problem. One course of action discussed at both deputies and principals meetings in the summer of 2005 was that of conducting, quote, regime change, end quote, against the Assad government. But, as with the Damascus airport proposal and other coercive actions, U.S. leaders ultimately rejected the idea. As a result, the strategic problem of the Syrian sanctuary was effectively left for Casey and MNFI to manage. The Casey Vines Dispute While there was general agreement at the strategic and operational levels about how foreign fighters were entering Iraq, there was considerable disagreement on how best to respond to the threat. In particular, the MNFI and MNCI commanders disagreed on how to interdict the two infiltration routes and ultimately turn the tide of the bombings in Baghdad. Casey believed that the geographic center of gravity for the campaign had shifted to the Iraqi-Syrian border in Ninawa and Anbar provinces. As such, he believed that there should be an operational-level restructuring of forces to reflect the changed priority, with additional combat power shifted to the border. In his view, waiting until the explosives, suicide bombers, and other key components of the car bombs arrived in Baghdad amounted to acting too late. By contrast, Vines believed that the operational focus should remain in Baghdad and its environs. Quote, There was an area of healthy tension between MNFI and MNCI headquarters about the nature of the threat and what to do about it, end quote, he recalled. Quote, There was an argument about whether re-establishing control of the borders was to be part of our main effort, center of gravity, or a decisive point, because there were a lot of resources that were going to have to be committed, end quote. From the MNCI commander's perspective, the border zone was a huge, porous area that would require massive amounts of combat power to control, something the shortage of coalition forces would make difficult to achieve. Vines judged that a push to the border would require more than two brigades worth of combat power, 80% of the coalition's engineer assets, and 70% of its tactical transportation assets. Rather than committing so many forces to the border area, he favored focusing intelligence resources on that region, especially the increasing amounts of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, or ISR, becoming available in the form of unmanned aerial vehicles. Coalition ISR platforms could identify the car bombers at the border and then track them to the belts of Baghdad, which Vines described as, quote, support zones, end quote, using classic insurgency terminology. Because the threat had to consolidate in the belts before launching attacks into the city, he believed it was more effective and economical to track the enemy combatants there and then strike before they could execute their attacks. Vines was not alone in his judgment. At MNSTCI, General David Petraeus was aware of the differing views and believed that Vines was right. For Petraeus, it made little sense to shift significant forces from the center of the country to the border in hopes of disrupting the insurgency because, quote, the bad guys were already inside the wire, end quote, in central Iraq. Removing troops from the center amounted to uncovering insurgent contested territory, the MNSTCI commander believed. Marine leaders in MNFW also were reluctant to move forces to the border and argued that securing the populated areas closer to Baghdad encompassing Ramadi, Fallujah, and Habaniya was more important for the holding of successful elections in the fall of 2005. This disagreement resulted in miscommunication and inter-service friction. With the Marines reluctant to internally retask their forces and move them west, MNFI was unable to force the issue. The friction with MNFW only served to further cloud the way forward between Casey and Vines, essentially delaying an eventual confrontation over the border initiative. After a multi-week delay by MNCI in moving forces west, Casey realized the disconnect and clarified his intent with Vines. By that time, the disagreement had become intense. Vines felt so strongly that the diversion of resources from Baghdad to the border was a mistake that he asked Casey to provide the order in writing. Convinced his strategy was correct, Casey overruled Vines, and MNCI began planning to move forces west to restore control of the Iraqi-Syrian border. Bad to worse in Anbar 
When coalition officers began to write the specifics of the plan to reestablish control of Iraq's western border, they had to face the hard reality that the tactical and operational approaches used in Anbar were not working. The security situation in the province in general, and at the border specifically, had deteriorated significantly since the end of 2004 and the withdrawal of the forces that had conducted Operation Al-Fajr in Fallujah. By April, Al-Qaeda in Iraq had regenerated after its losses in Fallujah and MNFW's disruption campaign. Because of new AQI offensives, Hit, Haditha, and Rawa effectively fell to AQI control. In Hit, Al-Qaeda in Iraq established Sharia courts, took control of government offices, and used profits from commandeered gas stations to help finance operations. In Haditha, insurgents took over a defunct government power station and used it as a bomb factory and foreign fighter safe house. One hundred insurgents openly paraded through Rawa daily and used the local water treatment plant as their headquarters. Al Qaim also fell in April, after which Zarqawi declared it the new capital of Iraq and made it his headquarters. To make Al Qaim a symbol of what life would be like under an Islamic state, of his making, Zarqawi set up Sharia courts, implemented Islamic law and punishments, and took over mosques to ensure they preached his orthodoxy. Religious police patrolled the streets to ensure men were cutting their hair and growing their beards, and the town hall flew the green flags of an Islamic state instead of Iraq's flag. To a degree, Zarqawi's shift west was a result of pressure from Mohammed Mahmoud Latif and Ramadi-based insurgent groups that had decided to explore joining the Iraqi political process. The counterbalance that Latif and the Ramadi Shura Council provided against the eastward expansion of AQI was temporarily upset in May when coalition forces arrested Mohammed Daham, a key ally of Latif on the council. With Daham arrested, Latif changed course and opened discussions on realigning the Shura Council with AQI. The temporary realignment would not last, however, as Latif and Zarqawi's perspectives on the future of Iraq and the route to achieving that vision were simply irreconcilable. Despite internal disagreements among the Sunni insurgent groups, the insurgent position across Anbar province was strong in relation to the coalition. Demonstrating their strength, on April 11th, AQI fighters launched a sophisticated attack against Camp Gannon, a marine outpost located in Kuseba on the Syrian border. The attackers used three successive explosive-laden transports driven by suicide bombers, each designed to breach farther into the compound. The first was a sport utility vehicle, the second a dump truck with welded-on armor, and the third a fire truck so heavily laden with explosives that it blew up in a mushroom cloud with effects felt 16 kilometers away. The vehicles were followed by an assault force of nearly 100 insurgents, leading to a battle that lasted 24 hours and required fixed and rotary wing airstrikes to put down the militants. Because of a lack of sufficient coalition combat power either to hold ground or to gain adequate situational awareness, many of MNFW's operations during the spring and early summer of 2005 were more akin to raids in which Marine forces would clear an insurgent sanctuary and then leave. Colonel Stephen Davis, the Regimental Combat Team 2 commander responsible for Western Anbar province, explained that, because he only had four rifle companies, he was only able to conduct operations that would disrupt the insurgency. He later recalled, quote, I was trying to create the illusion of a greater force structure by showing up everywhere but nowhere, in order to not be predictable. End quote. Operations River Blitz, River Bridge, Matador, and New Market all fell into this category of temporarily disrupting only the insurgent activity. So little was known about the enemy situation that part of the mission of the 1st Marine Division during Operation River Blitz was to, quote, conduct offensive operations in Al-Anbar province to disrupt anti-Iraqi forces, or AIF, defeat AIF elements, and generate intelligence in order to set the conditions for Operation River Bridge, end quote. On May 9th, Operation Matador was different from the other operations in that it struck Ramana on the north side of the Euphrates River. During the battle, an army engineer unit built a ribbon bridge across the river under enemy fire, the first time since the Korean War, while marine amphibious vehicles swam the Euphrates to secure the far side of the bridge site. 
Despite fighting that left nine coalition troops killed and 39 wounded, as well as 144 insurgents killed and 40 detained, all of the coalition forces that conducted the operation returned to their garrisons less than a week later, effectively ceding Ramana back to the insurgency. Many Marines were intensely frustrated by this operational approach, with one officer later describing their technique as, quote, We cleared and abandoned, cleared and abandoned. End quote. This operational disruption approach was neither effective in keeping AQI and other Sunni insurgents off balance, nor in preventing them from successfully attacking high value targets among the coalition's partners. On May 12th, Zarqawi's men managed to kidnap Anbar governor Raja Nawaf Farhan al Mahalawi along with his son and some of his supporters. The governor's body was discovered in Rawa nearly three weeks later in the aftermath of a battle between U.S. forces and insurgents. Because of Farhan's position within the Albu Mahal tribe, his death reignited the long standing hostilities between AQI and the Albu Mahal, with the tribe again looking for vengeance against Zarqawi's group. Worse yet, the disruption approach had a series of unintended consequences. In some cases, AQI insurgents fled to other, more remote areas of Anbar that had been untouched by extremism, spreading the insurgency like a malignant cancer as they went. During operations in Hit, Haditha, and Ramadi, Al-Qaeda in Iraq and other insurgents left temporarily but returned as soon as coalition forces departed and targeted Iraqi civilians who had cooperated with the coalition. One group of Syrian foreign fighters went house to house in March offering those who had committed the, quote, crime, end quote, of allowing coalition forces into their homes a choice between being killed or joining the insurgency for a monthly salary that was twice that of an Iraqi policeman. However, the disruption operations did reveal to MNFW and its higher headquarters the degree to which Western Iraq had been taken over by Al-Qaeda in Iraq. When coalition forces battled disciplined fighters wearing paramilitary fatigue uniforms and body armor, the insurgents demonstrated tactics and capabilities that coalition forces had not previously seen. This knowledge provided further impetus for MNFI to take bold action on the border. End of Chapter 16, Part 1 Going West, April to August 2005 Read by Adam Cable Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 2021. Chapter 16, Part 2. Going West. April to August 2005. Of The U.S. Army in the Iraq War, Volume 1. By U.S. Army Operation Iraqi Freedom Study Group. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adam Cable. Chapter 16, Part 2 Going West, April to August 2005 The Western Euphrates River Valley, or WERV, Campaign Realizing that the level of resources that had been available in Anbar province for the first half of 2005 was insufficient, MNCI flowed reinforcements westward to meet Casey's intent. MNFW received three additional army battalions, taken from three separate commands, as MNCI did not have an uncommitted operational reserve, considerable army intelligence assets, and even the 13th Marine Expeditionary Unit, CENTCOM's theater reserve. The arrival of the additional combat power would allow Regimental Combat Team 2, the subordinate marine element that had responsibility for Area of Operations Atlanta in western Anbar province, to consolidate its forces closer to the border and increase the tempo of its operations. From the Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force, or CJSOTF, an entire company, one of only nine in the country at the time, moved from Kirkuk to Anbar, accompanied by a Navy Sea, Air, and Land Teams, or SEAL, task unit, representing the first special forces returning to Anbar in nearly a year. Before the arrival of these additional forces, only a single regimental combat team of 3,200 Marines and sailors had held the westernmost districts of Anbar province, a battle space of about 77,700 square kilometers, equal in size to the state of South Carolina. By the time all of the reinforcements arrived in the early fall, more than 14,000 coalition troops were occupying the same area. 
As these forces concentrated, MNCI planned Operation Say Aid, or Hunter, more commonly called WERV by the Marines, focusing on re-establishing control of Al-Qaim and Haditha. The operation also envisioned that the Marines would push east near Ramadi as a hammer against the anvil of the 3rd Infantry Division in Baghdad. As MNCI and MNFI drew up the details of Operation Say Aid, a challenge emerged north of the Euphrates that had first materialized during Operation Matador. Originally, the Marines and Multinational Forces West, or MNFW, had responsibility for both sides of the river, with the boundary between their area of operations and Multinational Brigade Northwest, or MNBNW, lying north of the river. However, a lack of bridging assets made it, quote, extraordinarily dangerous, end quote, in Vines's words, for the Marines to consistently operate north of the river. As a result, MNFW had limited its presence and operations there, meaning that the territory along the Syrian border north of the Euphrates River but south of Tel Afar in Nineveh province had become an open seam between the two coalition commands. For all intents and purposes, the vast Jazeera Desert region, an area with a rich smuggling history, had been left virtually undefended against incursions from Syria. After a considerable internal debate, MNCI closed the gap by shifting the boundary between MNFW and MNBNW south and assigning MNBNW responsibility for the north bank of the Euphrates. This decision, based on MNCI's inability to convince MNFW to reposition forces internally, created significant discord among the coalition commanders because it meant that MNBNW had to move some of its already limited combat power hundreds of kilometers away from its original area of responsibility and stretch its extended span of command and control even farther. Simply resupplying the forces in the new sector from Mosul would require over seven hours of driving each way. The boundary change, however, did enable MNFW to focus its combat power over a smaller area and push additional forces to the Syrian border from Fallujah and Ramadi. As Task Force Freedom took up its expanded battle space in MNBNW, MNCI ordered Major General David M. Rodriguez's command to establish a combat outpost in the desert roughly 30 kilometers northeast of the town of Rawa by July 15th. It was a location theoretically optimal for patrolling roads on the north side of the Euphrates River and running interdiction missions into the empty Jazeera desert space between the two major routes from Syria. Given the size of the area to be covered, Rodriguez and Task Force Freedom ordered the 1st Brigade 25th Infantry Division, a striker brigade, in Mosul to send its reconnaissance squadron with an attached infantry company to establish the new outpost. After establishing Combat Outpost Rawa, the soldiers began patrolling the towns along the north side of the river and realized their fears of finding an insurgent sanctuary were well-founded. When the Reconnaissance, Surveillance, and Target Acquisition, or RSTA squadron, first entered Rawa, it had to fight its way into town, enduring two dozen improvised explosive device, or IED, attacks and eight suicide car bombs in its first month after arriving. At MNFI's request, other special operations forces also supported Casey's operational surge into Anbar as part of the WERV campaign. Combat elements were pushed west to the newly cleared outpost at Rawa, along with additional enablers, support assets, and rotary wing assets, all aimed at disrupting the flow of foreign fighters and targeting key leaders. The increased assets included the significant deployment of a new battalion that had served as a strategic reserve in the United States and required authorization by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for commitment to Iraq. In a change from normal command relationships that regularly had special operations forces working to support conventional forces, MNCI instead designated the assigned special operations headquarters at Combat Outpost Rawa as the supported element, with some Army and Marine conventional forces in support. Support from conventional forces included ISR, strikers, a company of Apache attack helicopters, a multiple launch rocket system battery, and a platoon-sized quick reaction force. The 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment to Nineveh Province As part of his operational plan to re-establish control of the Iraqi-Syrian border, in May, Vines ordered all but one squadron of the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment to reposition from southern Baghdad to Nineveh province. 
While the move of the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment to Ninawa represented a northern complement to the WERV campaign that aimed to shut down the foreign fighter infiltration route that passed through Sinjar and Mosul, it also was a tacit recognition of the under-resourcing of MNB and W. The move also highlighted the turbulence of forces that was a byproduct of not having an operational reserve. The 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment's repositioning came a mere three months after it had assumed responsibility for its original battle space in the infamous Triangle of Death area encompassing the towns of Yusufia, Mahmudia, and Lutufia, south of Baghdad. The addition of these forces effectively doubled the combat power in Ninawa province, and MNBNW was temporarily renamed MNFNW. Task Force Freedom then assigned the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment the mission of pacifying the town of Tel Afar and the terrain beyond the town to the Syrian border, including Sinjar and the border town of Rabia. At the same time, the unit was tasked to block insurgent infiltration from Syria. The new concentration of combat power allowed Task Force Freedom to focus its remaining brigade, 1st Brigade 25th Infantry Division, on Mosul. The Zarqawi Zawahiri Dispute Just as the coalition had experienced considerable internal debate and disagreement over how to respond properly to Al Qaeda in Iraq's operational moves, AQI experienced similar discord with its professed headquarters of Al Qaeda's senior leaders in Pakistan over what constituted the most appropriate strategy. Zarqawi's tendencies to use unrestrained violence and to target Iraq's Shia population deeply worried al-Qaeda's senior leaders. While unafraid to massacre civilians when it served their purposes, al-Qaeda's central leaders generally made cautious, almost business-like calculations before launching attacks to maximize their effectiveness and achieve the desired intent. By contrast, Zarqawi seemed to be driven by a deeply held theological hatred of the Shia, a reckless style that many in al-Qaeda's senior levels were coming to believe was counterproductive. It was this style that prompted Ayman al-Zawahiri, thought to be the intellectual brains of al-Qaeda, to write Zarqawi a letter on July 9th, warning him that he had gone operationally off track and asking him to get back on course. In the letter, Zawahiri expressed concern that the violence and sectarian strife that Zarqawi sowed endangered his movement's popular support in Iraq and neighboring countries. Quote, If we are in agreement that the victory of Islam and the establishment of a caliphate in the manner of the Prophet will not be achieved except through jihad against the apostate rulers and their removal, then this goal will not be accomplished by the Mujahid movement while it is cut off from popular support. In the absence of this popular support, the Islamic Mujahid movement would be crushed in the shadows. End quote. To avoid losing this popular support, Zawahiri counseled Zarqawi that, quote, the Mujahid movement must avoid any action that the masses do not understand or approve if there is no contravention of Sharia religious law in such avoidance and as long as there are other options to resort to, end quote. Zawahiri specifically criticized Zarqawi's practices of beheading hostages and attacking Shia Muslims, which the al-Qaeda leader believed jeopardized the popular support he deemed so critical to al-Qaeda's broader efforts. Zawahiri was blunt in his challenge to Zarqawi's tactics, explaining that, quote, Among the things which the feelings of the Muslim populace who love and support you will never find palatable also are the scenes of slaughtering the hostages. You shouldn't be deceived by the praise of some of the zealous young men in their description of you as the sheikh of the slaughterers. They do not express the general view of the admirer and the supporter of the resistance in Iraq, and of you in particular. End quote. Zawahiri noted that while he believed the coalition used equally brutal tactics, citing the use of cluster bombs, depleted uranium, and the death of his own wife and daughter, Al-Qaeda should not bring itself to the same level for practical reasons. Al-Qaeda should not be governed by emotion in its responses, Zawahiri concluded, because at least half of the battle would be fought on the media battlefield, where maintaining popular support and the, quote, hearts and minds, end quote, of the Muslim community was paramount. On the topic of provoking a sectarian civil war, Zawahiri wrote that most Muslims had not come to realize that the Shia were apostates, and as a result, quote, 
Many of your Muslim admirers among the common folk are wondering about your attack on the Shia. The sharpness of this questioning increases when the attacks are on one of their mosques, and it increases more when the attacks are on the mausoleum of Imam Ali bin Abi Talib, may God honor him. End quote. Attacking the Shia, Zawahiri warned, quote, won't be acceptable to the Muslim population, however much you have tried to explain it. End quote. Mirroring Abizaid's counsel not to provoke a fight with Shia militants in early 2004, Zawahiri warned Zarqawi that starting a civil war with the Shia was folly because it amounted to the opening of a second unnecessary front when AQI was already fully committed in its fight to eject the coalition. Emphasizing the difficulties associated with opening such a second front, Zawahiri rhetorically asked Zarqawi, quote, Can the Mujahideen kill all of the Shia in Iraq? Has any Islamic state in history ever tried that? What loss will befall us if we did not attack the Shia? End quote. He also questioned why Zarqawi would want to openly publicize making war against the Shia and claim responsibility for such attacks, noting that doing so, quote, compels the Iranians to take countermeasures, end quote, which could endanger the de facto Iranian al-Qaeda non-aggression pact. Pointing out that Iran held over 100 al-Qaeda leaders in custody, Zawahiri reasoned, quote, We and the Iranians need to refrain from harming each other at this time in which the Americans are targeting us, end quote. Zawahiri also addressed the topic of the overall objectives of the Iraqi jihad and how they should be achieved. First, Zawahiri reaffirmed the centrality of the campaign in Iraq for al-Qaeda's global strategy and instructed Zarqawi that his ultimate objective should be re-establishing the caliphate in the country. He wrote, quote, The victory of Islam will never take place until a Muslim state is established in the manner of the Prophet in the heart of the Islamic world, specifically in the Levant, Egypt, and the neighboring states of the peninsula and Iraq. End quote. Yet, as a first step, Zawahiri counseled, Zarqawi's primary near-term objective should be expelling coalition forces from Iraq. Declaring the return of the caliphate too early was unwise, Zawahiri judged, because it might bring stronger external opposition against al-Qaeda in Iraq. Instead, Zawahiri argued that an emirate should be established in Iraq, but only after American forces had withdrawn. The Al-Qaeda emirate should be allowed to grow and strengthen before the declaration of an Islamic state and the return of the caliphate. Despite the warnings from Zawahiri, Zarqawi continued along the same path, barely altering his tactics. The disagreements between Al-Qaeda's senior leadership hiding in Afghanistan and Pakistan and its more violent Iraqi offshoot would persist until relations between the two groups would finally fracture in 2014. Targeting of the New Government and the International Presence Over the summer and early fall of 2005, Iraq's internal security situation deteriorated, with elected officials attacked by rival factions intent on affecting the future government and enhancing the power of their own ethno-sectarian groups. Zarqawi's operatives and other Sunni insurgent groups continued to assassinate and intimidate government leaders and Shia religious leaders as a way to undermine the legitimacy of the new Shia government, but rival Shia organizations and Iranian proxies also joined in the violence. On April 18th, two days before an attempted assassination of Alawi, insurgents assassinated Major General Adnan Karagoli, a senior advisor to the defense minister, in his home in southern Baghdad. On July 1st, Gunmen killed a senior aide to Grand Ayatollah Sistani in a drive-by shooting outside a Baghdad mosque. On the same day, a car bomb struck the offices of Prime Minister Jafari, killing one Iraqi. Also on that day, a mortar attack against a government-run power station caused a water plant to shut down, leaving millions of Baghdad residents without running water in 100-degree temperatures. Lower-level government officials were targeted as well, with 83 mid-ranking officials assassinated from the start of the year until the end of June, and reported acts of intimidation against Iraqi police increased 73% over the same period. Intimidation events of all classes skyrocketed in the fall as the elections approached, jumping from a generally consistent monthly average of approximately 70 events from March through August to 275 in September and nearly 400 in October. 
Attacks against weaker members of the coalition and supporters of the new Iraqi government persisted during the same period. On July 2nd, al-Qaeda operatives kidnapped and executed the new Egyptian ambassador shortly after his arrival in Iraq, making him the most senior hostage to be murdered since the start of the conflict. His killing was meant as a message to neighboring states that supporting the new Shia-led government would carry a price, even among those who normally had immunity. In the case of Egypt, the attempt to isolate the new Iraq from its neighbors was effective, as the Egyptians did not assign a new ambassador to Baghdad until 2009. A mere three days after the abduction of the Egyptian ambassador, gunmen attacked separate convoys carrying the senior diplomats for Bahrain and Pakistan, wounding the Bahraini diplomat and leading Pakistan to withdraw its ambassador. Sixteen days after those attacks, al-Qaeda in Iraq continued the tactic by abducting and eventually murdering two Algerian diplomats in Baghdad. On July 7th, Four terrorists inspired by the larger al-Qaeda movement detonated bombs on London's public transportation network, killing 52 and injuring over 700. While the bombers had no direct ties to al-Qaeda in Iraq, in pre-recorded videos aimed at the Western audience they described themselves as soldiers, praised Osama bin Laden, Zawahiri, and Zarqawi as heroes, and promised additional attacks that would, quote, continue and become stronger until you pulled your troops out of Afghanistan and Iraq. End quote. A second set of terrorists made a failed attempt at similar strikes in London two weeks later. These assaults were in keeping with Zawahiri's advice to Zarqawi to focus on expelling the coalition rather than focusing on the Shia, but, unlike many of the previous attacks on coalition countries, they did not buckle the British support for the mission. The Arrival of Ambassador Khalilzad on July 24th, the senior U.S. diplomat Zalmay Khalilzad arrived in Iraq to fill the ambassador's post that had been vacant for four months. Khalilzad was an Afghan-American Sunni Muslim who had served in senior Department of Defense, or DOD, and Department of State posts in various administrations. Prior to his appointment as ambassador to Iraq, he had served as the ambassador to Afghanistan, and his experiences there shaped his approach to Iraqi politics. In Afghanistan, he had become well-versed in the basic concepts of counterinsurgency and had broken new ground on collaboration between embassy and military commands, championing the concept of provincial reconstruction teams that focused on nation-building and economic development. Khalilzad also arrived with a Washington-endorsed mission of reversing the January Sunni boycott. Whereas Casey and other MNFI leaders believed Negroponte had slowed outreach to Sunnis in the crucial period before the January 2005 elections, Khalilzad arrived in July with an explicit mission of persuading Sunnis to join the political process in time for the constitutional referendum and the next round of parliamentary elections. Casey was predisposed to such outreach, and by July he had begun proposing to use engagement and non-lethal tools with Sunni rejectionists and insurgents who espoused the ideas of neither AQI nor the Ba'ath Party as a way of driving a wedge between different elements of the insurgency. Also during the summer, Bush had asked Casey to remain the MNFI commander for another year, until roughly June 2006, and the general agreed. These decisions resulted in the establishment of the sixth interagency team to head the coalition in Iraq since the fall of Saddam, slightly more than two years before. The Continuing Detention Problem, page 428. Roots of the Detention Problem. By mid-2005, the coalition's detention problems had begun to boil over again. A fundamental problem that had bedeviled the coalition from its earliest days was that the Fedayeen Saddam, insurgents, and militias that opposed the coalition did not neatly fit into any category under the Geneva Conventions. From an early stage, the coalition had decided to hold captured enemy fighters as civilian internees or security detainees addressed by the 4th Geneva Convention, rather than enemy prisoners of war covered under the 3rd Geneva Convention. That decision drove much of the coalition's subsequent detention policy because civilian internees were due considerable legal protections, including a review of their detention status every six months after capture. Based on a legal interpretation of the rules associated with civilian internees in the initial months of the war, the CPA had also established a requirement for an Iraqi-U.S. board called the Joint Detainee Committee 
to review detainees' status after 18 months of detention. Barring convincing evidence that detainees posed a security risk, it was assumed that detainees should be released after that review. Consequently, holding a detainee past 18 months required the approval of both the Iraqi Prime Minister and the MNFI commander. The requirement for this review did not change for the duration of the war. Another factor contributing to MNFI's detention problems was intense pressure from Rumsfeld to transfer detention responsibilities to Iraqi authorities as quickly as possible. His frustration with the fact that U.S. troops were still running the detention program in Iraq spurred him to send three snowflakes, short memoranda requiring action on the part of a DOD official, over a five-week period in February and March 2005, calling on Casey to expedite the transition. In his second snowflake, Rumsfeld was particularly blunt. Quote, We have to figure a way to get out of the Iraqi detainee business, he wrote. Iraq is a sovereign state with an elected government and must get arranged to take on these responsibilities of holding, interrogating, and trying their prisoners with relatively few exceptions. End quote. When told that developing a transition plan would take until early summer, he again pressed MNFI to speed the transfer of detainees, writing, quote, That is too long. I need something much faster, by mid-July at the latest. This ought to be a top planning and execution priority. End quote. Iraqi government leaders echoed Rumsfeld's views. Almost as soon as the coalition transferred sovereignty to the Iraqis in June 2004, Iraqi political leaders questioned why the coalition was conducting unilateral arrests of Iraqi citizens and sending them to detention centers not run by the Iraqi government. Demands to release prisoners became commonplace, with both Alawi and Jafari personally interceding with Casey on several occasions to obtain the release of relatives of constituents. For example, on April 11, 2005, Alawi wrote Casey in an attempt to take more control over the process. Quote, I would like to request that the detainee file be readdressed. There are numerous Iraqi suspects that have been apprehended during times of instability under the suspicion of involvement in terrorist or insurgent activities. However, these detainees have not yet been convicted of any crime and currently remain in an undefined form of detention. I consider this matter to be of the utmost importance and look forward to a briefing on how it is to be resolved in a timely manner. End quote. When these factors were paired with a rapidly expanding prison population, they produced a volatile cocktail. Rumsfeld's desire to transition the detention program to the Iraqis translated into a policy of little to no new prison construction, a decision that only exacerbated a rapidly developing overcrowding problem. That overcrowding, when combined with intense Iraqi political demands and the legal requirements of the Geneva Conventions, created tremendous pressure to release large numbers of detainees regularly. Those releases would create a rift between the tactical and operational level that would persist for the duration of the war. At the same time, the overcrowding would also lead to a loss of control within the camps, a problem that itself created further pressure for additional releases. Evidentiary Requirements and Review and Release Boards in the summer of 2004, MNFI had created Task Force 134, named after the building number of its headquarters, to handle the pressures on the detention system and to correct the problems that the Abu Ghraib scandal had brought to light. The new headquarters created regulations and policies to meet the legal requirements of the Geneva Conventions, to effectively manage the detention program, and to try to balance the demands from Washington and Baghdad. Some of these well-intentioned regulations created unintended burdens at the tactical level as they reshaped the military detention system into one resembling civilian law enforcement operations. By mid-2005, MNFI required two sworn witness statements or forensic evidence in order for units to detain an individual beyond 72 hours. For most units, this requirement was a substantial hurdle. Only a handful had conducted pre-deployment training with police forces on writing witness statements and collecting evidence. The quality of physical and testimonial evidence was uneven, resulting in some detainees ultimately being released. 
In 2005, Task Force 134 Commander Major General William H. Brandenburg tried to remedy the deficiency by sending a mobile training team to each brigade in Iraq, but transitioning combat soldiers to a new law enforcement-like paradigm was difficult. The new rules were meant to address concerns that some U.S. units tended to detain military-aged males in large dragnets not driven by specific intelligence, mockingly nicknamed block parties or roundups, as well as to set limits on how long detainees could be kept at each level. After initial capture, detainees could spend a maximum of 72 hours at a battalion or brigade detention facility and then either be moved to a division-level detention facility for up to 21 days or processed into one of the theater internment facilities. At each level, the detainee's arrest packet was reviewed, resulting in some detainees being released for insufficient evidence. Tactical units generally bristled at these requirements, with commanders objecting that the arbitrary timelines prevented them from exploiting intelligence obtained during interrogations, and that, once detainees were sent to theater internment facilities, units tended to receive no information about their further interrogations. MNFI and Task Force 134 officials countered that the timelines prevented potential detainee abuses by centralizing the process and simplifying oversight, and that information gained after the 72-hour time limit was often of little tactical value. Interrogations were conducted at the theater facilities in 2005, but lingering concerns from the Abu Ghraib abuses, coupled with the lack of resources to conduct the interrogations properly and exploit documents and other materials captured with the detainees, limited their effectiveness. Once detainees entered one of the coalition's four theater internment facilities, their legal status as civilian internees under the Fourth Geneva Convention meant that a review of detainee records was required every 180 days to determine if the detention should continue. These assessments were conducted by the Combined Review and Release Board, or CRRB, composed of MNFI officers and representatives from Iraq's Ministries of Interior, Justice, and Human Rights, with the Iraqi board members usually constituting a majority. There were significant drawbacks with this system, as there were no fixed criteria for release. The evidence that coalition units used to lead to arrests was usually classified, and witness statements often were taken from sensitive human sources, meaning the Iraqi members of the board often could not examine all of the information explaining why detainees had been captured in the first place. Additionally, the requirement for two witness statements or forensic evidence, which had not existed during the early months of the war, proved particularly onerous since most of the early detainees had neither statements nor forensic evidence in their detention files. Technology to facilitate capturing such forensic evidence, such as hand swipes that could detect explosive residue and biometric sensors, was only beginning to be fielded to coalition forces by the summer of 2005. Worse, as the interior and other ministries came under the control of various Shia sectarians in 2005-2006, the integrity of the board itself came into question at times. If the CRRB determined that detainees met the criteria for release, Task Force 134 would send notices to all of the multinational divisions 10 days before the planned release date. If any coalition units objected to a detainee's release, Brandenburg, the Task Force 134 commander, would intervene to halt the process. Quote, If the division came back and red-carded the detainee, I would hold them and not release them. End quote. He explained later. And, quote, I would override the CRRB. End quote. Brandenburg and Task Force 134 believed this approach was a sufficient check and balance, but the gulf between the tactical and operational level perspectives was profound. Many tactical units believed the notification timeline was not sufficient for involving their commanders in the process, given unit deployment cycles and personnel turnover. In many cases, by the time the board reviewed detainee packets, the unit that had captured the detainee had already rotated home. While Task Force 134 made efforts to contact units in these cases, the reassignment of personnel or the wholesale moving of units from one base to another because of army transformation often meant the original unit and its leaders had dropped from the picture. Catch and Release From August 2004 to November 2005, 
The Combined Review and Release Board reviewed 23,079 detainee files, recommending 4,546 for unconditional release and 7,902 for discharge with guarantors, local Iraqis who promised to keep the detainee on the straight path, of which just over 400 were blocked from release after the multinational divisions raised objections. After the multinational division's responses and objections were evaluated, ultimately 12,025 detainees were released during this period. In sum, this meant that over 50% of detainees that went before the board were recommended for discharge when their files were reviewed, and almost 97% of detainees recommended for release by the board were ultimately freed. When these releases were added to the discharges resulting from legal reviews at the brigade and division level, statistically 75% of detainees were freed within six months of their capture. The high percentage of releases was, at least partly, a response to prison overcrowding. Rumsfeld's goal of handing over detention operations, combined with the coalition's overarching assumption that a coalition drawdown and withdrawal were on the horizon, translated into a U.S. policy of not funding prison construction in Iraq. Rumsfeld had initially wanted MNFI to return the tainted Abu Ghraib prison complex to the Iraqis by February 2005, a goal that was missed by more than a year. However, the slowdown in prison capacity was not matched by a decrease in the number of detainees being captured, so that the coalition's detention facilities quickly became filled to capacity and required a relief valve in the form of detainee releases on a regular basis to prevent dangerous overcrowding. With little to no new construction authorized because of Rumsfeld's aim to, quote, get out of the Iraqi detainee business, end quote, the question of whether to hold detainees or discharge them became partly a mathematical one. Each day, an average of 50 detainees arrived at the theater internment facilities, although this number spiked to 70 detainees a day during the higher tempo operations in the January 2005 pre-election period. As of February 1, 2005, the coalition's detention facilities held a detainee population of 8,517, virtually equal to the maximum detention capacity of 8,540. Despite numerous releases and some slow growth in temporary tent-like facilities, the capacity of the detention facilities did not keep pace with the growth in the number of detainees in 2005. By November, the population had reached 13,389, far exceeding the maximum capacity of 11,506. As a result, releasing detainees became not just a policy goal, but also a security imperative if the coalition were to avoid escape attempts, prisoner riots, or the reproduction of the conditions that had led to the Abu Ghraib abuses. According to Brandenburg, one of Task Force 134's core problems was, quote, just the pure physics of it. We could only house so many security operations ramped up. We were scrambling to keep up with it. It is a function of how long it takes to build and get money to be able to build and where you are able to do it. End quote. The MNFI headquarters and Casey also used discharges of screened detainees as a relief valve for prison overcrowding and targeted releases of detainees, of whom about 95% were Sunnis, as part of a larger plan to entice Sunnis into the political process after the January 2005 election boycott. Several detainee releases were part of back-channel negotiations to try to improve Sunni participation, including a large-scale discharge of 929 detainees in August and a second round of 1,134 in September. However, even with this approach, the buildup of detainees exceeded the rate of releases for both of these months and every other month of 2005 except for one. The high rate of discharges created frustration and mistrust in many tactical-level units who chafed at the idea of risking their troops' lives to capture insurgents only to have them released a few months later, sometimes seemingly without explanation. For many U.S. field units and commanders, the coalition seemed to have strayed into a, quote, catch-and-release, end quote, approach to the insurgency. By the summer of 2005, U.S. units saw signs that insurgents had begun to understand the detention system and were making efforts to manipulate it. In one case, an insurgent taken into custody by a Special Forces Operational Detachment Alpha in Anbar province defiantly told his captors, quote, I've killed a lot of tribesmen who were assisting the coalition in the past. I've probably been detained for it before. I'll go to Abu Ghraib or to Camp Buka for a few days. I'll eat my three meals a day 
and I'll be back and kill them again. End quote. In another egregious case, one insurgent captured while in placing IEDs had his combined review and release board or CRRB release papers in the truck that contained his bomb making devices. The recidivism rate of released detainees was one of the most problematic and divisive issues of the entire process. As of December 2005, Task Force 134's statistics showed an impossibly low 1.6% recidivism rate. However, tactical units claimed that the recidivism data was often based on fake or mistaken detainee names and insufficient biometric databases that some released detainees were being killed rather than recaptured, and that other released detainees had returned to the fight but had simply evaded recapture. Added together, MNFI's detention policies had the unfortunate effect of creating mistrust between tactical units and higher echelons, as well as producing a lack of faith in the entire detention system. In some cases, it created moral ethical dilemmas for junior leaders. Soldiers, non-commissioned officers, and junior officers on numerous occasions had reason to question why the dangerous insurgents they captured were often released from detention and back on the streets, sometimes within a unit's year-long rotation. Some commanders noted that the catch-and-release system created a perverse incentive among U.S. troops to use deadly force on any insurgent that did not immediately surrender. Anecdotal evidence indicated that, though most leaders did not act on this incentive, some troops and leaders condoned such practices. In one case, during the planning of a mission to capture an insurgent for the third time, an officer recommended that his men should, quote, just shoot him unless he surrenders first, end quote. Loss of control inside the camps. The overcrowding of the theater internment facilities made it difficult for Task Force 134 to maintain a careful separation among different classes of detainees. One RAND report later described, quote, The large number of detainees presented such logistical challenges that, initially, their administrators were fully occupied with the task of simply warehousing them and accomplishing crude separations of those groups judged most likely to harm or kill each other if housed together. End quote. In 2005, the overcrowding created a lack of order and control in many of the coalition's larger open-air detention camps, where insurgent groups effectively took control of what happened inside and made them too dangerous for coalition guards to enter. Insurgents in the camps formed recruiting cells, conducted training, and in some cases ran their own Sharia courts. As new detainees arrived, Hardcore jihadists and other extremists set up propaganda cells to radicalize those less prone to extremism. One former insurgent leader from Duluia, Mullah Nadhim Jaburi, described the process of radicalization. Quote, While I was detained, my ideology changed from that of the Islamic army to that of Al-Qaeda. Because of the freedom that the Americans gave to the prisoners, I was able to learn and study Al-Qaeda's ideas while I was in prison. I had the chance to meet foreign fighters who fought in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Sudan while I was in prison. They started to move the Iraqis towards their ideas and beliefs. End quote. In addition to recruiting, insurgent leaders were able to meet with fellow leaders from across the country to network and exchange tactics, techniques, and procedures. Quote, we could never have all got together like this in Baghdad or anywhere else. End quote. One mid-level insurgent recalled in 2014, quote, It would have been impossibly dangerous. In Camp Bukha, we were not only safe, but we were only a few hundred meters away from the entire Al-Qaeda leadership. Bukha was a factory. It made us all. It built our ideology. End quote. Some frustrated tactical units began to refer derisively to the detention facilities as, quote, jihadist gladiator training camps, end quote, in recognition of this development. Riots and escape attempts went along with the lack of control. On January 31, 2005, riots at Camp Buka escalated to the point that U.S. commanders on the scene, fearing a massive prison break, authorized guards to use live ammunition to quell the uprising. Four detainees were killed and six injured. Another riot at Camp Buka that began on April 1st lasted three violent days. After discovering that the hand sanitizer in the camp's portable bathrooms was flammable, 
Detainees set fire to tents and made launchable firebombs using slingshots and milk cartons filled with the liquid. The detainees also used wooden sleeping pallets as shields and broken chunks of rock as slingshot ammunition. In the riot's early hours, they targeted the on-scene commander of the 105th Military Police Battalion from the North Carolina National Guard, injuring him so seriously with a rock that he required evacuation. Just before the riot, military police discovered and destroyed a nearly complete 357-foot escape tunnel that could likely have turned the riot into a massive, coordinated escape. At exactly the time the April riots at Camp Bucco were consuming much of Task Force 134's attention, Al-Qaeda and Iraq insurgents launched a complex attack on April 2nd against the detention center at Abu Ghraib. Seven suicide car bombers and up to 150 fighters struck the prison with crew-served weapons, vehicles, and mortars in a battle that lasted for several hours until a Marine Quick Reaction Force arrived from MNFW and turned the tide against the attackers. Zarqawi himself allegedly planned the assault, and the assailants were composed of foreign fighters and Albu Isa tribe members. The tribesmen were reportedly attempting to free fellow tribe members and seeking vengeance for coalition operations that killed some of their sheikh's family. Twenty soldiers and marines were wounded in the fight. After the battle, Rumsfeld again questioned Casey in a snowflake about why the Iraqi security forces could not take over the detention mission. Halfway through Brandenburg's command, the problems inside the detention camps had become clear, as had the fact that Task Force 134 was too poorly resourced to solve them. In July, Brandenburg requested an additional three battalion headquarters, eight military police companies, and other support troops that would double the task force's strength to 1,700. The general's request would also expand the transition team concept to the detention field, creating Detention Transition Teams, or DTTs, to train Iraqi correctional officers. Ironically, despite Rumsfeld's intent to close down America's detention operations in Iraq, Brandenburg's request was approved, and the task force became one of the few organizations in Iraq that grew in size on the SecDef's watch. Recognizing that the loss of control within the camps was also a facilities problem, Brandenburg pushed requests for military construction through the budgeting system. Despite considerable resistance from Rumsfeld and others in DOD, the construction requests ultimately prevailed, at least partly because of Casey's dogged support. The new construction would expand Task Force 134's detainee capacity while replacing most of its temporary facilities and tents with buildings that complied with the Geneva Convention's requirement to house detainees in structures similar to those of the soldiers fighting the war. At the same time, the new facilities would be designed to segregate detainees into smaller groups and allow the task force to separate radicals and leaders from insurgent foot soldiers and less ideologically driven fighters. Reflecting the slow speed of the military bureaucracy, however, none of those additional resources would arrive until after Brandenburg's departure from Iraq in December 2005, and the problems inside the detention facilities were left to his successors. By the late summer of 2005, MNFI had concentrated combat power in Anbar and Nineveh provinces and was poised to begin its campaign to stop the car bomb offensive against Baghdad by retaking the Werv and the Sinjar Tel Afar corridor. In doing so, Casey and MNFI believed they would be striking at foreign fighters who were the principal threat to central Iraq and to the elections scheduled for October and December. Unfortunately, this MNFI view of the problem missed the gathering threat of sectarian violence and civil war that was spreading across the Baghdad region and surrounding provinces. As the coalition shifted almost a division's worth of combat power to the Syrian border with the intention of protecting Baghdad, the perpetrators of most of Baghdad's violence were already within the city. Death squads from sectarian militias and rogue sections of the government were already working to cleanse the capital of their rival sects. In other words, the coalition was pulling forces from central Iraq's cities just as sectarian violence was rising there. These sectarian threats and the pervasive sense of fear that hung over the country manifested itself in Baghdad on August 31, 2005, as over a million Shia pilgrims made their way to the Kadimiya Shrine to mark the martyrdom of Musa al-Qadim, the seventh Shia imam. 
After a nearby mortar attack killed seven and injured dozens, a rumor began to spread among the crowds crossing the Al Aima Bridge into Kadimiya that suicide bombers were in their midst, causing thousands of panicked pilgrims to stampede. As they reached a choke point near the bridge, the crowds surged through the small area, trampling those unable to keep up and pushing others off the bridge to their deaths in the Tigris River below. Nearly 1,000 died, most of them elderly, women, or children. There had been no suicide bomber, but the terror of the crowd had produced what was the single largest loss of Iraqi lives in the entire war. The tragedy at the bridge made clear how deeply the sectarian attacks had cut into an already fragile society. The violence in central Iraq was approaching the point of becoming self-sustaining, and the tinderbox of Iraq needed only a spark to send it into a conflagration. End of Chapter 16, Part 2 Going West, April to August 2005 Read by Adam Cable, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 2021Chapter 17, Part 1 Innovation in the Face of War Summer to Fall, 2005 of the U.S. Army in the Iraq War, Volume 1, by U.S. Army Operation Iraqi Freedom Study Group. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adam Cable. Chapter 17. Innovation in the Face of War. Summer to Fall, 2005. Page 445. With almost a division's worth of coalition combat power moved from central Iraq to the Syrian border zone by midsummer, General George Casey Jr.'s operations to reestablish control of the Syria-Iraq border were ready to begin. An operation in western Nineveh and an operation in western Anbar would seek to disrupt Al-Qaeda in Iraq, or AQI's, lines of communications from its Syrian sanctuary in time to protect the October constitutional referendum and the December elections that were crucial to the U.S. political strategy for Iraq. The ensuing battles in Tel Afar and al Qaim would showcase several innovative units employing tactics that had been refined and distilled over the first two years of the war. In broader terms, these organic innovations represented a larger trend in which tactical units were learning to conduct counterinsurgency operations through experience and self-study. Curiously, while these tactical units would find surprisingly successful approaches to local security problems, the coalition's large-scale strategic-level initiatives experienced slow starts, at best, in the second half of 2005. Counterinsurgency Rediscovered Page 445 The Counterinsurgency Survey Casey had arrived in Iraq convinced that stabilizing the country would require a counterinsurgency approach, with American troops working through indigenous forces rather than conducting high-intensity security operations themselves, and he had emphasized this concept in his April 2005 campaign plan. He had also been concerned that U.S. troops focused for three decades before 2003 on preparing for high-intensity force-on-force battles were not prepared for the kind of counterinsurgency fight that Iraq required. Accordingly, in late summer 2005, Casey dispatched a team of close advisors led by Colonel William Hicks and Kalev Gunner Sepp to survey the U.S. units in theater and assess whether they were following an appropriate approach and to compile a report of best practices. In August 2005, Hicks's team conducted its qualitative counterinsurgency survey by visiting five multinational divisions and nine of the 15 U.S. brigades that held territory in Iraq, as well as coalition units in Multinational Division Central South, or MNDCS, and Task Force Maizan in southern Iraq. The team's field reports were illuminating. All U.S. forces in the country were committed, and the lack of a, quote, credible reserve force, end quote, at any level meant that units were unable to surge for any new initiatives or offensives. Quote, Few, if any, units have enough troops to maintain any meaningful presence in an area after they clear it of insurgents, end quote, Hicks's team noted, quote, which only serves to create a vacuum that insurgents quickly refill, leaving units to re-clear an area again at a future time. 
Units are paying twice, sometimes three times, for the same terrain in too many cases. End quote. As a result, MNFI had created a situation that, quote, assumes risk everywhere, end quote. In Nineveh and Anbar, where coalition troops were sparse, the average coalition battalion was tasked with controlling over 2,000 square kilometers and 430,000 inhabitants. Under these conditions, the team concluded, quote, MNFI slash MNCI should postpone any decision on off-ramping until at least spring 2006, end quote, in order to avoid, quote, a rush to failure by handing over battle space to ISF, or Iraqi security forces, before they are capable and ready, end quote. Another factor hampering operations, the Hicks team found, was that many of MNCI's unit boundaries did not take into account, quote, cultural, political, tribal, or traditional linkages, creating seams that the enemy is effectively exploiting, end quote. The rest of Babil province, for example, had been inexplicably split between Multinational Force West, or MNFW, and MNDCS, allowing the enemy to launch attacks on one division's battle space and then cross the boundary when pursued. The report also recommended establishing a reconciliation council for disaffected Sunnis, such as those who refused or were unable to participate politically because of their Ba'athist ties, harnessing all elements of the U.S. interagency for the counterinsurgency campaign and ensuring transition teams had at least two years to mold the Iraqi security forces into shape. However, not all of these recommendations went to Casey and General John Abizaid. Some of the team's leaders considered the conclusions too harsh and instead briefed a milder version of their findings to Casey on August 19th focusing heavily on the performance of tactical units rather than on some of the problematic operational issues the team had uncovered. In terms of the coalition forces themselves, Hicks reported, quote, 20% of the brigades got it, 60% were in the middle, and 20% clearly didn't get it, end quote. While some units arrived in Iraq well prepared to conduct counterinsurgency operations immediately, Many units underwent a difficult trial by fire because home station training lagged well behind the current situation in Iraq. U.S. units and their Iraqi counterparts were, quote, not yet sufficient to stop intimidation of the population and local Iraqi force, end quote, meaning that the bulk of security operations were not necessarily contributing to the security of the Iraqi people. Rather than increase combat power, refocus forces on protecting the population, or reorient the mission entirely, Hicks recommended a greater emphasis on governance and economics, for which the military had limited capacity. Many units focused only on killing or capturing the enemy and not engaging with Iraqis, Hicks told Casey. Much of MNFI's operational approach was not conducive to a counterinsurgency campaign, Hicks said, particularly MNFI's effort to build and train an indigenous military in its own image and its ongoing concentration of coalition military units on large bases. Finally, the present counterinsurgency campaign, Hicks concluded, was a, quote, decentralized company and battalion fight, but without the commensurate resources and authority decentralized to the same levels, end quote. Casey disagreed with most of Hicks's conclusions, except for the concept of denying the enemy access to the population, which he endorsed. Two days later, Hicks and his team presented the same findings to Abizaid, though once again without emphasizing their findings of the insufficient number of coalition forces and the lack of a credible operational reserve. Hicks repeated his observation that, while military operations received most of the coalition's attention, much more needed to be done in the areas of governance and economics. Quote, Units are generally doing that ad hoc, end quote, Hicks noted, by, quote, pulling reservists with direct experience and other talented people out of their existing units and forming provincial reconstruction-type units, end quote. When Hicks suggested Abizade should request additional reservists with civilian skills related to governance, such as judges, mayors, city managers, and police chiefs, the U.S. Central Command or CENTCOM commander responded that taking responsibility for governance was not the military's core mission and that the rest of the government needed to contribute more effectively. Undeterred, Hicks pointed out that the Army has been asked to do these functions since its founding. Without knowing it, Hicks had touched on a key issue for Abizade, who
who was engaged in a struggle inside the U.S. government to get agencies beyond the military involved in the campaign to stabilize Iraq. As he tried to mobilize non-military help, Abizaid was not interested in Hicks's suggestion that the military should go ahead and do the civilians' jobs for them. The 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment and Colonel H. R. McMaster in Tel Afar Casey's operations to block the northern infiltration route across the Syrian border began in May 2005 with the movement of the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment from the Triangle of Death south of Baghdad to western Nineveh, an area that had not recovered from its fall to insurgent control six months before. As an economy of force sector, Multinational Brigade Northwest's, or MNBNW's, area of operations had not had sufficient coalition combat power to take the initiative against the insurgency. This was especially true in the restive, mixed-sect Turkoman city of Tel Afar, which played an outsized part in the Sunni insurgency. Tel Afaris, or Afiri, as Iraqis knew them, had been overrepresented in Saddam Hussein's army and intelligence services, giving the city an unusually high proportion of men with military experience. A number of senior Iraqi military leaders hailed from the city or its surrounding area, and after Saddam's fall, some of them had relocated to Syria to facilitate insurgent attacks against the coalition, Kurds, and the new Shia-led government. The post-2003 environment in western Nineveh was one of sectarian strife among Tel Afar's population, which U.S. units estimated were approximately 60% Sunni and 40% Shia. Sunni Turkomans, who had been loyal to Saddam's regime, resisted the new ascendancy of Kurds, the Sunni Turkomans' natural enemies throughout northern Iraq, and the rise of the Shia Turkoman minority, which grew in power by aligning itself with the newly empowered Shia Islamist parties in Baghdad. In the months leading up to 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment's arrival in Tel Afar, parts of the primarily Shia Turkoman police force had effectively become sectarian death squads. The situation worsened in April 2005 when the Iraqi security forces responded to a request for assistance from Tel Afar's Shia Turkomans by deploying the Scorpion Brigade, an Arab Shia special police unit from Hilla. The addition of the predominantly Shia unit with a fierce reputation for fighting Sunni insurgents inflamed the situation, and, as the International Crisis Group put it, quote, battles between government forces and insurgents turned into a fight between Sunnis and Shiites within the Turkoman community, end quote. The change of mission to Tel Afar was the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment's third assignment in Iraq. The regiment had originally expected to be assigned to Mosul, but had been redirected to the Triangle of Death, and, in fact, Multinational Corps Iraq, or MNCI, had kept one of the regiment's three maneuver squadrons behind in North Babil when the main body moved to Nineveh. The unit's flexibility in taking on the successive new missions reflected in part the approach its commander had taken in pre-deployment training. Colonel Herbert Raymond H. R. McMaster, the regimental commander, had authored an important study on the Vietnam War that concluded senior military leaders had been derelict in allowing President Lyndon Johnson's flawed strategy to continue with only muted internal protest. McMaster was also a student of counterinsurgency doctrine and practice, an often overlooked academic topic in the Cold War Army and the Army of the 1990s. Upon taking command in June 2004 and in anticipation of the unit's impending deployment, he had required his subordinate leaders to complete a reading list on counterinsurgency and Middle Eastern culture. In training, he had enlisted the aid of Arab Americans to play roles in a variety of tactical simulations, and to mitigate the regiment's dearth of Arabic interpreters, he had sent dozens of soldiers to Arabic immersion courses at a local college. Above all, he emphasized what he believed was the most important tenet of counterinsurgency, protecting the population. McMaster and his staff had designed their training programs with little help from the Army, which was still grappling with the question of whether the Iraq campaign would last long enough to disrupt the standard training and education of, quote, core warfighting functions, end quote, and replace part of that instruction with preparations for counterinsurgency. Once in Nineveh, McMaster assigned his second squadron responsibility for the city of Tel Afar. The city, as the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment found it in May 2005, was one of the most violent in Iraq, with 170 attacks per month driven by 500 to 1,000 foreign and Iraqi insurgents mainly from AQI, Ansar al-Islam, 
and other groups that had fled the coalition onslaught in Fallujah in November 2004. These fighters had terrorized the city's population for months with suicide bombs and car bombs against civilians. Some of the insurgent violence was simply depraved, as when insurgents murdered a young boy and then rigged his body cavities with explosives that killed his father when the man came to retrieve his son from the street. As the insurgents had clamped down on the city before the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment's arrival, they had tortured and executed Tel Afaris who resisted them, while perversely conscripting local boys whom they systematically raped and trained to serve as assistants in executions. From May to August 2005, the regiment worked to isolate the city, cutting off insurgent lines of communications. West of Tel Afar, McMaster tasked his first squadron with disrupting insurgent infiltration routes along the 280-kilometer Syrian border in the regiment's area of operations and reconstituting the local Iraqi border police brigade. The first squadron's base was in Sinjar, a mixed-sect town containing Arabs, Kurds, and tens of thousands of Yazidis, a sect of ethnic Kurds who practiced an obscure ancient religion akin to Zoroastrianism. The first squadron found Sinjar, once a major stop on the ancient Silk Road, to be the major waypoint and safe haven for al-Qaeda and other militant foreign fighters making their way from Syria to the Tigris Valley. To understand its area of operations better, 1st Squadron conducted a zone reconnaissance that covered more than 340 kilometers of the border area, uncovering a vast network of, quote, safe houses, weapons caches, transportation companies, and passport counterfeiters, end quote. The operation resulted in over 300 border interdictions of foreign fighters and other contraband, revealing both the depth of Syrian regime complicity and the degree to which the infiltration routes had been developed by AQI. On one mission, elements of an air cavalry troop found an insurgent-led convoy of 40 trucks crossing the border through uninhabited desert. When Apache helicopters engaged with Hellfire missiles and cannons, the trucks fled back to Syria, but not before secondary explosions on several of the vehicles hit in the fusillade confirmed they were smuggling arms and munition. With only two maneuver squadrons at his disposal, McMaster compensated for his dearth of infantry by partnering with the Iraqi 3rd Division, a Kurdish-majority unit with three brigades arrayed across western Nineveh, and he formed a new light cavalry troop that was an equal mix of Iraqi and American soldiers. The one-time surge of special forces for the Battalion Augmentation Training Team mission partnered an unprecedented nine Operational Detachment Alphas, or ODAs, two full special forces companies, with his Armored Cavalry Regiment and the 3rd Division, enabling both an ODA and one of McMaster's troops or companies to pair with each Iraqi battalion. Some Iraqi battalions also benefited from Partnered Military Transition Teams, or MITT. To partner with the Special Operations Forces, or SOF, in his battle space, McMaster co-located headquarters and attached an Air Cavalry Troop, Logistics Element, and Light Reconnaissance Troop to beef up SOF capabilities. At an early stage, McMaster and his subordinates identified a number of drivers of instability, including government-sanctioned sectarian retaliation against the Sunni majority, low rates of education and literacy, high unemployment, and a negative view of U.S. forces based on earlier military operations. Addressing these problems required not just security operations, but extensive engagement with local Sunni leaders to resolve local political differences. In this area, McMaster benefited greatly from the role of Major General Najim Abed Jabouri, a Sunni Arab from the Mosul area who had been assigned as Tel Afar's police chief in May after the firing of his insurgent allied predecessor. Jabouri proved an able local diplomat, shuttling between Sunni and Shia Turkoman tribes with a 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment leader to broker ceasefires and organize opposition to AQI and other insurgent groups. Jabouri would later be appointed Tel Afar's mayor, a position he would hold from late 2005 until 2008. In June 2005, the Ministry of Defense announced that there would be a security operation to resolve the Tel Afar situation, and a group of about 30 Sunni sheikhs traveled to Baghdad in July for a peace conference that resulted in a temporary but significant decrease in violence. At the same time, Local Shia leaders lobbied their government contacts in Baghdad to request support for re-establishing stability in the city. Operation Restoring Rights 
Despite these political initiatives, by July, McMaster and his commanders had decided that driving al-Qaeda in Iraq and other insurgents completely from Tel Afar would require a major operation. Recognizing the piece he was playing in MNFI's plan to secure the October constitutional referendum and the December parliamentary elections, McMaster chose the name Operation Restoring Rights. However, he rejected the idea of a highly destructive clearing of the city similar to the assault on Fallujah or Operation Black Typhoon the previous fall, both of which McMaster believed had heightened local resentment toward the coalition. Instead, he aimed to conduct an operation that would kill or drive off the insurgents while having a much lighter impact on the civilian population and much less collateral damage. To affect this outcome, McMaster took steps to control and then displace Tel Afar's civilian population systematically so that insurgents could not hide among the populace and precipitate collateral damage. As a way to offset potential ill will from any disruption caused by the operation, he ordered the construction of a center for displaced Iraqis, capable of supporting over 1,500 people, and the stocking of humanitarian relief supplies. To buffer the impact of the operation further, McMaster planned post-combat activities in advance. Aiming to jumpstart reconstruction efforts immediately after combat operations ceased, he purchased transformers to restore the city's electrical grid, contracted for teachers and instructional material to reopen schools, and marshaled material and designs for reconstruction projects. McMaster also physically isolated the city. At the recommendation of 3rd Division Commander Major General Khorshid Salim Aldoski, McMaster's troops spent three weeks building a 12-foot-high berm around the city that enclosed 15 square kilometers. With the berm in place, Tel Afaris could only drive vehicles through one of the four checkpoints manned jointly by Iraqi and U.S. soldiers, allowing for population control. Under the pressure of improved border security, the creation of the berm, and better intelligence coming from a more friendly relationship with Telefari civilians, the insurgents who had virtually controlled the city since late 2004 began to lose their freedom of maneuver, falling back on their stronghold in the town's Sarai district. For the actual clearance of the city, the regiment requested two additional U.S. infantry battalions and additional Iraqi security forces, but the troop-starved MNCI was only able to provide one U.S. battalion, 2nd Battalion, 325th Airborne Infantry Regiment, which would not arrive until several days after the operation had begun. To make up some of the shortfall, the Interior Ministry ordered a special police commando brigade to join the operation. However, the commandos and their Badr Corps-affiliated commander quickly proved to be a liability. When the poorly disciplined and ill-trained commando brigade arrived with empty trucks that its troops explained had been brought for, quote, liberating the furniture of Tel Afar, end quote, McMaster ordered the Iraqi commander to withdraw his troops from the city immediately, and the brigade played no part in the ensuing operation. Realizing he would not be receiving the reinforcements he needed, McMaster decided to accept risk on the Syrian border by splitting his first squadron and sending half of it to help clear West Tel Afar. In late August, the operation began with the displacement of almost all remaining civilians in the city. Constant messaging from the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment and Iraqi commanders explained that their intent was not to attack the city and its people, but to focus the assault against the Takfiri insurgents, extremists who believed their doctrine of Takfir obligated them to kill apostates that had held the population in thrall. At the beginning of September, judging there were still too many civilians inside the city to allow the attack to proceed without collateral damage, McMaster delayed the start of the operation by a day and told local Sunni leaders, quote, If you don't get your people out of there tomorrow, the blood is on your hands. End quote. As nearly 150,000 civilians departed the city, soldiers used screened informants at the four exits through the berm to identify and detain scores of fighters attempting to flee in disguise. On September 2nd, 2nd Squadron initiated a, quote, three-day zone reconnaissance of Tel Afar designed to force the enemy into the Sarai district and allow the AIF, or anti-Iraqi forces, only one means of escape, a predetermined path to a location south of the city, end quote. With 3,000 American troops and 5,500 Iraqis committed to the mission, McMaster aligned 2nd Squadron to the east side of the city and 1st Squadron to the west side of the city. Attacking from north to south, 
The regiment and its Iraqi partners intended to split the city, isolating the insurgent-held Surai district. During the first few days, the fighting was intense, with tanks, Bradleys, and Hellfire missiles used in street-to-street -street fighting against insurgents. Over the course of a week, 2nd Squadron conducted a methodical clearing operation, searching every building as they closed in on Surai district. As fighting raged on one street, other elements of 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment would pause to evacuate civilians only blocks away. Sunni residents who were afraid to evacuate south through Shia areas were transported by Iraqi army vehicles and, quote, screened, given humanitarian assistance, offered temporary shelter, and released, end quote. The fight continued for more than a month. By the end of the operation in October, the regiment had killed over 150 insurgents and captured almost 600 at the cost of two Americans killed and 11 wounded, totals significantly lower than the operation in Fallujah the previous November. The operation highlighted the progress of the Iraqi army, which, when paired with Special Forces ODAs, fought alongside McMaster's soldiers. Unlike previous performances of the Iraqi security forces, the Iraqis stood fought, and took casualties. Eight were killed and 19 wounded, although the casualties again disproportionately came from the 1st Commando Battalion, previously known as the 36th Commando Battalion. The operation was a milestone, as it was the first time since the fall of Saddam that Iraqi forces outnumbered U.S. forces in a major operation. As in the August 2004 Battle of Najaf, however, the Iraqi security force's performance in Tel Afar was overstated by MNFI and Multinational Security Transition Command Iraq, or MNSTCI, with both commands incorrectly declaring that regular Iraqi units had been, quote, employed as independent maneuver elements, end quote, under the command and control of an Iraqi headquarters. Other challenges became clear after the battle had concluded. Although the operation successfully won over much of Tel Afar's population, which had expected a repeat of Black Typhoon, the operation had allowed a number of insurgents to flee to safe havens, such as Lake Tartar, north of Baghdad. After clearing the city, McMaster pushed the regiment's combat power off the larger forward operating bases and into small combat outposts that were comprised of U.S. and Iraqi soldiers and arranged in a grid across the urban terrain, usually within sight of one another. This establishment of combat outposts ran counter to MNFI guidance to consolidate U.S. forces on forward operating bases, and it reflected the most important tenet of McMaster's strategy, protecting the population. It also meant the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment would no longer commute to the areas it was responsible for, but instead maintain a constant presence within the community. Also unlike many coalition operations, once the mission was over, the combat outposts did not recede like the tide. They remained in place to build the trust between coalition forces and Iraqi civilians that was essential to providing intelligence and to provide a venue to mentor Iraqi army interactions with the population. Within a week after the battle ended, Tel Afar's electricity was restored, its schools reopened, and new construction had started. As the projects began to restore a sense of normality, McMaster moved to rebuild Tel Afar's local police force, which had disintegrated during the battle. Seeing the police as one of the most important components of counterinsurgency operations, he had obtained MNSTCI's approval to fill three successive police academy classes with telefaris carefully screened by local sheikhs, regimental counterintelligence personnel, and informants who could recognize insurgent supporters. After the recruits completed their training, regimental officers handpicked prospective police leaders and sent them to training, filling the police leadership cadre with trusted officers who had little inclination for corruption or sectarianism. When the police chief that succeeded Jaburi began using his force for personal vendettas, McMaster convinced senior Iraqi parliamentarian Haider Abadi, later to become Iraq's prime minister, to have the police chief replaced immediately. The restructuring of the police also gave the regiment an opportunity to align boundaries for the Iraqi police, Iraqi army, and coalition force units, creating a unity of effort that had not previously existed. For a time, Tel Afar was an impressive example of what could be done when sufficient coalition forces employed proper counterinsurgency tactics with the full support of their higher headquarters. Yet, Tel Afar's good fortune would not last long. Within months of the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment's departure in February 2006, the city would again see a minimal coalition presence, 
and its security would deteriorate again. The Battle for the Western Euphrates as additional coalition forces concentrated in western Anbar, coalition leaders began to realize how badly the security situation had deteriorated in the western Euphrates region that Abu Musab al-Zarqawi aimed to make an al-Qaeda emirate. This proto-Islamic state, which had begun in Hit in the early summer, had expanded to Haditha, Haklania, and Barwana by late summer and early fall. As in Hit, with each new conquest, AQI established Sharia courts, command structures, and intelligence and security cells. This expansion of territory led to a growth in complexity and bureaucracy, with the jihadist emirate developing detailed record-keeping, robust finances, and security infrastructure down to the city block level. As AQI evolved from an insurgent organization to a quasi-government, its leaders became intensely interested in determining religious justification for their actions and in explaining the Sharia rationale for maintaining order in their new territories. Coalition attempts to retake AQI-controlled territory led to heavy fighting. During an unexpected four-day battle in Haditha in early August, insurgents wiped out an entire six-man Marine sniper team in an ambush and later destroyed a Marine assault amphibious vehicle, LVTP-7, with an improvised explosive device, or IED. The LVTP-7 attack killed 14 Marines and their Iraqi interpreter, making it the deadliest IED attack for U.S. troops since the start of the war. The destruction of the lightly armored LVTP-7 highlighted the fact that the Marines and some other coalition units were fighting the war with force protection means that had fallen behind IED technology. The Army requirement for 8,186 up-armored high-mobility multipurpose wheeled vehicles, or HMMWV, was 99% filled by November 2005. However, the Marine contingent in Iraq had only 33% of its 2,715 vehicle requirement, and in fall 2005, many Marine units were still maneuvering through the increasingly dangerous Euphrates Valley in basic model HMMWVs with armor plates welded on the vehicles. At the same time, an MNFI initiative to add electronic countermeasures to vehicles was slow to develop, fielding just 17% of MNFI's total requirement by November. These shortfalls added up to the costly fact that coalition units were struggling to keep up with the insurgency's advances in IED production and use. Shortly after the Haditha battle at the end of August, Insurgent attacks in Kuseba led to intense fighting that culminated in multiple airstrikes. During four days of battle, coalition aircraft dropped a surprising amount of ordnance. Four guided bomb unit, or GBU-38, 500-pound joint direct attack munitions, 11 GBU-12, 500-pound Paveway-2 laser-guided bombs, and 10 Maverick air-to-ground missiles, in addition to rockets and strafing runs. Also in August, elements of the Iraqi Special Operations Forces Brigade, now comprising the 1st Commando Battalion and the Iraqi Counterterrorism Force, deployed to Anbar with their Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force, or CJSOTF, advisors to reinforce the Marines. Paired with Marines from Regimental Combat Team 2, they assaulted Haklania, fighting block to block and discovering a seven-story hotel rigged to explode as coalition forces entered the building. In an attempt to stem the flow of insurgents across the Euphrates River, in early September, MNFW used Marine fixed-wing aircraft and Army M270A1 guided multiple launch rocket systems to destroy two bridges outside Al-Qaim, near the Syrian border. Demonstrating the challenges associated with the often short-term perspectives of a one-year or seven-month rotational policy, the next Marine unit rotating into the area discovered that the destruction of the bridges had infuriated the local population because, quote, the bridge served not only as a link to commerce and economic development, but also a conduit to relationships, families, and a complex social network with far-reaching effects, end quote. Seven months after the two bridges were destroyed, an assault float bridge was installed as a replacement, which in turn was replaced by a permanent bridge eight months later, at the cost of $6.5 million. A series of indecisive smaller battles followed in October, including Operation Iron Fist, which amassed over 1,000 Marines against AQI fighters in the villages of Sada and Karabila, and Operation Rivergate, 
which pitted 2,500 Marines of Regimental Combat Team 2 against AQI in Haditha, Haklania, and Barwana. During these operations, MNFW killed at least 41 insurgents while losing five soldiers and Marines. The Western Euphrates River Valley, or WERV, campaign culminated in November with MNFW's Operation Steel Curtain, a 16-day clearing of Kuseba, Karabila, and Ubaidi, the towns outlying al Qaim. To further increase combat power for the operation, CENTCOM sent its theater reserve, the 13th Marine Expeditionary Unit, ashore in mid-October, after which the unit embarked on a 558-kilometer road march to Al-Assad Air Base. With more than 4,500 soldiers and Marines, Operation Steel Curtain was the largest operation in MNFW since the November 2004 Battle of Fallujah. As they cleared the rest of towns, U.S. troops killed 139 insurgents and detained 388 others, while losing 10 Marines killed and 59 soldiers and Marines wounded, and while calling in no fewer than 67 airstrikes. At the operational level, the WERV would succeed in its clearest objective, ensuring the late 2005 elections would occur unhindered. Such an accomplishment was no easy feat, as al-Qaeda in Iraq and Zarqawi were determined to prevent other Sunnis, worn down by months of intense fighting, from reconciling with the coalition and choosing political engagement. During two months of brutal fighting, MNFW reported killing 529 fighters and detaining another 1,584. This progress was fragile, for as the combat power that had been surged into Anbar receded yet again, tactical units would once more have to expand their footprint and cover larger swaths of territory. The impact of AQI's losses was also blunted somewhat by its leader's ability to melt away during the fighting, only to re-emerge later with additional domestic recruits and foreign fighters. 3rd Battalion, 6th Marines, and Lt. Col. Julian Alford in al Qaim. Most of the operations in the WERV followed a typical pattern. Thinly stretched coalition forces cleared terrain in brutal battles, only to leave days or weeks later because insufficient forces existed to hold the vast expanses of Anbar. However, the 3rd Battalion 6th Marines in al Qaim were an exception, as their commander, Lt. Col. Julian Dale Alford, had decided ahead of the operation to take a different approach. Arriving in al Qaim with his battalion in late August during a normally scheduled Marine unit rotation, Alfred had declared to his skeptical regimental commander that he intended to go into al Qaim and stay there. It was a difficult task in a city that was immediately adjacent to AQI's most active foreign fighter facilitation base in the town of Albu Kamal, a few dozen meters away on the Syrian side of the border. Like McMaster, Alfred was a student of counterinsurgency theory who had spent considerable time preparing his battalion intellectually for its Iraq deployment by reading classic studies such as David Galula's Pacification in Algeria, Francis Bing West's The Village, and the 1940 Marine Corps Small Wars Manual. He had also led his battalion in a 2004 combat deployment to Afghanistan where the unit had tested and honed their tactics against an active insurgency. As McMaster was doing simultaneously in Tel Afar, Alfred emphasized the primacy of protecting the population in counterinsurgency operations, describing what he saw as the center of gravity in the simple epithet, quote, It's the people, stupid, end quote. He warned his troops to avoid creating more of what he called POIs, or pissed-off Iraqis, by carefully managing escalation of force incidents, indirect fire, and close air support. Alfred likened proper kinetic operations to bow hunting, which required tremendous patience, stealth, persistence, proper target selection, and close proximity to the target. Alfred later recalled, quote, I talked to the Marines about killing discreetly and selectively. I used the bow hunter mentality. You have to avoid complacency. You need patience, persistence, and presence at all times to kill discreetly and selectively and without killing the wrong people to kill the bad guy, and not the 99% of Iraqis who were good people. End quote. This latter point required living and operating closely among the Anbari population in a way MNFW units were not used to doing. Instead of consolidating in large bases as MNFI was instructing units across the theater to do, 
Alfred expanded his battalion's footprint into dispersed battle positions. Upon its arrival in al Qaim in late August, Alfred's 6th Company Battalion held only three positions, but used offensive operations in October to fight their way into several towns in the al Qaim district and create four new platoon outposts. In a change from most of the rest of the war of operations, once Alfred's men fought to gain a foothold in new areas, they did not withdraw, but instead looked to expand their local presence further. Throughout November, the unit grew its footprint to a total of 16 platoon positions in the al Qaim area. Each platoon outpost was a bare-bones affair, consisting essentially of earth-filled HESCO barriers dropped in place in the outline of a platoon position. There were no showers, morale telephones, or internet, and the Marines had to resort to burning their own waste with diesel fuel. Quote, You can't be in those big FOBs with Kellogg, Brown, and Root, the internet, and all the different things we were doing, end quote, Alfred described after the operation. Quote, you have got to split up and be where you can protect the population. End quote. As a result, the battalion's positions were usually in the middle of a town, where the Marines had only to walk outside their position to be among Iraqis. Mindful of the impact that the Quartering Act had on pre revolutionary America, Alfred eschewed the practice of commandeering Iraqi houses as coalition outposts, thereby avoiding the creation of more, quote, pissed off Iraqis, end quote. To strengthen relationships between the marine outposts and local Iraqi communities, Alfred encouraged his marines to eat on the local economy, a practice that produced a microeconomic boom as Iraqi merchants provided a takeout food service to the battle positions for cash. The principle extended to 3rd Battalion 6 Marines foot patrols, which Alfred's men nicknamed, quote, eats on the streets, end quote, for the way in which they were conducted meal to meal, with Marines stopping at food vendors in Iraqi neighborhoods as they patrolled. To force the majority of his troops to patrol on foot and interact with Iraqis, Alfred limited each patrol to a single accompanying vehicle. He also banned the concept of, quote, presence patrols, end quote, instead requiring each patrol to have a specified mission. Many of these patrols were related to the counterinsurgency precept of population control, conducting censuses of the population and buildings near each battle position to enable Alfred's men to understand who and what was around them while compiling detailed records for follow-on forces. Throughout 3rd Battalion 6th Marines' rotation in al Qaim, Alfred also aimed to recreate the successful model of the combined action platoons used during the Vietnam War. Each of Alfred's battle positions included a platoon of Marines and a platoon of partnered Iraqi army troops living, eating, and working in the same place, a rarity in the aftermath of the December 2004 Mares dining facility bombing. Throughout their deployment, Alfred impressed on his units an enforced partnership approach. If ever discovering any of his units conducting a mission without an equally sized Iraqi force, Alfred would send them back to the main forward operating base at Camp al Qaim in shame replacing them with a unit that had better embraced his combined action concept. By the end of the unit's rotation in March 2006, al Qaim, an area that had been under Zarqawi and al-Qaeda in Iraq's near-complete control in mid-2005, was well on its way to returning to coalition control, with the city itself firmly in marine hands and with the insurgency slowly receding from outlying districts. When Casey visited Alfred's unit near the end of the battalion's rotation, the stunned MNFI commander told Alfred and Colonel Stephen Davis, the Regimental Combat Team 2 commander, quote, I never thought you guys could take that al Qaim back, end quote. The Counterinsurgency Academy the counterinsurgency techniques McMaster and Alfred were putting into practice coincided with the creation of a theater-level venue for training U.S. commanders in similar tactics. Based on the results of the counterinsurgency survey in late summer, Casey approved Hicks's recommendation to create a, quote, COIN, or counterinsurgency, academy, end quote, in Taji, just north of Baghdad, to ensure incoming leaders had a baseline understanding of counterinsurgency principles and their application in the Iraq operating environment. Casey mandated that all leaders of incoming brigade combat teams, from company commander to brigade commander, would attend the one-week course. Casey had put significant pressure on the MNFI staff to stand up the organization quickly, and it was teaching its first classes by November. 
Among its first lecturers were McMaster and Alford, whose respective successes Casey recognized by personally presenting each officer with a bronze star as their deployments ended. Alford was the only battalion commander that Casey honored with such a presentation. However, while Casey clearly recognized what successful coin operations looked like, he had a greater challenge in communicating and implementing that vision across the force that was rotating into the Iraq theater. In some ways, the Coin Academy was a reflection of the continuing disconnect between the Army's institutional training base and the operational needs of the force in Iraq. Ideally, Hicks noted, U.S. units should be learning the lessons of the Coin Academy much earlier in their training cycle, perhaps before conducting training at the Army's combat training centers, but the U.S. training base was lagging behind in accomplishing this task. The Coin Academy remained in operation in Taji well past Casey's tenure as commander and ultimately received mixed marks for achieving its purpose. To a degree, the Coin Academy epitomized Casey's response to Hicks and Sepp's coin survey by selecting a tactical solution to address the host of strategic and operational problems that the survey had laid bare. Special Operations Forces in Anbar to support Casey's operational-level effort to re-establish control of the Iraqi-Syrian border, other SOF also pushed west, establishing themselves at the remote base in Rawa. These SOF were deemed so important to the overall mission that for Operation Sayaid Hunter, which ran from mid-July to August, they were MNCI's main effort. There they were paired with conventional forces to an unprecedented degree, and by October, two infantry companies along with their battalion headquarters were placed under the SOF headquarters' tactical control. It was the first time since the invasion that SOF were locally made the main effort and given conventional forces to support them. The model was successful enough that by November an entire infantry battalion was placed under SOF control. The intensity of the fight in Anbar was unlike anything the special operations elements had previously experienced. Their assault forces frequently faced well-trained foreign fighters dug in with sandbagged defensive positions, crew-served weapons, night vision goggles, and quick reaction forces. Many foreign fighters expected to die, and either wore suicide vests or wired the entire structure they occupied with explosives to be detonated when the special operators entered the building. Demonstrating the level of insurgent resolve, a handful of SOF raids had to be extracted under pressure with the support of AC-130 and rotary wing fires. This resulted in the increased use on some missions of a, quote, call-out, end quote, in which a megaphone was used to instruct non-combatants to leave a surrounding building. If the fighters inside did not surrender, or if they opened fire, the building would then be reduced with an airstrike, rather than risk troops' lives. The SOF participation in the WERV campaign was a large-scale effort focusing on the insurgent sanctuaries of Al-Qaim and Haditha. Raid after raid eliminated IED factories and killed or captured al-Qaeda in Iraq senior leaders. A series of operations in September 2005 by a Joint Special Operations Task Force, or JSOTF, included the rescue of a U.S. hostage partly based on intelligence and leads from the 3rd Infantry Division in Baghdad. By November, the commander of the JSOTF decided to keep three battalion-level task forces in Iraq a measure that required shifting additional forces from external locations and created significant stress on the force. In the same month, the command captured senior terrorist bomb maker Ali al-Fadil in Anbar. Fadil had returned to his native London in September 2003 after being seriously injured by his own bombs in Iraq. In the United Kingdom, or UK, he received prosthetic limbs and then returned to his chosen profession, building bombs that were used in the July 7, 2005 attacks against London, before escaping back to Iraq. End of Chapter 17, Part 1 Innovation in the Face of War Summer to Fall, 2005 Read by Adam Cable, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 2021《Innovation in the Face of War — Summer to Fall, 2005 — of The U.S. Army in the Iraq War, Volume 1, by U.S. Army Operation Iraqi Freedom Study Group. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adam Cable. Chapter 17, Part 2 
Innovation in the Face of War, Summer to Fall, 2005. The Early Roots of the Awakening, The Desert Protectors, page 458. The coalition's experimentation with more nuanced counterinsurgency approaches among Iraqi Sunni communities coincided with an increasingly heavy hand of al-Qaeda in Iraq in those same locations. By summer 2005, AQI's brutal behavior had caused the group to wear out its welcome with some Anbari tribes. AQI had upset tribal sheikhs by forcibly taking over the cross-border smuggling trade, traditionally a tribal venture, and by enforcing its puritanical interpretation of Islam. In Al-Qa'im, Hit, and other western areas, AQI commanders enforced prohibitions on music, gambling, and other licentious activities while forcing some Anbaris to give their daughters in marriage to AQI foreign fighters, ironically the same behaviors Ayman al-Zawahiri had warned Zarqawi about, and with the same effects Zawahiri had predicted. The situation came to a head when AQI, which banned secular law enforcement in territory that it claimed, murdered and then beheaded Al-Qa'im's police chief, a well-respected Albu Mahal tribal member. Incensed by these actions, the Albu Mahal and other tribal elements collaborated with Muhammad Mahmoud Latif and the Association of Muslim Scholars in the preparation of a fatwa that authorized the tribes to fight AQI's foreign fighters. Other tribes soon joined the Albu Mahal in its fight against AQI. In Hit, Seeking revenge for a killing of a tribesman, the Albu Nimr allied with Jaish Muhammad and the Albu Mahal against AQI and Ansar al Sunna in intense fighting that left at least 32 dead. In June, the Albu Mahal and its allies were able to recapture Kuseba, and by July they had expanded their footprint to include Old Ubaidi and Sada. With its own tribal unit, the Hamza Battalion, not aligned with coalition efforts, the Albu Mahal tribe fought al-Qaeda in Iraq until August when AQI cut the battalion supply line, divided the forces, and defeated it piecemeal. In the aftermath of the uprising, AQI was particularly brutal in its revenge against the Albu Mahal, hoping to make an example that would discourage other tribes. In Kuseba, AQI went house to house, identifying members of the tribe and executing them publicly. With nowhere left to turn, the splintered Albu Mahal tribe fled to Jordan and deep into the Iraqi desert, making an important decision to request coalition assistance in its fight against AQI. Sheikh Kurdi Rafi Farhan al-Mahalawi, one of the Albu Mahal's tribal leaders, later recalled, quote, A lot changed when al-Qaeda started its terrorism against the Iraqi people. When that began, a lot of people wanted to fight with the Americans against al-Qaeda because al-Qaeda cut off a lot of heads, destroyed a lot of houses, destroyed infrastructure. Not a single city was without dozens of bodies thrown everywhere, whether in the street or elsewhere. Speaking for myself, I said I will cooperate with the Americans, even with the devil, if it means kicking al-Qaeda out of the area. End quote. While al-Qaeda in Iraq's activities were the primary reason for the tribe's actions, the change in the coalition's posture in Anbar also contributed to the tribe's decision. The increased U.S. combat power that had flowed into Anbar as part of Casey's border campaign, along with new outreach from units such as Alford's Marines, had helped to persuade some tribal leaders that the coalition could be a counterbalance to AQI. The intensity of the tribal uprisings, as well as the decisions of insurgent groups such as the Ramadi Shura Council to seek reconciliation with the Iraqi government, alarmed al-Qaeda's senior leadership in Pakistan into sending one of its senior leaders, Abdul Hadi al-Iraqi, to Iraq on a fact-finding mission. Its alarm had been magnified by exaggerated warnings from the insurgent group Ansar al-Sunna, which had long resented Zarqawi and believed it, rather than AQI, should be in charge of al-Qaeda's franchise in Iraq. Ansar al-Sunna held Zarqawi personally responsible for the destruction of its parent organization, Ansar al-Islam, in northern Iraq in 2003, and, like some other insurgent groups, opposed Zarqawi's targeting of Iraqi civilians and brutal beheadings. Moreover, Ansar al-Sunna's leaders believed that AQI and Zarqawi frequently took credit for attacks that Ansar al-Sunni launched and poached members from among their ranks. Relations between the two insurgent groups were bad enough that al-Qaeda's senior leaders received reports that open fighting might break out. To resolve this dispute and get a better grasp of the situation in Iraq, 
Abdul Hadi, part of Osama bin Laden's inner circle, twice requested Zarqawi's help to infiltrate Iraq, but Zarqawi claimed the security situation would not permit it. Abdul Hadi's visit to mediate between the two groups was delayed seven months because of Zarqawi's intransigence, and the AQI Ansar al Sunnah feud festered in the meantime. The disputes between insurgent groups and the uprising of Anbari tribes against AQI reached MNFI's attention by September when an MNFI assessment noted, quote, Since May 2005, select western Sunni tribes have been in armed conflict with AQI for the town of Kuseba in the western Euphrates River Valley area. Intelligence reports indicate Sunni tribal members, as many as 1,000, are increasingly disillusioned with AQI and are formulating plans to expel foreign fighters. End quote. Sensing an opportunity to extend his Sunni outreach efforts, Casey authorized meetings with the exiled Albu Mahal tribe in Jordan and later sent an aircraft to bring the tribe's senior leader, Sheikh Sabah, to Baghdad to negotiate a formal alliance, though Casey was wary of providing too much assistance and creating another local militia for his units to handle. As Casey's diplomatic initiative with the Albu Mahal was developing, CJSOTF units were returning to Anbar for the first time in a year and were eager to re-energize the irregular force they tried to create in 2004. Because of the CJSOTF's relatively low personnel turnover, many of the same troops who had led the 2004 effort now returned to the same locations in Anbar. Master Sergeant Andy Marshall and other special operators who had worked with the Albu Nimer tribe in 2004 returned to HIT and quickly re-established contact with the tribe. At the same time, Major Adam Such, who had helped pioneer the 2004 effort, was now the battalion operations officer responsible for planning the new initiative, which called for an even larger irregular tribal force named the Desert Protectors. The CJSOTF's plan was a pragmatic one that recognized the Sheikh's goals would simply be to, quote, get the shooting with AQI to stop, end quote, so they could rebuild their neighborhoods and restore their influence over the local economy. The CJSOTF leaders fully accepted that their partner Sheikhs would skim a percentage of money from whatever the coalition provided, so long as it was carefully managed and the tribal elements accomplished what was expected of them. Recognizing the process of standing up a tribal force capable of defending itself and maintaining law and order could take up to two years, the CJSOTF plan also counseled patience. Accepting these stipulations, Casey, with Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad's support, approved the plan and began to steer MNFI and MNSTCI resources to it. The transformation of the tribal elements into a force that supported the coalition began first with the Albu Mahal tribesmen who were eager to take revenge against Al-Qaeda and return to Al-Qaim. The CJSOTF initially organized and trained a platoon of tribal irregulars whose pay would come from Iraqi army coffers, but who, unlike the army, would not be required to deploy anywhere outside of their immediate tribal areas. Marine units in MNFW quickly supported the effort because the tribesmen effectively served as scouts who could identify AQI fighters and leaders during the battles of the Werve campaign. As the effort began having tactical effects, leaders in the Albu Nimer tribe petitioned to join the initiative, partly out of rivalry with the Albu Mahal and partly because of rekindled contacts with the CJSOTF. The Albu Nimer offered more than 500 fighters to Iraqi Minister of Defense Sadun Dolaimi, an Anbari Sunni who had helped broker the initial agreement between Casey and the Albu Mahal. Dulaimi was forced to downsize the request, telling the Albu Nimer that, quote, neither Prime Minister Jafari nor SCIRI leader Hakim wanted a Sunni army division created, even though they feigned support for Sunni political inclusion, end quote. Ultimately, only a platoon's worth of Albu Nimr volunteers completed training in Fallujah, but with this modest addition, the desert protectors spread east to hit, and the conglomerated tribal force grew to company size. Though they did not have a decisive impact in 2005, the desert protectors demonstrated that, under the right conditions, local irregular forces could partner with coalition units against AQI to great effect, a concept that would be important during the awakening in 2006. Recognizing the potentially strategic implications of these tribal realignments, AQI violently struck back to intimidate other tribes from joining the movement. 
prominent Albu Isa members who had worked with the coalition in 2004 and banned their tribesmen from joining the insurgency, were targeted in June by car bombs and assassination attempts, resulting in the deaths of two tribal leaders and the flight of another to Jordan. With many of its leaders gone, the Albu Isa tribe fractured, with some members joining AQI. Fighting also broke out between al-Qaeda in Iraq and the Jagafi tribe in May after AQI burned down houses of tribesmen in Haditha and beat local civilians. By midsummer, AQI and local tribes were in open conflict in Haditha, Hit, and Kuseba. In Ramadi, Mohammed Mahmoud Latif, seeing the disruptive effect that tribal forces were having on AQI, proposed to local sheikhs that they create their own tribal force. The proposal progressed over the summer. In mid-August, Anbar's governor, Mamun Sami Rashid Latif al-Alwani, agreed to hold a meeting with 50 imams to discuss the details of setting up such a force against AQI. When AQI learned of the meeting, it launched an attack against the meeting place, doing little damage but emboldening Latif, Governor Mamun, and the rest of tribal leaders. Ultimately, however, the Iraqi government in Baghdad did not act on their proposal, and the Ramadi tribal force would not materialize in 2005. Special Operations Forces Transformations Page 461 The return to the tribal engagement effort was only one of several significant changes that SOF was undertaking in 2004 and 2005. Like McMaster and Alford, SOF leaders were also introducing sweeping innovations, many of which reflected tactical lessons they had learned in their shorter but more frequent rotations in Iraq. Perhaps the most significant innovation was a near revolution in the special operations targeting cycle. Doctrinally, SOF had emphasized extensive preparations that usually involved sequestering or isolating detachments for 96 hours or more, during which they received targeting packages and intelligence from higher headquarters. These detachments would then perform detailed planning, conduct multiple briefings to obtain mission approval, and then rehearse plans exhaustively. Such deliberate tactics were mismatched to Iraq, where intelligence usually came from the bottom up and where targets were usually fleeting. In order to adapt to this type of warfare, the CJSOTF pushed intelligence analysts down to the company level and below, and developed procedures to operate against time-sensitive targets, establishing, quote, playbooks, end quote, of battle drills that ODAs could execute on short notice, without extensive planning, and with minimal rehearsals. Another significant change for special operations forces was the new need to operate in the battle space of conventional units. Doctrinally, special operators prepared for most of their careers to work in their own joint special operations area located far behind enemy lines or in denied territory where there were no conventional forces. However, in Iraq, any action they took, whether lethal or non-lethal, could affect the campaign plan of the conventional unit who owned the battle space. Operating among conventional units created some frictions, but also some significant advantages. Special operations forces were smaller in size and flatter in organization and decision-making authority, but they lacked the combat power and logistics to conduct sustained operations that conventional units could provide. Additionally, special operations forces were able to collect human intelligence far more effectively than conventional forces could. When this symbiotic relationship worked well, Often the special operators would gather intelligence, synchronize an operation with the local conventional units to ensure it had the desired impact, and then conduct missions with the battle space owner providing a quick reaction force. Colonel Stephen Davis, the commander for Regimental Combat Team 2 in Anbar from 2005 to 2006, later explained his perspective on the value of synergy between special operations and conventional forces and his lack of concern about doctrinal command relationships. Quote, RCT-2 forces were QRFing, or Quick Reaction Force, every assault the SOF did. Was it SOF in support of General Purpose Forces? Was it General Purpose Forces in support of SOF? Who really cares? The bottom line is you need to focus on the mission. Don't worry about who gets credit. Leave your ego at the door. End quote. The special operations conventional relationship was not smooth everywhere. 
In some instances, the same disputes over unity of command and unity of effort that had prevailed in the 2003 invasion resurfaced, especially when new units rotated into Iraq. In northern Iraq, the relationship frayed when the 1st Infantry Division took over MNDNC in 2004. From the perspective of 1st Infantry Division Commander Major General John Batiste, the issue was one of unity of command, telling Army historians in 2005, quote, When you put a special forces outfit at whatever level inside a division commander's battle space and they're essentially autonomous with theoretical coordination relationships, it's a recipe for disaster. Those special forces units need to be task organized appropriately within the divisions, either attached or in direct support, and there's no other way to do it. End quote. In some cases, poor junior leadership among special operators had resulted in special operations units not consulting with battlespace owners, so there was some truth to Batiste's complaint. However, by early 2005, such, quote, procedural fouls, end quote, were becoming rarer especially after the CJSOTF issued an order requiring all missions to obtain battle space owner approval in advance, except in rare circumstances. The CJSOTF, which was officially under MNCI's tactical control, was loath to accept the command relationship Batiste proposed, partly because special operations units had previously been asked by other conventional commanders to perform inappropriate missions, such as serving as scout platoons, long-range surveillance detachments, or basic training-style platform trainers for the Iraqi security forces. CJSOTF leaders who were responsible for operations across the entire country also wanted to remain free to reposition their forces to match the insurgency's main effort, as they did when moving an entire company from Kirkuk to Anbar to support the WERV campaign. As a result, CJSOTF leaders generally believed the joint doctrinal command relationship of supported element and supporting element better allowed the CJSOTF to meet the MNCI and multinational division commanders' needs. Nevertheless, the dispute between Batiste and CJSOTF leaders grew fractious enough that the CJSOTF limited its missions within the MNDNC area of operations, an unfortunate development from which other multinational divisions nonetheless benefited. By the time of the third major rotation of forces for Operation Iraqi Freedom in early 2005, Relationships between special operations and conventional commanders had matured enough that some CJSOTF units began participating in the pre-deployment exercises of the conventional units they expected to support. However, turbulent unit moves, such as the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment's multiple moves in-country and the CJSOTF's short-notice battalion augmentation training team mission, disrupted this beneficial pre-mission training. The rotation of forces also accented a trend which would continue to progress through the war, that Marine and Army commanders who returned to Iraq often had already worked with special operations forces on prior rotations and had come to understand better their roles and capabilities. During 2005, other special operations forces were also experiencing transformative changes similar to conventional forces and the CJSOTF. Like the CJSOTF, other special operations forces learned that the entire intelligence cycle had to be revolutionized from top to bottom, with intelligence collection, exploitation, and analysis pushed to the lowest level possible. Some of the most important enablers in this revolutionized intelligence cycle were intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, or ISR, platforms, which, when paired with other capabilities, created the ability to establish a, quote, pattern of life, end quote, for an intended target. Unfortunately, early in 2005, it became clear that other special operations forces did not have enough ISR platforms to have the operational effects that they desired. On February 20, 2005, other special operations forces were following Zarqawi's movements with one ISR platform. Just as Zarqawi's location appeared to be confirmed, the video camera on the ISR platform malfunctioned and needed to be reset, a process that took only 23 seconds. In that short time, Zarqawi himself was able to disappear from sight, escaping capture from an assault force that arrived seconds later. While the team's main prize was gone, it did capture Zarqawi's vehicle and many of his personal possessions, including his laptop, seven thumb drives, and 50,000 euros. The near miss resulted in a redoubling of efforts to increase the number of ISR platforms to allow for backups in the case of malfunctions and to permit the coverage of more targets. 
starting the war with only two helicopters equipped with full-motion video cameras, by April 2005, the addition of Predator unmanned aerial vehicles and manned aircraft enabled the number of dedicated orbits for other special operations forces to reach 4.21. Each orbit is defined as the ability to cover a single target continuously for a 24-hour time period. By March 2006, the total had reached 6.25 orbits, and imagery-related intelligence had come to be considered as important as signal-related intelligence. Over time, other special operations forces brought exploitation capabilities, operators, and analysts together under one roof, preventing institutional myopia that would slow down the processing and analysis of raw intelligence. The in-theater exploitation of documents found on objectives, which previously had to be sent back to the United States for translation and analysis, became an especially crucial capability that enabled quicker follow-on targeting of AQI leaders. Likewise, the human intelligence garnered from detainee interrogations was deemed so important and effective that a temporary screening facility was established, which was authorized to hold detainees for exploitation until transferred to the theater facility. The new paradigm in intelligence was matched by a revolutionized perspective in operations that led to missions being conducted to gather intelligence, a reversal of pre-war special operations doctrine in which intelligence guided operations. In almost a reconnaissance in force methodology, operations were launched to stir up enemy groups to see, quote, reflections, end quote, or how the enemy reacted, as well as to gather information from an objective in order to assemble pieces of a larger intelligence picture that would lead to follow-on missions. While this approach was sometimes criticized for its similarity to a whack-a-mole arcade game that lacked decisive focus, it reflected the belief that success against AQI would come not from a decisive blow, but from constant pressure that put AQI into a reaction mode, unable to respond to attacks and unable to repair itself as fast as it was being hurt. If AQI could be dealt enough body blows in rapid succession, SOF leaders believed, the network, like an organism, would go into shock and collapse. To that end, raid after raid was launched during the same night. Bolstered by the additional battalion that arrived earlier in 2005, the number of missions conducted each month hit nearly 300 by the end of the year. As the operations multiplied, special operations forces shifted many of the targets from top-tier AQI leaders to mid-level managers of the organization, reflecting yet another transformational perspective that mid-level leaders were the guts of an organization and the most difficult to replace. This industrialization of special operations was best seen in Mosul over the summer of 2005, when Abu Talha and Abu Zubair, AQI's regional emir and his replacement, were killed along with numerous subordinate AQI leaders. By November 7th, four more replacement leaders, including the sixth emir of Mosul, Abu Saif, had also been killed, and AQI's Mosul branch began to grind to a halt. Conventional forces also contributed to the destruction of the group in Mosul, raiding terrorist safe houses and killing scores of AQI's rank and file. During one such raid on November 19th, a platoon from the 172nd Striker Brigade combat team found itself pinned down and outnumbered by AQI fighters. Although the platoon leader, platoon sergeant, and several other soldiers were wounded in the fighting, the unit rallied and defeated the insurgents with grenades and rifle fire. The platoon's tenacity earned its members two silver stars as well as a distinguished service cross for Private First Class Stephen Sanford, who, despite being wounded five times, shielded wounded soldiers with his body and performed first aid until he passed out from blood loss. While these efforts significantly damaged AQI in Mosul, it proved a challenging opponent to destroy and over time would slowly reestablish itself in the city. Casey and Khalilzad bring provincial reconstruction teams to Iraq. Page 464. In the aftermath of the operation in Tel Afar, McMaster tried to resolve some of the underlying causes of instability in the city by pressing the MNFI and embassy systems to use a combination of Commander's Emergency Response Program, or SERP, money and funds from MNSTCI to create jobs and improve education. With this money, Iraqi contractors began to rebuild police stations, refurbish schools, and provide potable water and electricity to the entire city. 
The Iraqi government committed $44 million for longer-term projects, but after an initial $4 to $5 million, it never followed through with the remainder of the funds. What happened in Tel Afar was similar to what had happened in Fallujah and other Sunni enclaves. According to MNCI Commander Lt. Gen. John Vines, quote, Even though the money was available in the Iraqi government and part of it was probably from U.S. origin, you couldn't get them to allocate it. The central government probably didn't want to see money flowing through primarily a Sunni area. End quote. The problem of trying to get the Shia-led Iraqi government to reconstruct Sunni-majority areas was never effectively resolved. To compensate for these shortcomings in Iraqi governance, during late 2005 another innovation was transplanted with modifications from Afghanistan to Iraq. By the summer, Casey had become concerned that the development of the Iraqi government was not keeping pace with perceived improvements in security and the Iraqi security forces. He worried that the progress of the Iraqi government was being hampered by multiple transitions caused by the decision to hold three elections in one calendar year, and worried that the U.S. military simply did not have the skills necessary to help Iraqi's political sphere develop properly. Without a concerted effort to improve Iraqi governance, Casey judged, one of the critical legs of the MNFI campaign plan could falter. This line of effort fell primarily within the State Department's bureaucratic purview, yet Casey believed the State Department was not structured or funded to accomplish the mission. He therefore sought a way to fuse State Department expertise with DOD capability. Together with Abizade and with the endorsement of Ambassador James Jeffrey, Casey decided to stand up provincial support teams, modeled on the provincial reconstruction teams already operating in Afghanistan, which would be organized from resources already present in Iraq. Casey explained later, quote, They had elected a provincial council and governors, but they had no revenue stream coming out of Baghdad, and the people had no way of penetrating the bureaucracy. We needed to get something on the civilian side going, and it seemed like the PRT was working in Afghanistan. End quote. Even so, the initial provincial support teams had negligible effects. Despite Jeffrey's endorsement, embassy support for the project was lukewarm, and the teams were too small to make a difference. Many were comprised of only four or five military officers and a State Department representative, and some members had additional duties unrelated to the support team mission. The arrival of Ambassador Khalilzad in July brought an immediate change. Khalilzad, having seen firsthand the impact the provincial reconstruction teams had on governance, the rule of law, and economic development efforts in Afghanistan, was determined to replicate them in Iraq. He threw his weight behind efforts to establish the teams and recognized they needed to be much more robust in personnel and capabilities than the provincial support teams. Quote, what really got it, the PRTs, going was the fact that Ambassador Khalilzad showed up and said, how come we don't have PRTs in Iraq? End quote, one MNFI officer recounted. Given the significant differences between Iraq and Afghanistan, the Iraqi teams would focus more on developing provincial governance in order to improve the connection between the central government and its constituents. Implementing provincial reconstruction teams, however, meant overcoming the reluctance not just of the State Department, but also of Secretary of Defense, or SECDEF, Donald Rumsfeld, who regarded the teams as a sign of mission creep that would result in DOD paying to accomplish a State Department function. Only after pressure from Casey, Abizaid, and Khalilzad did Rumsfeld acquiesce in the initiative. By November, the first three reconstruction teams opened in Nineveh, Tamim, and Babil provinces, with an additional 13 planned to follow in other provinces in 2006. At the same time, MNFI began planning for 14 teams to directly assist Iraq's ministries at the national level and focus on core governmental functions. Like all the other ad hoc organizations created for the Iraq mission, provincial reconstruction teams were slow to reach full capacity due to delays in the arrival of personnel, though many of the teams ultimately grew to 30 to 45 representatives from across the U.S. interagency, with most teams led by a foreign service officer and a military deputy. For the military component, a civil affairs element ranging from a team to company size would pair with an engineer officer to work on reconstruction, while MNCI would provide a liaison from the multinational division and MNSTCI would provide a police partnership program coordinator. 
With the Army's civil affairs units stretched to the breaking point, Navy personnel were hastily assigned to fill Reconstruction Team billets, even though they had little or no civil affairs experience. While the State Department provided a majority of the civilian personnel, most teams also had a rule-of-law expert from the Department of Justice and representatives from the U.S. Agency for International Development. The teams had almost as many contractors as government personnel because they depended on private companies such as Blackwater or Triple Canopy for security, and on contractors such as the Research Triangle Institute to run local governance programs. Despite their potential, the reconstruction teams faced considerable challenges. Manning was a continuous problem, as personnel from civilian agencies could not be forcibly detailed into the positions. The lack of combined pre-mission training meant that the teams had to work through differences in organizational culture, identity, and ethos while conducting a new mission. Allied forces in MNDCS and MNDSE were reluctant to invest their own resources in the program, but were also reluctant to allow American-led teams into their sectors. Many of the commanders within the U.S. sectors were unhappy with the command relationship of the provincial reconstruction teams to the multinational divisions, preferring to have direct control of the teams themselves rather than having them controlled by coalition officials in Baghdad. Shortcomings in the ISF Development Mission, page 466. MNSTCI takes over the Interior Ministry Mission. By early 2005, coalition leaders concluded that the development of the Iraqi Ministry of the Interior, begun under the short-lived tenure of Bernard Carrick in 2003, was falling further behind the development of the Ministry of Defense as time passed, so much so that the coalition's plan to establish police primacy in Iraq's internal security affairs was at risk. To speed up the Interior Ministry's development, Lt. Gen. David Petraeus put in place plans to improve the Iraqis' performance at both ministerial and tactical levels. One problem was that coalition advisors had far less access to the Interior Ministry in East Baghdad than they did to the Ministry of Defense inside the Green Zone. Thus, in April 2005, Petraeus's command expanded forward operating base SHIELD, a coalition base adjacent to the Interior Ministry, so that advisors could maximize contact hours with their Interior Ministry counterparts. Petraeus also pressed coalition leaders to consolidate the police training mission under MNSTCI, a measure that Ambassador John Negroponte and the State Department opposed because it would make Iraq the only country in which DOD, rather than state, had authority to organize, train, and equip a civilian police force. With the arrival of Khalilzad in July 2005, however, the U.S. Embassy changed its position and acknowledged that the civilian agencies had not been able to resource the police mission with the people or money required. Accordingly, in October 2005, a month after Lt. Gen. Martin Dempsey took control of MNSTCI from Petraeus, the police training mission was transferred in its entirety from the State Department to MNSTCI. All elements of the U.S. Embassy's Iraq Reconstruction Management Office that had been working on Ministry of Interior Affairs came under Dempsey's operational control. The decision finally created unity of effort within the Security Force Assistance Mission, giving MNSTCI, in Dempsey's words, quote, responsibility for the entire enterprise, from individual Iraqi soldier to Minister of Defense or individual policeman to Minister of Interior, end quote and providing for the first time, quote, one organization, one commander, with the resources to accomplish the mission, end quote. With full control over the Iraqi police training and advisory effort for the first time, MNSTCI and MNFI made plans to accelerate police development dramatically, which they assessed to be lagging about a year behind that of the Iraqi army. Casey and Dempsey announced that 2006 would be the, quote, Year of the Police, end quote, in which the coalition would increase capability at the ministerial level while speeding up the development of tactical units. Nearly 700 new International Police Liaison Officers, or IPLO, were contracted to mentor local police units, which had had no coalition advisors since Prime Minister Ayad Alawi's objections to the creation of local police transition teams in 2004. 
The arrival of the IPLOs in 2006 would mirror the use of external military transition teams already underway in 2005. In order to increase the output of the Ministry of the Interior's police training programs and put more police officers on the beat quickly, MNSTCI would also recruit 700 additional Iraqi police instructors and contract 185 additional international police trainers. The coalition would also help Ministry of the Interior forces field more capable vehicles, starting with a battalion of 30 armored security vehicles issued to the special police in the fall. Coalition leaders hoped the combination of these changes would enable the ministry to shoulder a greater share of security responsibility and lighten the demands on the Iraqi army, which, in turn, would allow the coalition to accelerate its transition of security responsibilities to Iraqi authorities. These optimistic plans for police development, however, did not foresee the severe difficulties the rising tide of sectarian warfare would bring to Iraq's interior ministry. The transfer of the Interior Ministry Advisory Mission to MNSTCI increased coalition commanders' visibility on the ministry's inner workings, about which MNFI leaders were receiving increasing warnings of sectarian influence and violence. Under MNSTCI, the coalition quickly increased the number of advisors in the ministry headquarters from 40 to 106 personnel, an expansion made possible by the growth of forward operating base SHIELD. As these MNSTCI and MNFI advisors were making preparations for a re-energized police development effort, several thousand recruits were already entering new, quote, public order battalions, end quote, created by Prime Minister Jaffery and Interior Minister Bayan Jaber. Though coalition officials initially took Jaffery and Jaber's initiatives at face value as a sign that Iraqi leaders wanted to act more self-sufficiently, they quickly realized that Iraqi leaders were keeping the 3,000-man force out of the normal coalition-supervised vetting processes to ensure they were, quote, nearly 100% Shia, end quote, as Dempsey later recalled. Elsewhere in the Interior Ministry, the Iraqi border forces lagged just as far behind coalition expectations as did the police. The disconnect between Casey and Vines over shifting the coalition's main effort from Baghdad to the Syrian border had been mirrored in a disconnect between MNSTCI and MNFI over support to the border forces. Although border transition teams designed to help Iraq's Department of Border Enforcement had been part of the transition team plan since its inception, by fall 2005 only 11 10-man teams were present on Iraq's entire western border and not until mid-October did MNSTCI operationalize Casey's instructions to enable Iraqi border forces to re-establish control. With the border forces operating at just 70%, MNSTCI assisted the Department of Border Enforcement in a recruiting campaign to bring in nearly 2,500 new guards by the end of the year. In order to advise the larger organization, which by all accounts was in worse shape than the police force, Casey requested additional U.S. forces from CENTCOM to increase the total number of border transition teams from 15 to 26. Given the slow nature of the deployment process, these new forces would not arrive until spring 2006. In the meantime, MNSTCI contracted for the completion of 91 additional border forts, many of which at the time existed only as intermittent border crossing locations with berms and tents. MNSTCI also coordinated with the Department of Homeland Security to pay for approximately 20 Customs and Border Patrol agents to deploy to advise the Iraqi Department of Border Security. Unfortunately, all of MNSTCI's extensive efforts were on the Syrian border. At the same time that the Iranian regime was increasing its infiltration of weapons and operatives into Iraq, not a single team had been assigned to the Iranian border. The Iraqi Army As MNSTCI was putting renewed effort into the police force, it reviewed its plans for building the Iraqi army and shifted its main effort from the generation of tactical units to the development of institutional capacity, especially mentoring the Ministry of Defense and the Joint Forces Headquarters on their roles in organizing, training, and equipping the Iraqi military. The most acute need was to accelerate the generation of Iraqi officers and non-commissioned officers, or NCO, which transition readiness assessment reports for December 2005 showed at a 66% and 60% fill, respectively. 
MNSTCI also began to re-examine the organization of the Iraqi logistics system to increase its internal capacity. Under new MNSTCI plans, each Iraqi battalion would gain a headquarters and services company with maintenance, supply, medical, and transport capabilities. Each division would gain a motor transport regiment, and the Ministry of Defense would receive a national depot with 10 regional base support units. However, Iraqi brigades would gain no logistics capability, and all life support functions, such as food, fuel, and laundry, would remain in the hands of private contractors. Finally, MNSTCI's new plans also envisioned that three infantry brigades would be converted to motorized brigades to serve as an operational reserve. Four new strategic infrastructure battalions would guard oil pipelines and other infrastructure, and each division would gain a signal company, a bomb disposal company, an engineer company, and an intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance company. Despite the shift in MNSTCI plans, however, the combat service support changes to the Iraqi army were slow in coming, as the coalition's de facto main effort for Iraqi force generation continued to be combat units and recruitment for the specialized fields of mechanics, medics, doctors, and logisticians was challenging in Iraq in any case. MNSTCI's review of plans for the Iraqi army also led to a reassessment of the viability of Iraqi army's force protection requirements. Realizing that the pickup trucks the coalition had initially purchased for Iraqi units were becoming increasingly unsafe in the IED-laden environment, MNSTCI officials and their Iraqi counterparts procured 2,073 up-armored HMMWVs of the same model used by U.S. forces. By November 2005, 267 had been delivered to the Iraqi security forces, with the remainder scheduled to arrive by August 2006. At the same time, MNSTCI began fielding Iraqi armor units. On November 12th, Iraq received 77 T-72 tanks from Hungary and 36 BMP-1 armored fighting vehicles from Greece. While these units would not be operational for more than a year, the return of tanks to the Iraqi army was a significant milestone, finally overturning Walter Slocum's 2003 design for an Iraqi military of light infantry that would lack any offensive capability that might be used against its neighbors. Rocky Start for the Military Transition Teams in May 2005, the first external military and special police transition teams began to arrive in Iraq for a transition mission that was already falling behind schedule. Although Casey had directed the multinational divisions to stand up internal transition teams while the external MITs were being organized in the United States, the results were uneven. Some units had supported the new mission fervently, but some overburdened commanders who lacked the means to control their areas properly were reluctant to reduce their combat power further by setting aside officers, NCOs, and equipment for the military transition team mission. Nevertheless, by September 2005, 174 internal and external transition teams were in place, including some within allied sectors, and the program continued to grow. Unfortunately, by the fall of 2005, it was clear the external transition teams that made up the majority of the program faced considerable systemic obstacles, especially personnel issues caused at least in part by the institutional army's reluctance to embrace fully the military transition team concept. Rather than providing incentives for officers and NCOs to serve on the transition teams that were theoretically the main effort of the war in Iraq, many in the army saw service on a transition team as a career-harming move. This judgment was seemingly validated by the fact that the army in 2005 did not categorize transition team assignments among the, quote, key developmental or branch qualifying, end quote, jobs officers required for promotion. At a managerial level, some army personnel officials advised their top performing officers to avoid assignment on the transition teams. They also often selected MIT members haphazardly, at times even using the criteria of finding personnel who had not yet deployed to combat. These dynamics resulted in significant skill mismatches for the transition team mission, such as the inclusion of artillery and engineer soldiers as battalion-level advisors, even though Iraqi army battalions had no fire support and no engineer assets except at the division level. 
Some MIT members also were not prepared for the rigors of living as a small element in an austere environment outside of the normal army logistical footprint. The fact that the teams were so small, officially 10 or 11 people at full strength but often 8 or 9 in reality, magnified the impact of having poorly matched or qualified personnel. One special police transition team leader related later, quote, If a person doesn't want to be there, it's different on an eight-man team than it would be in a 120-man company, because everybody counts. We had an NCO who absolutely hated all Iraqis based on his previous war experience and refused to eat with them, refused to socialize with them. He said, I'll only do what I'm ordered to do and required to do. I'm not eating their food, I'm not socializing, and I'm not playing soccer with them. That creates a poison in a small team environment. End quote. The motley nature of the transition teams resulted in some myths in a play on words calling themselves mutts instead. Another structural challenge of the external transition teams was that their command relationship created unity of effort problems with local commanders. The transition teams were only under the tactical control of commanders in the multinational divisions and, as such, the battle space owners could not restructure the military transition teams or rate their leaders. Instead, the rating chain ran through the various layers of MITs, battalion, brigade, and division, up to the Iraq Assistance Group, a one-star headquarters formed under MNCI to ensure the teams were properly supported across the country. Keeping the team's rating chain separate from the brigades and divisions in Iraq was a decision made out of concern that MIT officers senior rated by division or brigade commanders would wind up competing at a disadvantage against battalion commanders or other peers in those divisions, with the result that MIT members could end up with career-harming evaluation reports. It was an arrangement that irritated many battlespace owners, who believed the initial MITs tended not to take into sufficient account the objectives of the units responsible for the territory in which the MITs were operating. The requirement to support the transition teams without the ability to control their day-to-day -day activities or evaluate their personnel bred resentment toward the program among many battlespace owners. The quality of individuals on some of the first transition teams, a result of the haphazard selection process, only magnified the resentment. Although in many cases the transition teams and battlespace owners worked through these challenges, doing so resulted in lost time and misdirected efforts for the overall campaign. The after-action review of the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment in Operation Restore writes captured many of these concerns. Quote, Many of the MIT teams had not been adequately trained to the MIT role. Because of this, Special Forces ODA teams and partnership squadrons would pick up the slack and cross over into the role of the MITs. This caused the MITs to no longer perform their understood functions because the ODA teams were doing it for them. The Army needs to clearly define the roles and responsibilities of these different combat multipliers in terms of their relationships and responsibilities to the ISF, or Iraqi Security Forces. ODAs, or the partnership squadrons, need to have the MITs attached to them and have OPCON, or operational control, of their team's IOT, or in order to, allow these clearly defined roles to exist. End quote. In Baghdad, 3rd Infantry Division Commander Major General William Webster echoed similar concerns among senior U.S. commanders. Quote, I think the transition teams ought to be attached to divisions, and the division commanders ought to be made responsible for the success or failure of the Iraqi units. I don't think they ought to be deployed as a separate organization. We need those combat commanders at the division and brigade and battalion level responsible for counterparts in the Iraqi army and the Iraqi police forces to make them better, and they would invest a hell of a lot more. We have invested a lot in them, and they have a lot to do but they also have a staff and a whole huge organization for getting it done. End quote. In advocating that unit commanders rather than small transition teams should be responsible for developing the Iraqi units with which their units were partnered, Webster was also echoing the similar argument put forward by General Peter Schumacher in the initial debate over the transition teams the previous year. For their first several cycles, the transition team deployment timelines were not synchronized with the units they were meant to work with in Iraq, so that the teams generally arrived midway through a unit deployment without having participated in any of the unit's pre-mission training. 
it was a crucial missed opportunity to form cohesive teams. Quote, In retrospect, the externally sourced myths should have been given to the BCTs stateside or in Europe as augmentees, end quote, observed Brigadier General Daniel Bolger, who had served as Coalition Military Assistance Training Team or CMAT commander in 2005. Quote, most of the angst among MITs came from externally sourced teams glued onto cohesive BCTs. They felt like outsiders. They were on a different rotation cycle, and it was not easy for either the advisors or the partner units. End quote. The size of the teams also limited their basic effectiveness. With 11 people at most on a team and a countrywide force protection rule that convoys could consist of no fewer than three vehicles, no military transition team could conduct split operations without external assistance or security, and they often resorted to using field-grade officers as either drivers or turret gunners to move from place to place. Webster recalled later, quote, We knew that these SPTTs and MITs were going to be ten-man elements, and we knew then that what that meant in an insurgency was that they either all had to stay in one place or they all had to move, because it took ten guys to secure ten guys all the time. End quote. A September assessment of the MITs by the Iraq Assistance Group minced words diplomatically, noting, quote, Transition teams that are larger and who have strong partnership support do better, faster. End quote. In many cases, the additional requirement to provide security for the transition teams became a tax on battle space owners' already thinly stretched forces. Equipment problems also hampered the military transition team's effectiveness, especially for the first year-long rotation. By September, the teams only possessed 46% of their equipment, with the worst shortages in communications, equipment, and night vision devices. While these supply shortages were generally resolved by the time the second group of teams arrived in 2006, they hamstrung the team's effectiveness in 2005 a critical period in which the rapid deployment of Iraqi security forces was the centerpiece of MNFI's plan. Most transition teams went through a short training period in the United States, followed by 10 days of Iraq-specific training in Kuwait, including vehicle rollover drills, convoy procedures, IED battle drills, and live fire exercises. However, in after-action reviews, Few transition team members had positive comments about the utility or applicability of their training. To further complicate the pre-deployment preparations, the Army initially conducted pre-mission training at Fort Carson, Colorado, but over the span of a year moved the location first to Fort Hood, Texas, and then to Fort Riley, Kansas, causing a reboot of the program with each move. Upon arriving in Iraq, the teams finally had eight days of focused transition team training at the Phoenix Academy in Taji, created by Casey because of his concern that the Army's institutional preparatory training would be insufficient. Much of the training prepared the transition teams to teach the military decision-making process and other staff functions to the Iraqi battalion and brigade staffs, rather than to build warfighting units at platoon and company level. The arrival of the transition teams also revealed more clearly the challenges of the Transition Readiness Assessment, the tool that MNSTCI had set up in coordination with MNFI to evaluate the performance of Iraqi units and to inform U.S. troop withdrawal decisions. Many transition teams expressed frustration that the majority of the ratings were only focused on staffing and equipping statistics and ignored the intangible, more subjective determinations of whether an Iraqi unit was cohesive and actually ready for combat. In addition, as Iraqi units were passed from one transition team to the next, the perils of the perspective of a one-year rotation became apparent. Frequently, as a transition team worked with an Iraqi unit, they would chart the unit's steady progress, showing its development over the length of their deployment. When the next team arrived, with little basis to judge unit capabilities other than their experiences with the U.S. Army, they would be appalled at the state of the Iraqi Army, and the Iraqi unit's ratings would plummet overnight. Casey himself had observed these challenges, recalling later, quote, What would happen is that the guys in MITS would get them, Iraqi partners, and they would work with them, and miraculously, as they got to the end of their tenure, the Iraqis looked better and better. Well, then the next guys would come in and say, What the hell is this? End quote. Challenges of Iraqi Military Culture 
The military transition team's organizational challenges were matched by those of the Iraqis they were meant to advise. The true scale of the team's task was revealed after they began working with the Iraqi security forces and realized that they would have to overcome pervasive corruption and anachronistic military practices. Corruption in the Iraqi security forces was endemic. Its clearest manifestation was the problem of, quote, ghost soldiers, end quote, listed on the Iraqi army and police rolls by corrupt commanders who had considerable incentives to overstate the size of their units and pocket the excess pay, which the Iraqi government doled out in cash. At a May 2005 conference for MNSTCI, MNCI, and transition team leaders, coalition officials conservatively estimated the number of ghost soldiers to be between 15,000 and 30,000 a figure representing between 10 and 20 percent of the entire Iraqi security forces at the time, though anecdotal reports indicated the actual numbers could be even higher. MNSTCI and MNFI's 2004 decision to use contracts for Iraqi units' life support such as food, fuel, and laundry exacerbated the situation, as the cash for the contracts went to unit commanders on a per-soldier basis. Some corrupt officers also skimmed money off the life support contracts themselves, a practice that sometimes resulted in rotten or insufficient food, or in soldiers having to pay for their own uniforms. One special police transition team member recalled, quote, When we started reviewing who was there, trying to get a personnel status report from these guys was crazy. We were just looking for numbers, let alone names, but a couple of reviews of the names came up that they had guys on their books who were not there anymore. They were still collecting their paychecks, so the question was, where's the money going to? End quote. The worst corruption came at the highest ministerial level. In September and October 2005, the Iraqi government issued arrest warrants for Hazem Shalin, who had served as Minister of Defense under the Alawi government, and 23 other defense officials. Shalin and other senior members of the Ministry of Defense had set up a vast scheme of overpayments, kickbacks, shell companies, and other ploys to steal an estimated $1.3 to $2.3 billion from defense contracts in the space of barely a year. Shalin and many of his co-conspirators were eventually tried and convicted in absentia for the enormous theft because they had fled to other countries before the warrants were issued. The looting of the Iraqi defense budget, by its own minister, left lasting effects on the security forces by draining the treasury and delaying the proper equipping of the force. In Iraqi tactical units, absenteeism was a serious problem, as it had been in Saddam's army. One cause was the Iraqi army's leave policy, which promised soldiers one week of home leave out of every four weeks. This policy, in existence since the Iran-Iraq war, had been instituted because of Iraq's lack of a modern banking system. In a country that functioned on cash and carry arrangements, soldiers received their pay in cash with no system to transfer funds electronically to their families, and thus most Iraqi troops carried the cash home by hand. Low pay also contributed to the absentee problem, creating a situation in which some Iraqi troops found it more economical to desert their posts than to stay. Quote, In 2005, Iraq paid a rifleman about $300 a month, end quote, CMAT Commander General Bolger noted. Quote, the Mujahideen would pay him $300 on one night to plant a roadside bomb. End quote. According to Brigadier General John McLaren, the Iraq Assistance Group commander from 2005 to 2006, these factors resulted in a 30% annual turnover rate for the Iraqi army. Iraqi commanders' ability to discipline deserters was low because Iraq had no uniform code of military justice and therefore had no enforceable law requiring the all-volunteer force to stay on duty. Sectarianism was also prevalent within the ranks, and many units had effectively become ethnically pure. The near-exponential growth of the Iraqi security forces, paired with increased Iraqi sovereignty that gave the Iraqis the lead in managing that growth, made the detailed tracking of ethnic composition within security force units difficult. In a memorandum written after his tenure of command in MNFNW, Major General David Rodriguez noted, quote, the second Iraqi army division leadership is 100% Kurdish and its subordinate brigade level leaders are 80% Kurdish. 
Overall, the second Iraqi army division's ethnic composition is 29% Arab and 61% Kurdish. The third Iraqi army division's senior leadership is 75% Kurdish and the brigade level leaders are 65% Kurdish. The 3rd Iraqi Army Division ethnic composition is 69% Arab and 31% Kurdish. This situation does not lend itself to building cohesive teams that are representative of the people of Iraq. The high percentage of Kurdish leaders makes those Iraqi divisions vulnerable to political pressure from Kurdish leadership, whose agenda is not always in line with Iraq's national interest. End quote. Similar situations existed across the country, with the Iraqi army units in Baghdad and the south being predominantly Shia. Despite MNSTCI's noble objectives of creating an army that was a truly national force, Iraq's ethno-sectarian forces had essentially carved it up, much as they had done with Iraq's political spoils after the elections. This sectarian streak in the security forces, especially in the interior ministry, created a fragility that could be exploited either in preventing units from deploying and fighting to act in the national best interest, or, in some cases, convincing the units to carry out sectarian violence themselves. Coalition advisors also found that the new Iraqi units retained some of the less desirable traits of the old Iraqi military. Quote, Talking to Iraqi officers had some echoes of talking to Germans after World War II. Saddam's heavy hand crushed professional instincts, end quote, Bulger recalled. The average senior officer in the Iraqi security forces had grown up in a police state in which multiple military organizations had competed with one another for influence, while regime leaders had aimed to ensure no one organization became effective enough to launch a coup. In such an environment, there was little incentive to share information because information represented a potential advantage over rivals. The most capable officers were those most likely to be purged because they represented a potential threat to the regime. Because of these dynamics, the pre-2003 Iraqi military culture valued the blind following of orders, loyalty, micromanagement, and the avoidance of initiative. When many of the officers and soldiers of the pre-2003 military returned to serve in the new Iraqi security forces, they brought with them some of these same dysfunctional values and group norms. One military transition team leader described some of the absurd practices that resulted. Quote, when we arrived, the Iraqi chief of staff had all the paper in the headquarters locked up in his office. He would literally count out sheets and only give them to the primary staff officers of the sections. If they came in and asked for five pieces of paper, he would ask why they needed it. He would then unlock the cabinet and pull out what they needed. End quote. In many ways, the transition teams had been tasked to rebuild the very sinews of the Iraqi military, including its ethos, a task that was sweeping, slow, and unlikely to meet MNFI's deadlines. Yet it was on the shoulders of these transition teams, ad hoc organizations comprised of a mismatched group of personnel with only eight days of advisor-specific training, that the MNFI campaign plan rested. As MNFI approached the crucial elections of fall 2005, Casey and other leaders were buoyed by the success of McMaster at Tel Afar and the growing success of Marines such as Lt. Col. Julian Alford in Anbar. The operational shift of forces to the border had led to successful operations at the tactical level. MNFI's counterinsurgency survey had led to the creation of the COIN Academy, which in turn gradually shifted the tactical focus of new units as they arrived in Iraq. Casey's Sunni outreach was bearing fruit, and Anbari tribesmen were beginning to shift sides, a marked contrast to the outright rejectionism and resistance that marked much of 2004. Provincial reconstruction teams and transition teams, critical to the handover of security and governance responsibility to the Iraqis, were finally coming online. The Iraqi security forces were growing rapidly, and the initial transition readiness assessments showed some Iraqi units would soon be able to assume control of battle space from the coalition. AQI, for the first time in the war, was under considerable pressure from rival Sunni insurgent groups, restive Anbari tribesmen, and even from al-Qaeda senior leaders who were worried about the direction in which Zarqawi was taking their Iraqi franchise. However, the seemingly improving enemy picture and the hard-won tactical victories in Tel Afar and Al-Qaim 
obscured the reality that, at the operational level, the campaign was heading in the wrong direction. The successes in western Nineveh and the western Euphrates had come by pulling critical combat power away from Baghdad and removing the most effective break on sectarian violence that would soon begin to spin out of control. The October constitutional referendum and December parliamentary election, elections the coalition expected to be national compacts that would lead to reconciliation, would instead become divisive, identity-driven events that sparked further conflict. End of Chapter 17, Part 2 Innovation in the Face of War, Summer to Fall, 2005 Read by Adam Cable, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 2021